Good morning. I'm Muriel Bowser. I represent Ward 4 in the Council of the District of Columbia, and I'm the chairwoman of the Committee on Economic Development, and I'm calling this hearing to order at 10.15. Uh, today is Friday, February the 22nd, on 2013, and we're located in the council chambers in the John A. Wilson building at 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, this hearing is a, the performance oversight hearing for the Department Department of Housing and Community Development, the DC Housing Finance Agency, and the Office of Cable Television, all of which um, this committee provides oversight for. I like to give a little background about why we hold these hearings and then we will proceed um, to hearing from public witnesses. Every year at this time, prior to the mayor introducing his proposed budget for the next year, we take a look back at last year's budget to see how successful agencies have been in implementing their programs um, and services and where there's room for improvement and what needs to be done to fix persistent problems. This is a key part of the council's oversight process to make sure government is serving um, the public effectively. That's why we ask for members of the public advocates for various constituencies and other stakeholders to join us in the conversation so that we might identify any issues, challenges, opportunities, and solutions. We'll also hear from the government. We'll hear from leaders of these agencies to address the council and the public's concern. So not only do we get solutions to how to improve agencies, but we also inform um, these answers will, deform, will form our decision making um, as we approach next year's budget proposal. For all these reasons, this hearing is very important and I thank you for joining us today. So let me also say, we have sent each agency an extensive list of questions in advance of this hearing about one month ago. Um, it takes a, a, quite a lot of thought and planning for uh, the committee staff, but it also takes a lot of thought um, and thoughtfulness from the agencies to respond and respond directly and completely, and we appreciate that. Um, and I'm happy to say that we found all the agencies to be responsive um, to our questions and requests. So we thank them for their promptness and thoroughness. I encourage members of the public to view their answers, which have been posted on the council's website. Um, let me say something specifically uh, about DHCD. And before I do that, let me also say that while these are the, the formal public hearings for um, oversight of the agencies, um, it's my practice uh, in providing oversight to constantly talk to the agencies and meet with the agencies on issues um, as they become available. So while this is the kind of annual opportunity to review a series of oversight questions, let me assure you that oversight happens every day. Uh, let me say a little bit about DHCD. Uh, the Department of Health Housing and Community Development uh, has a budget of $125.8 million this fiscal year, which is fiscal year 13. Um, that represents a decrease of about 13% from the previous fiscal year, FY12, which finished last September. In FY12, their budget was on $144.3 million. Uh, the agency has approximately 146 employees. Um, DHCD's mission is to create and preserve opportunities for affordable housing and economic development and to revitalize underserved communities. It does this through various means, including project financing of new and renovated affordable housing, primarily through the Housing Production Trust Fund. It acquires vacant and blighted properties for redevelopment by third parties. It administers the Home Purchase Assistant Program, also known as HPAP, that offers down payment assistance to promote home ownership opportunities. It provides housing counseling uh, rehabilitation programs to maintain existing single family housing stock. And it's also responsible for small business assistance programs um, to help revitalize our wonderful neighborhoods and commercial corridors. Uh, DHCD also enforces important district laws regarding inclusionary zoning, rent control, and condominiums. 
Almost one-third of DHCD's budget comes from federal sources, which have performance and reporting standards that must be complied with very strictly. Otherwise, the district can lose these vital resources. DHCD has also changed leadership recently um, within this period of time, and we are fortunate to have Director Michael Kelly, who will present the government's testimony at the conclusion of the public testimony. Um, Mr. Kelly has been on the job since last summer, um, and we will hear from him about how he's gotten up to speed on large um, and important projects within his agency and the overall leadership and management of his agency. Um, as many of you have heard, the mayor has proposed spending an additional $100 million this coming year to achieve the production of 10,000 units of affordable housing. We'll seek to hear from the agency about how um, that might be accomplished and what um, it will actually take to realize those 10,000 units. Uh, so we certainly applaud the pledge and have made it a centerpiece of our work on this committee to focus on affordable housing um, and the protection and protect production of affordable housing. We know that the Housing Production Trust Fund, for example, has been cut by more than $40 million, or almost $40 million um, in the last couple of years. And we're looking forward to not only replenishing those funds, um, but never seeing those types of cuts happen again. So we will turn now uh, to hearing from the public on the, uh, on the performance of the Department of Housing and Community Development for fiscal 12, and also for fiscal 13 um, up to, to this Point. Let me also say that next Friday on March the 1st at 10 a.m. Um, right here, we'll be holding a similar hearing for the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, the Washington Area Transit Authority, and the D.C. Housing Authority. So with that, let me call our first panel of witnesses. And I, I like to say how excited I am to see this room filled. Um, it should be no surprise. We know how um, important the issue of affordable housing is is across um, our city, and uh, we're going to hear from a, a lot of people today. Having said that, 32 people have signed up. If you're in the room and you didn't sign up previously, I'd like to invite you to do so by speaking to my clerk, who's to um, my left. The committee rules have us um, allow uh, three minutes for each member of the public to testify. If you're representing an organization, um, I will recognize you um, for five minutes. All the members of the committee, of course, will be afforded a, a round of, of questions, and other members of the council, should they join us, um, be allowed um, the same. Our first panel is Michael Syndrome, Elaine Middleman, Elaine Middleman here. Okay, Ms. Middleman. Leon Wells. Mr. Wells. Raleigh Powell. Lillette Campbell. Lillette Campbell here. Yes. Okay, Ms. Campbell. Good to see you. And Jacqueline Ward Richardson. Jacqueline Ward Richardson. Nichama Mazalinski. Yes, ma'am, please come up. So, Ms. Middleman, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Is this on? It is. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm Elaine Middleman. I'm an attorney, and I've worked on matters involving the Skyland Project, representing some of the property owners and business owners. I've been working on this since 2004, and um, there are many serious issues about Skyland, many troubling situations involving Skyland. And as far as I know, this is the first oversight hearing that there has been about Skyland. And like I said, I've been working on it since 2004. So, and I know that next week there'll be, I'll be here again next week because it's kind of a dual-headed situation. But 
Um, and so really most of the involvement of Skyline that I'm aware of is, is, is for next week's uh, people. But the issue today is the fact that Skyland has received around $28 million in HUD funds, community development block grant funds. And so that is through this department today that we're here for. Uh, um, as I said, there's been no oversight. And so one of the issues I did about oversight was I wrote a letter to the Secretary of HUD, Secretary Donovan, asking that they perform oversight of Skyland, which they did. And they sent a letter to Mr. Kelly uh, in December, outline, HUD did, outlining six findings of serious shortcomings in, in following the HUD regulations for Skyland. And um, I think it's my understanding that Mr. Kelly's asked for an extension, so I don't really know what his status is in responding. But I can assure you this is an extremely serious matter. And the HUD, the HUD letter said that if, if the district doesn't comply, they may have to reimburse HUD for $28 million. Uh, and I'm not sure it's got a simple matter of record keeping. I think there's some of the documents don't exist. Uh, some of the, again, one of the reasons why I've asked for oversight, that, the project was not handled properly, I think, in so many ways. So it isn't a matter of just finding documents in the back shelf somewhere. And, and HUD, for example, even if they find the documents, they have to make a showing that this, this $28 million complies with the HUD regulations, that they, it has to meet a national objective, which would include benefiting low and moderate income persons. I mean, there's specific HUD regulations about this. Way too complicated for me to really understand, but I, they, they're saying that the district has to give us detailed, specific explanation, and I don't, I, I doubt that the Skyland project will comply with that because I don't think it's benefiting low and moderate income persons. Again, there's regulations about this. So, and if it does not, I think again they'd have to return the 28 million dollars. Part of the problem, and I put this in my statement, when the Skyland law was passed, I don't think you were on the council then, but. Uh, it was kind of a back of the envelope. It was started out as a, and is continued to highly politicized. And th there really wasn't consideration given to funding, to whether it was economically feasible, whether there was an anchor tenant. It was just, you know, run through because it sounded like a good idea at the time, I guess. And it's, it's, it's caused a lot of people a lot of pain because of complete lack of planning and Thoughtfulness. I mean, I know Mayor Gray wants it to be a success, but since there hasn't been any monitoring and the record keeping <laughs> doesn't exist, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a wish and a prayer that it would turn out successful. And many of the people at Skyland now have been very seriously harmed. And as far as I can tell, no one has benefited from Skyland. Okay, Ms. Middleman, I will have some okay. questions for sure. you. So let me just ask you okay. um, to hold your well, comments I, until I, I get say to I, the question round. I tried to put some specifics in my statement. And no, I, I do and have I it, and I, have I, I do want to have also. some questions for you. Sure. Um, let, me, let me turn now to Ms. Campbell from the Bridges Academy, and then we'll, we'll go down the line. Ms. Campbell. Okay, good morning, Councilman Bowser. Good morning. Other council members and staff and D.C. residents, thanks for the opportunity to appear here. I've owned and operated the Bridges Academy. It's a small private school on Georgia Avenue for more than 30 years. As a business owner in Ward 4, I'm also a member of the Beacon Brightwood Business Alliance, and I serve on the board of the Emory Beacon of Light, a CDC, also located in Ward 4. The Department of Housing and Community Development has funded the Emory Beacon of Light for the past two years in particular, but also since 2008, to provide support to small businesses and storefront improvement, primarily along Georgia Avenue and Kennedy Streets. In the last two years, this support has provided for the continuation of the Beacon Brightwood Business Alliance, which is an advocacy organization for small businesses in Brightwood, by holding forums and seminars, and by connecting the businesses with resources in the ward and in the city at large. The Georgia Avenue corridor is rapidly changing with the coming of Walmart and the closing of Walter Reed. The Emory Beacon of Light is also developing a mixed-use project in the 6100 block of Georgia. The residents and business owners feel that this will be a very positive and tremendous boost to the revitalization and stability of the neighborhood. The Beacon of Light has also used its 
DHCD funds to begin a series of webinars on how to use social media to market our businesses. Thus far, the series has been accessed by more than 200 businesses and individuals. Following several failed fits and starts of other entities during my 30-year tenancy on Georgia Avenue, it was the beacon of light that brought facade improvement to the 6200 block of Georgia. Based upon that success, the Beacon of Light is currently funded to provide facade improvement in the 6100 block of Georgia, as well as the corner of 3rd Street, Kennedy Street, and Missouri Avenue, providing a much needed facelift to these two vital segments of Ward 4. This year, the DHCD grant is also scheduled to assist at least 10 businesses to develop their websites and maintain them for one year while continuing the webinars. This information will benefit the area's small businesses to keep them viable and competitive in the current environment and the changes that are coming to Georgia Avenue. I applaud the support and the work of the Department of Housing and Community Development in the community. community. We just need a little more resources available to us in the coming years and weeks and months and days to assure that our neighborhood does not just exist, but that it survives and thrives. I'm open for questions. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Maslalansky. Good morning, Chairperson Bowser. My name is Nahama Maslansky, and I'm the senior advocacy advisor at SUM, so others might eat. SUM is an interfaith nonprofit organization that for 43 years has provided comprehensive social services to district residents who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Included in those comprehensive services is long-term supportive housing. We currently house approximately 800 persons, including children and seniors, and provide them with individualized services. We are about halfway through SUMS housing development initiative to produce 1,000 additional units of housing for 2,000 families, individuals, veterans, and seniors who are extremely low income or have special needs. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this performance oversight hearing for the District's Department of Housing and Community Development. DHCD is one of some's most faithful partners in our housing development effort. The last few years have been a difficult time to begin new projects. Despite the many constraints, I am pleased to report that some will be closing on two deals with DHCD in the next month for 133 total units, which include two family sites, one of which is for veterans, and two single adult programs, all targeting extremely low-income persons. The DHCD assistance will include a Housing Production Trust Fund loan, 9% tax credits, and NSP3 federal funds. Development of these units during such difficult times is a tribute to the ability of DHCD and other district agencies, including HFA, to work with nonprofit groups such as us to produce desperately needed supportive service housing in spite of severe financial obstacles. The economic constraints of the past few years have limited the district's overall capacity to produce new units, and now literally thousands of people are desperately seeking housing that they can afford. Some alone gets about 50 calls a day for housing. District residents have ranked the lack of housing they can afford as the number one need in the district. For these reasons, we applaud the progress that DHCD has made in negotiating a memorandum of understanding with HFA, with the Housing Authority, the Department of Mental Health, and Department of Human Services to enable them to issue a consolidated request for proposals that will allow development of some units. The number of units that can be produced will depend, of course, on what resources are available to each of those departments. Under the MOU, DHCD will contribute capital financing as it may be available, will issue the RFP, and will be responsible for various quality control activities. We appreciate the wisdom of marshalling resources across district departments for development, operation, and services for supportive service housing, which otherwise each department could not do on its own. In addition, a consolidated RFP eliminates gaps in scheduling and process that in the past created bottlenecks to timely development of housing. The properties that will be developed on the RFP will be restricted for use as housing for low-income persons and people with special needs for a period of up to 40 years. 
Such housing serves the most vulnerable of our district's residents, providing a combination of housing and services that enable people to become stable and to become self-sufficient. It also decreases district expenses for a multitude of services that the district would otherwise have to provide to these very same individuals. As an example, DHCD's prioritization of supportive service housing was reflected in its most recent low-income housing tax credit allocation plan. For at least the near term, such housing must maintain a preferential status in the allocation of still scarce resources. As the FY14 district budget is being completed, it's important to urge that the Housing Production Trust Fund remain intact as a special fund that is essential to creating and preserving housing for diverse income populations and for tenant purchase of their buildings and not be used again to balance the budget. We applaud the Mayor's statement that in a supplemental fiscal year 13 budget, he plans to restore $38 million of trust fund funding that had been removed to balance the past two budgets. However, additional funds for the trust fund beyond the $38 million are warranted out of the $100 million the mayor spoke of for development of affordable housing. Again, the Housing Production Trust Fund provides capital dollars for acquisition, construction, tenant purchase, and preservation. But capital is not enough. To keep housing operating for low-income residents and to develop this housing in the first place, Additional funds must be added to that portion of the local rent supplement program, which is administered by the Housing Authority, that provides an ongoing funding stream to project-based or sponsor-based housing for low-income district residents. Funds must be added now to enable the Housing Authority to participate in the consolidated RFP in any meaningful way and to complete the financing package that will enable the RFP to actually make housing possible. Since the RFP, the consolidated RFP we, we, I've mentioned, is scheduled for release on April 2nd of this year, the fiscal year 13 supplemental budget is the right vehicle for these LRSP dollars. In conclusion, we at SUM look forward to our continuing efforts with DHCD to house and help those most in need and help them move forward in their lives. This is the time to work even more diligently to solve the problems that the district faces. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wells. Good morning, Chair. Good President, morning. Staff. My name is Leon Wells. I live at the Concord Apartments, 5800 block of 14th Street Northwest, Ward 4 resident. Uh, I'm the president of the Tenant Association, and I represent 82 families who uh, currently live on the property. Could you, could you say that property again, Mr. Wells? I didn't hear you. Uh, 5825 14th Street Northwest, okay. 5800 block of 14th Street Northwest, Concord Apartments. I'm the president of the association. Uh, I represent 82 families that live on the property. I'm here today to testify about the importance of the programs that DHCD funds to support tenants and affordable housing, particularly neighborhood-based services, low-income housing, tax credits, and housing production trust fund. I was very happy to hear the mayor's announcement that there will be an additional $100 million for affordable housing in D.C. My neighbors and I just, uh, just know how important this funding is. I've been a resident of the Concord Department since August of 92. I'm one of the longest-term residents in the property. There are a few more and uh, retirees and some uh, on medical disability. About six years ago, um, our property was up for sale, and we were approached by developers and management to convert into condos. The income for the bulk of the residents was not suitable for condo conversion. Fortunately, the process did not take place. Um, we were proactive in organizing to uh, stop that process. Now we are back at this same juncture six years later. Um, our building is up for sale again, and we have organized with the help of the Latino Economic Development Center, by the way, which by the way assisted us six years ago. Um, we are working through the TOPA process to preserve our housing as affordable with the experience and the wherewithal with LEDC. We now have an attorney, we have a developer, and we were given a loan for earnest uh, trust money deposit. Uh, I believe I'm saying that correctly. 
We are organized and we are working very diligently as a group. After interviewing with multiple developers, we have chose one to partner, one to partner who will purchase the building and renovate, renovate the property while preserving affordable housing. That's our goal and they agreed. Um, about three weeks ago, myself and the developers, Urban Manners, uh, went to DHCD to meet with Lydia O'Kelly uh, from the Tenant Purchase Department and uh, uh, Mr. Oki, I don't have Mr. Oki's last name, uh, to solicit funding through local income housing tax credits. I'm not quite certain about, uh, certain about the availability of money, but the tenants at the Concord Apartments, as is with other residents of the District of Columbia, are in need of and would appreciate tax credit funding and put potentially funds from the Housing Production Trust Fund to ensure our homes stay safe and affordable, and affordable housing. Uh, there are two other buildings in our neighborhood who are currently have the same, same owners. They are for sale also. Uh, we all want to preserve our housing as affordable housing and remain in the neighborhood. We are grateful for the support we have received thus uh, so far through uh, DHCD and LEDC and ask that the department continue to support tenants in preserving their affordable housing through use of the tax, tax credit fund program and by fu uh, fully funding the Housing Production Trust Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells, and thank you for coming up to uh, represent your neighbors. Um, and taking the time to do that. Um, you live in a beautiful neighborhood uh, filled you. with uh, a lot of uh, long-term and new residents moving um, into that neighborhood. You have a, a great transportation access at 14th Street and 16th Street, great access to Rock Creek Park. It's the heart of Ward 4, what can we say? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great neighborhood. Um, now, who's the owner of your building? Um, I don't quite know the owner's okay. name, but it's managed by uh, Bernstein Management. It's managed by Bernstein Management. Yes. Um, and it's the desire of the, of the residents to buy the building? Yes. Okay. And um, do you know if your development and your lawyer team are pursuing an acquisition loan, a loan to buy the building as we well? We have the acquisition loan already. You have it? Did that yes. come through DHCD? No, I don't think so. Okay. And so you would be seeking um, the government's help with the rehabilitation loan? In addition to what we have. In addition to, to what you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you are, you, you, you said who you were, the developer was Urban Matters? Urban Matters. Okay. Uh, yes. Now, does, do the, is there a board for the, Tenant Association? Yes. Okay. Um, we have seven board member. I'm the president. We have a vice president, treasurer, secretary, and uh, I believe three at large members. Okay. And are, are the all the tenants in agreement with this? Absolutely. Okay. Fine. So I, I just want to encourage you. Urban Matters is actually purchasing. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. Urban okay. Matters is actually purchasing the property. I'm partnering with the tenants. Partnering. So Okay, so they're going to partner with the tenants. Um, and are the tenants going to be owners? Uh, I think, um, it's my understanding, uh, after 15 years, okay. we have the right to purchase. I got you. Purchase. Well, what I, what I like to do, Mr. Wells, is I'm going to have some uh, members of my staff reach out to you and the tenants. We'd like to come and say hi and, and check in with everybody. Um, I want to encourage every opportunity for home ownership, but we also want to make sure everybody understands what their rights are um, in this process. And I do like to check in when these projects are happening in our ward, and I suspect I'm going to be checking in on some projects across the city. Um, so mm -hmm. we appreciate you coming down to put the, um, put your testimony. We actually have an attendant organization this Saturday. Good meeting what this time? Saturday from one uh, three until. Okay, let's see if we can get there. All right. Okay. Um, now let me also, and I appreciate Ms. Mazalonski, um, your testimony uh, from from some um, because. You, you mentioned some delays or some trouble in getting projects started in the last several years. Is that your testimony? Were, these, were some of the some projects delayed? 
Um, yes, ours and quite a few others because there was simply not enough government financing available either through the trust fund or the local rent supplement program for several years. We acquired some properties, for example, in 2008 that we're eager to develop, but we're still waiting for the last pieces of funding to make them possible. But they did, there were DHCD funds committed to those projects? Um, some, we've, we're doing this in stages and okay. we're complete, we completed our first stage, Scattered Site 2, with a lot of assistance from DHCD, um, which is really a tribute to their creativity and their willingness to work with organizations such as us in the heart of the recession. Um, but now we're up to the next stage and we, need, we are moving forward um, and we could do even more if there were additional funds to complement the, um, the loans that we've taken out and our very generous um, private donations. Okay. That's, it's important that you put that testimony on because when we get to talk to the government, we notice that some of these funds just haven't been spent. Um, that and it, they may be related to projects in the pipeline that haven't started. So um, that will be uh, my question to them is how um, we move the projects in the pipeline. If the projects in the pipeline are feasible, the projects in the pipeline are going to happen. Because if they're not, we need to figure out why, and then we need to make some adjustments. So uh, I appreciate uh, you you coming forward with that testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Ms. Campbell, thank you for your 30-year tenancy on Georgia <laughs> Avenue. Um, that's certainly important. Um, and it's also important that you make some uh, critical notes as well, is that uh, the Department of Housing and Community D Development does more than housing. Yes, um, it, does. it does community development. Yes, and part of community development is working with business owners on our major corridors um, to improve our major corridors. Improving our major corridors helps in every manner of things, um, including supporting existing housing and, and uh, encouraging um, other economic development and development of housing um, along the corridor. Now, there is a very important project that's on the books across the street from you that yes, the is. Emory Church uh, would like to develop. Uh, I've probably spent the last six or eight months uh, with the, the beacon of light and housing and community development, um, making sure that everything that the corridor and the Georgia Avenue and the community has supported there, um, and t having the, that development team take any tips or cues or constructive criticism from the government. Um, and we're hopeful that the Emory Beacon of Light is going to participate in this next round of funding competition. Um, and we're hopeful that they're going to be funded. This, as you know, uh, is, a, is a project that's going to add on to yes, the existing sir. economic development um, on the corridor. Now, you're also in the block that DHCD has also funded some, I believe, seed money for the facade improvement on yes. your block. Yes. Is it totally funded or is it just a seed funding? I'm not positive about that. Okay. Um, it's been an ongoing project and it is coming to fruition very slowly, but it is coming. Okay. Um, I don't think it's full funding. I think that the owners will have to make some contribution to it. Okay. We'll look into that. Um, DHCD and Emory Beacon of Light also um, work together on the renovation of that historic shopping center at, at, at the Sheridan yes. Theater, um, which we've been very pleased with. Your block, um, in, the, in the block, I'll just add one. Maybe we can get that going too. The block uh, at Georgia and Missouri up yeah. to Peabody mm -hmm. on the west side would be, I think if those two blocks happen, it would make a tremendous visual impact it really would. Um, on, on the corridor um, at, a, at, a much, at a much needed time. So I want to thank you and always thank you for your leadership of young people. Um, they, you. they do us proud every time they participate in any community event. So we know good things are happening at your school. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. testimony. Um, and uh, let, me, let me turn to you, Ms. Middleman. Sure. And, uh, you have been certainly persistent in um, yes, these issues <laughs> involving Skyland. <laughs> to the uh, point of, yes. <laughs> yes, I think everybody knows about the Skyland Shopping Center. It's located um, in Ward 7 and has been the right. subject of a lot of uh, government attention for many, many years. Correct. And for good reason. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing all we can in terms of uh, public policy to encourage the 
type of retail development that um, citizens in, in, in that neighborhood and the surrounding area have been calling for for a long, long time. Now tell me, what is your specific involvement with Skyland? Well, I got involved uh, really to try to help the existing small businesses that were there and, and the property owners. So I've it just kind of mushroomed because there, like I said, there had been no oversight. So I okay. Just Do you have a myself. professional relationship with those businesses? Do you represent I, them officially? Yes. Okay. I have yes, and I've been involved in litigation for years. It, okay. There's not any litigation right now, but I mean, I just, I'm a very, you know, I like to study things. So once I got going on Skyline, I just really. You know, right. Peeled back all the layers to try to understand what was going on, and there's just right. so many problems and so many, you know, like I said, there's been no oversight, and there's just numerous substantive issues that no one's addressed. And well, there, there, you raise serious issues, yes. and the the federal government uh, agreed that some of the issues you raised uh, needed a, a further investigation, and they issued the the district a not so subtle uh, letter to right. that effect. Um, the government, and I have had this conversation with the director, is preparing a response um, that they think will be completely responsive to the federal government's request. I, I, if I could just say, I, yeah. I don't know what they're going to be saying, and I would be very, more than happy to work with you or whoever. Sure. I mean, I'm not trying to be an adversary, really. No, I understand. Trying to get something productive happening. No, we want to, $28 million, yeah. the government has to be able to say how it was spent, that it was spent in a accordance with how the we said it should be spent at the count well you know the previous council members I, I'm just um, saying I, I have my doubts even if they think they're going to be able to comply because some of the documents don't exist for example they never did appraisal reviews which they were required to do and I've also said for a long time now that the titles to the property aren't weren't properly done I've raised that issue repeatedly in front of Jack Evans committee and so there's a number of the documents that it's not, like I said, it's not a question of just finding them. I, and I, because the project was done in, in such a haphazard manner in the beginning, I don't think they ever explained how they comply with the uh, HUD requirements. I don't think they ever tried to. And I, I, even in the beginning, I wrote letters and said, how does this comply? And everyone was pretty much pointing to everybody else. And, and also in the beginning, they had said, they, and I put this in my testimony, they were going to get Section 108 financing and at that point I wrote a letter to HUD I think they may have been 2004 or 2005 listing some of these issues about the you know how, how is this benefiting low moderate income persons and so the the district never got the section 108 financing and, and so reflecting now back to that time I'm not sure how the district even thought they were financing this I, I'm, I, I'm not clear what what are the, in their mind what they thought they were doing I think it was like I said it was just the back of the envelope another problem from my point of view, serious problem is the agreement or lack thereof with the developer. Even though the developer's been involved since 2002, there was an originally a memorandum of understanding with them, but that expired, as far as I know, years ago. So I have absolutely no idea when they transfer the titles of the property. You know, they spent 28 million or more than that buying property, and they're going to give it to the developer. I don't know what they're going to expect developer to pay maybe zero I mean there's just an outrageous situation here and I don't know any requirements for example is a developer going to have to make affordable housing I have no, I have seen nothing in writing that is requiring the developer to do anything and it seems like they're just going to be transferring you know millions of dollars worth of property for nothing but I, I don't I don't think there's an ex agreement I, it seems astounding to me so well the committee will have to any uh, before this deal can be done, it's going to have to be submitted to the council for review. I would hope so. <laughs> um, I've had this discussion as well about Skyland, and I think the expectation that all of us who pay district taxes is that the district will get a good deal. Now, you have outlined all the impediments to that, uh, that shopping center being redeveloped over many, many years. Um, so what a good deal is right. remains to be seen. But we have a lot of smart people working on it um, and have been working on it for a long time. And we're going to spend some time certainly um, looking at it. So while we want Skyland to move forward, we'll do everything to help Skyland move uh, forward. It is incumbent upon our Department of Economic Development to strike a good deal for the taxpayers of the District of Columbia. I, that's why I, I don't think anyone's paid any attention to that at all as far as I can tell. If I could just say 
In well, we don't have a we don't have the package yet. Right. So, you know, the mayor, of course, is responsible for negotiating the deal. Um, the council will have to uh, approve it. But you have put some um, very good points on the table. For those who aren't familiar, the government said this is so important um, that we are going to go and we're going to buy this property. They took it by eminent well, domain. They, yeah, I, I know. I hate that phrase. <laughs> well, it's, But we did pay for it. So, so but, but part of the problem yes. has also been the people that they took the property from have been hurt, and there hasn't been proper you know, attention paid. I mean, they're invisible. Right. I've never heard Mayor Greg say one thing about those people that have been hurt and lost their businesses because of some, you know, glorious right. plan in the future that maybe will happen, maybe it won't. I, I was going to say one more thing. In the beginning, the it was the Hillcrest neighbors that wanted Skyland, and they wanted just uh, retail. And so there was no affordable housing, and I don't, there, I don't think there was any housing at all. Now, the plan has changed over the time. The, you know, again, it's just a plan, but there is, I think, now a plan for some condos, apartments or something, but I have absolutely no idea if those are supposed to be affordable or not, and I don't, again, I don't know what requirements have been put on the developer, if any. I, I don't know. Sure, and there, there's, like I said, there's no deal yet, um, and there's been nothing submitted to the council. Well, well how, just if I can say, how, how has the Rappaport and the other developers have been on, you know, it's there on their website and for years, and they're the ones that went forward and got the zoning requests and everything else. So if there's no written agreement or understanding with them, why have they been involved all these No, years? there is some agreement with a selected developer. So it well, was, Is that in yes. writing? Yes. Okay, can we see that? I've never seen it. Well, let's see what we can we can make available to you, and we can have it available. You plan to testify next Friday. Right. So right. there's been no disposition of the property. Right. That, that's, that's what I meant to say when there's okay. no deal. That's well, the I mean, deal I don't I'm referring think to. The report, I don't know what the price is, but I, I really don't think it's fair to give him millions of dollars of property for zero. I don't think that's fair to the district taxpayers or I don't think else. that would be fair either. Okay. I wouldn't call that a good deal. Good. <laughs> Okay, those are my questions. Thank you for your testimony. Our next witness is Jane Brown. Mm -hmm. Jim Dickerson. Sarah Scruggs. Diane Spate, Okay, Ms. Brown, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Bowser and members of the Committee on Economic Development. My name is Jane Brown. I'm the Executive Director of University Legal Services. University Legal Services is a private nonprofit agency that has been providing housing counseling services to area residents for more than two decades. We serve about 3,000 individual clients annually with one-on-one -on -one counseling and provide group workshops 12 times a month for an additional 1,100 people annually from three sites. Our northeast office at 220 I Street Northeast, our southeast office located on the ground level of DHCD at 1800 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, and from our Marshall Heights site located at 3939 Benning Road Northeast. We provide housing counseling in the areas of home ownership, credit counseling, financial literacy, default mortgage and foreclosure counseling, counseling for the Lead Safe Washington program, rental and single family rehabilitation program. We provide group workshops in the areas of home ownership preparation, rental, home rehabilitation, default mortgage, financial literacy, and in addition have an eight-hour home ownership training course with a curriculum in which we educate prospective homeowners in the home ownership process and the professional players involved, such as realtors, lenders, appraisers, inspectors, and insurance. We also provide technical assistance to tenants desiring to maintain affordable housing through multifamily home ownership under the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Under this DHCD program, we assist residents who have received an offer of sale notice with the formation of a tenant association and educate the residents about their total rights and purchase options. 
ULS staff provide the development assistance to residents who desire to purchase and renovate their buildings and convert them to low-yield cooperatives, thereby maintaining affordable housing in the district. ULS also provides assistance to resident owners of the multifamily housing who have already gone through the purchase, renovation, and conversion process to help maintain the health and viability of the affordable housing homeownership they have created. ULS provides cooperative board training, document review, managed company records review, and development services for, the, for those that need renovations. ULS's typical client is a single mother of two whose income ranges between $30,000 to $45,000 a year. Without DHCD programs, home ownership for many working people would not be a reality in Washington. The city's home ownership programs provide DC residents who would otherwise not have access to home ownership with economic stability, improved living situations, deeper community involvement, neighborhood stability, and the pride the asset of a home can provide. Additionally, home ownership provides rich infusions of economic benefit to countless numbers of realtors, mortgage companies, home inspectors, real estate developers, all of whom work with our clients of DHCD's housing programs. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and to speak in support of DHCD and its critically needed housing programs, which are hallmarks of an inclusive and successful housing policy in the district. And I commend the selection of Mr. Michael Kelly as DHCD's director. Director Kelly has made outreach to the, to the community and the CBOs a primary goal to ensure that DHCD's efforts and all programs are made known to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, Reverend Dickerson. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Chairwoman Bowser and the committee. My name is Reverend Jim Dickerson. I'm the founder and chair of MANA, Inc. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify. <clears throat> I'd like to focus my remarks in a couple of areas that may not seem as tangible, perhaps, as some of the other important areas to be covered in this morning's hearings, such as organizational and strategic plans, HUD compliance issues, finances, statistical data, analysis of departmental programs, projects that uh, are at the department, and other important areas. I'm speaking of leadership of the agency as well. And from that, the culture and spirit and sense of what DHCD's mission and philosophy is and how those things are reflected in its operations, its treatment of the people and communities it serves, as well as its partners in the nonprofit, for-profit, and business community and faith community. I believe these less tangible areas, if we want to call them that, are the foundation upon which all the rest of what happens at DHCD or any other organization, including MANA or institution uh, for that matter, depends. It's not just what we and they do, but it's how they and we do it that is equally, if not more, important. In my opinion, the conversation and discussion we have here today and in the future is not complete or adequate unless these areas are at least included in some positive way. Uh, Madam Chair, I want you to know that I'm speaking from the perspective of having been here long enough to have worked with all of the DHCD directors and all the administrations from the very first one. Mr. Lorenzo Jacobs under Mayor Washington was the first director that I worked with. From that perspective, I've come to have a deep appreciation for not only the importance of the operational and funding side of the agency, but for its spirit and culture and heart and sense of mission and the way it treats the people it's mandated to serve and its partners in this work and mission in the community. So first, one example, just one. Before Michael Kelly arrived as director of DDHCD, MANA had struggled for over six years with the department over the Buxton Condominium Project in the 1700 block of W Street Southeast. Through a competitive bidding process, DHCD awarded us the project in the Fenty administration. During the Fenty administration, the building is a terrible shell of an apartment building that has uh, a very detrimental effect on the community around it. It's one block from the Frederick Douglass home. And for many years in the, the neighborhood uh, and the community around it, the neighbors had been crying out, requesting the city do something with it. Man a bid on this project and was awarded it through DHCD's PAD program. I won't go into all the detail, only to say it became a huge battle for us as the department tried to take it away from us with no explanation after we had invested thousands of our own dollars in it. 
Thankfully, Mayor Gray stepped in and got it moving forward when he came to office, but still it languished and nothing happened. Then came Director Kelly, and after he evaluated it, he moved it forward quickly, and we are ready to have a groundbreaking in a couple of weeks, hopefully. All the units have been pre-sold to folks in lower modest income categories, first-time home buyers in the neighborhood. It took leadership for this to happen from Director Kelly and DHCD. Second, a few weeks ago, Director Kelly met with the affordable dwelling unit owners that are being buried financially and otherwise due to the terrible situation they have been placed in by the city in these market rate condo buildings that have a few affordable units included in them where the condo fees have risen to be double what their mortgage payment is. Making these units completely unaffordable for current owners and others in their income category. You, Madam Chair, will hear the testimony on this matter in a minute, and you and you met uh, with a group on this issue in your office a couple of days ago, which we are grateful for. Until Mr. Kelly became director, no one of his standing or otherwise had ever sat down with these lower income owners and listened to them and the might nightmare that they are living much less offered to help in ways that give them some relief and a way out of this failed city policy. Mr. Kelly met with these distressed and trapped owners a few weeks ago. He listened to them <clears throat> and he heard them and he promised to do what he could to help. But most of all, he treated them with respect and dignity, which they did not feel had been done before uh, for them and to them. So the culture, the spirit, the philosophy, the way in which people and communities are treated and what the staff understands as their and the department's mission to be is all important, Madam Chair, as I'm sure you agree. And I hope in the months and years ahead you will address these issues along with the others in your committee. And I want to thank you for an opportunity to testify. Thank you, Reverend Dickerson. Um, you're with your colleagues, Sarah Scruggs, Sarah. <coughs> Good morning, Chairwoman Bowser and staff. <clears throat> My name is Sarah Scruggs, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Outreach at MANA. I'm here to speak about the Home Purchase Assistance Program. Others will speak about ways to improve the program today. MANA has offered suggestions to DHCDD based on our experience with lower income buyers and our work in the current lending environment and housing market. We've also worked with other nonprofits in the Coalition of Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development to analyze why there was underspending in HPAP's fiscal year 2012 budget. However, today I would like to focus on the need for this program and statistics that demonstrate growing demand. At a time when it's cheaper to own than rent in the district in many areas and with historically low interest rates, the DC government should at least maintain current HPAP levels, if not increase them. Providing home ownership opportunities to low and moderate income people also allows room for other DC residents to benefit from other essential affordable housing programs, creating a dynamic continuum of housing that moves people up and out of poverty. HPAP has helped approximately 13,000 DC residents move out of systems of dependency and ongoing subsidy and currently generates $2 million in repayment every year. Even through the housing crisis, HPAP recipients have only a 2% foreclosure rate. HPAP is not money the district spends, but rather an investment the city makes in homes all across D.C., an investment with infinite return. Home ownership offers a way for prepared families to build wealth through the equity in their home, helps reduce crime in neighborhoods, and improves children's educational performance. And MANA has seen a huge increase in demand for down payment assistance amongst D.C. government workers and residents over the past year. In 2012, as part of our Own Now campaign, over 700 district residents and workers contacted us with interest in home ownership, 90% of whom were under 80% of the area median income, which is the income group that HPAP serves. For those that weren't ready to purchase, we offered them counseling and also directed them to other counseling organizations and resources in the city. Currently, MANA has 60 people in our ongoing monthly homebuyer clubs that will be ready to purchase in the next year, and another 65 are on a two-year track. In addition to those committed club members, our counseling staff receives calls from and conducts individual credit sessions with two to three people every week. There's more calls than that, and over 90% of these people are income eligible for HPAP. 
Finally, as part of the one-time city lift program that MANA was granted $7 million by Wells Fargo to lend as down payment assistance, over 1,300 people came to the kickoff event in early October, and 527 of those pre-qualified for a mortgage and left with down payment reservations, while the others were scheduled for counseling appointments at MANA. Of the 527 with reservations, 198 were DC residents that made under 80% of the AMI, which again is the income group that HPAP serves. And we continue to have 20 new people a week contact us about the LIFT program, which we have no more money left out to give, and we direct all DC residents to HPAP. Uh, we believe that now is the time to invest in the HPAP program. Interested in home ownership is growing. There's excellent pre and post counseling services in the city. Interest rates will never again be this low, and development will eventually price out many residents in Ward 7 and 8 where home ownership rates are as low as 24%. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Spate? Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Diane Richardson Spate, and I am the head advocacy and organizing officer with MANA. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning on behalf of the current affordable dwelling unit owners, otherwise known as ADUs. Since 2009, MANA has been advocating with educated and hardworking ADU owners across the district. These owners purchased homes in mixed income condominiums created in cooperation with for-profit developers which were marketed by the district as affordable. Many of these units have become unaffordable due to the rising condo fees and unanticipated special assessments. On December 13, 2012, 15 owners from across eight condo buildings submitted or gave public testimony at a hearing called by former Councilmember Brown. Officials from DHCD were also present and testified at that hearing. Following the hearing, emergency legislation was proposed by Councilmember Brown's office that would allow the ADU members with condo fee increases of 25% or more to rent or sell the unit up to 80% of the AMI, grant the owners HPAP forgiveness, and allow DHCD the ability to reissue HPAP loans. MANA was told that the emergency legislation had passed at the Council Legislative Session on December 18th and confirmed on January 8th that it was officially in effect. After informing the owners of the relief to come, MANA discovered different language and heard DHCD had given pushback after the December 13th hearing. The legislation that actually passed allowed AD owners with condo fee increases of 25% or more to rent their units and ask for the following to be studied. The mayor's ability to change ADU guidelines, whether the homeowner can rent, Recommendations for resources for DHCD and the policy fiscal impacts of granting the owners the ability to rent or sell. This was a disappointment to many ADU owners who need timely relief to their home ownership situations, which have trapped them in financial ruin. Thankfully, Director Kelly agreed to meet with these owners on February 7th. DHCD met, staff met with a room full of ADU owner representing six affected condo buildings and a meaningful discussion followed. DHCD interpreted the emergency legislation to mean that ADU owners could only rent at the same percent AMI in which they purchased. After the staff explained the form used to request this ability to rent, ADU owners informed them that no one in the room would be able to, would be assisted by their interpretation. Director Kelly acknowledged the ADU program, while well-intentioned, has not been effective in creating and preserving affordable home ownership opportunities. He asked for the owners to collect their actual monthly expenses, contact their neighbors who are in similar situations, and promise the group would reconvene in three to four weeks. On behalf of the brave ADU owners who are present, I thank Director Kelly. Moving forward, I would like to see the following. I would like to see DHCD be asked by the council to report the actual current number of ADU ownership units in the district. Councilmember Brown's office asked for this several times without a response. And I would also like to see Director Kelly continue to follow through on promises to meet with current ADU owners and to discover what authority he has on his own and what needs legislation. Together we must ensure underserved communities are not the victim of flawed programs and homeowners who purchase with the hopes of making wise financial decisions are not trapped in their homes. I want to thank you all for your testimony and um, you've each put some um, fantastic perspectives on the record. So it's clear that the government is not providing all housing services in the district but 
partners um, with a lot of organizations to make sure that the DHCD mission or the Housing Finance Agency mission or even the DEMPEDS mission um, is being met in partnership with, with a lot of um, communities. Uh, let me turn to the question about HPAP. Um, because we have a, as part of the DHCD's mission, and I certainly think that home ownership allows you to make a lot of decisions in your life um, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to make, and we, we need everybody, we need to make it our policy and put our money behind um, making that a rela reality for many people. So you mentioned, uh, I think, Ms. Scruggs, and that in FY12 uh, there was underspending in HPAP or $1.4 million dollars. Have you ever, do you have any, can you speculate as to why that might be? Um, I actually worked with other nonprofits that are HPAP intake centers and the coalition to come up with information on that. I don't know if I want to steal Danielle Burr's thunder when I can speak. Okay. Um, some of it are, are market forces. Um, there, a lot, there aren't many homes that are under $400,000 um, that are on the market uh, that would be affordable for people. Uh, so that's part of the issue. There are some lending issues with the banks tightening up their requirements. So even somebody who has a really great credit score, if they don't have um, enough skin in the game or other things that the lending industry is looking for, um, that can be a barrier. Another barrier was that um, for the past several years, I think except for 2009, DHCD has not been able to uh, renew the contract with the Washington Urban League on time. Uh, so this last year, for about two months, um, no HPAP loans were made at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, that was a big problem for MANA, uh, for a lot of our homes that we're marketing, homeowners that we're working with. And I, I'm not sure what the effect has been on people that were out in the market that had contracts on homes. I don't know whether they were able to continue those. Maybe some of them lost those contracts. So some administrative issues and then also some market and lending issues. Okay. And so MANA worked recruits and works with people interested in home buying to get them. Have your numbers of um, people that you've been able to qualify also decreased in that period of time? Well, able to qualify, no. Um, people able to purchase, the City Lifts program allowed a lot of people to be able to purchase because there was $20,000 that they had in hand and then a lot of them did couple that with HPAP. Um, but for lower income folks, I, I have to be honest, it has been difficult with the banks. It's been very difficult to get people through. So okay. contracts continue to roll. And we can do that as MANA, continue to roll our people back. Um, but that may not be the case if you're with an individual private seller. So City Lift was funded by Wells Fargo? Yes. Why? Why did they have a seven? Uh, it was a settlement with the Department of Justice for bad lending practices. Okay. And that money's gone now? Uh, yeah, all the money is, is held up. There's just a one-time disbursement of $7 million and to other cities. So how many people benefited in down payment assistance from that $7 million? Uh, it's 350 total. Um, we've settled uh, almost 180 to date, and the rest will be settled in the next few months. All the money is tied up. Are those loans be, or those grants, um, are, are you finding that they're for home purchases all over the city? Are there some parts of the city where that predominates? We've seen a lot of home purchases in Ward 7 and 8, and then some in Ward 5 as well. But it has been spread all over the city, and just so you know, half are in Prince George's and half are in Washington, D.C. Okay, got it. I would be, would you be willing to share um, the location of where those grants were made? No problem. I have all that information. Okay. No we would, that would be very helpful. Um, and Reverend Dickerson, you are right. Leadership matters. Amen. If, if that is uh, the, the thrust of your testimony, I agree. Uh, leadership matters. And I always like to hear when there's been a project um, get unstuck. And it sounds like uh, Director Kelly, was, and I make up words sometimes, like unstuck. And, uh, and it sounds like that is a, uh, that's been a good thing. Um, and so also from the, the legal services, thank you for all the work that you do. And please stay in, in touch with us. But those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn Phillips. Manny Hidalgo. Manuel Ocho, Ochoa.
Farrah Fosset. Ms. Phillips. Good morning, Council Member Bowser and staff. My name is Wilhelmina Samuels, and I am the director of the Home Buyers Club, a financial literacy and home buyer education program. Oh, I program. thought you were Marilyn I'm Phillips. I'm reading her testimony. Oh, you're reading her testimony. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any testimony? Uh, no. Okay. You want me to just read hers? Um, I don't. I generally collect written testimony unless it's. Mm -hmm. It's already up there. Yeah. It's not customary, but since you're sitting there, I'll, I'll, I'll permit it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I am the director of the Home Buyers Club, a financial literacy and home buyer education program at Mana Inc. Uh, personally, the HPAP program has impacted my life as an HPAP recipient, and I've seen many families benefit from the program over the past 20 years. Currently, we are working with approximately 125 people monthly in our ongoing monthly program. Marilyn Phillips, a leading member of our IDA chapter, including 30 other soon-to-be homeowners, could not be with us today. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony on her behalf. Okay. My name is Marilyn Phillips, and I greatly appreciate getting to share my HPAP story with you. Last year, I testified at the Council in support of HPAP due to significant cuts which had been made to the program. One year later, I am here to continue to advocate on behalf of the HPAP program in light of rumors indicating more cuts be made during this budget season. Also, I want to share with you how essential it is for future homeowners for HPAP funds to remain available. My husband and I have a contract on one of the 24 units at MANA's newest condominium project, the Buxton. We feel very blessed to have the chance to purchase this property in the District of Columbia, but it will not happen without funds from HPAP. I'm sure the same is true for everyone else who is purchasing at the Buxton as well. As I understand it, HPAP is a loan, not a grant or gift. As such, it must be paid back in a timely fashion. These funds are crucial to many District of Columbia residents who also are purchasing affordable housing within the district's boundaries. The facts are everyone's budget is tight. HPAP has a very low foreclosure rate, and I think that is due to the rigorous home buyer education. Um, that people go through, I'm sorry. Construction has not yet begun on this property, but when it does, my husband and I will need every resource available to ensure we are able to become homeowners. I respectfully request that you carefully take into consideration the hopes and dreams of everyone who is depending on HPAP to make their dreams a reality. We know homeownership positively changes neighborhoods, crime rate depreciates, Homeowners invest in making their properties appeasing to the eye, as well as making out for in, looking out for any strangers or crime. And children, when they have a permanent home, excel in school. In closing, I love living in the District of Columbia and look forward to the many upcoming changes forthcoming east of the river. Please continue to make HPAP available to me and other district residents seeking to fulfill the American dream. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Hidalgo. Good morning, Chairwoman Bowser. My name is Manny Hidalgo, Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center. LEDC equips Latinos and other D.C. area residents with the skills and financial tools to buy and stay in their homes, take control of the decisions affecting their apartment buildings, and start or expand small businesses. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. As the district embarks on strategies to create 100,000 jobs and build and preserve at least 10,000 units of affordable housing, DHCD's work is critical to their achievement. In FY 2012, LEDC worked closely with DHCD to create a better future for more than 5,000 DC families and their communities. This year, we are building on our 22-year partnership with DHCD 
by working with them to move our headquarters from Adams Morgan in Ward 1 to Petworth in Ward 4, where a majority of the district's Latino community now lives. With financing from DHCD, we are going to build an inspiring facility that allows us to provide increased high-quality services and position us to expand our work into the future. DHCD programs that fund stable housing and thriving businesses lift the voices and secure the aspirations of D.C.'s diverse residents. It is this economic diversity that now makes the district such an attractive place to live. The time is now to tap the city's economic momentum to strengthen DHD's impact in the community. Over the last year, LEDC leveraged its funding from the Small Business Technical Assistance Program to inject more than $402,000 into the local economy and support the projected creation and or preservation of 231 jobs in the district. Neighborhood-based activities funding helped our tenant organizers provide assistance to 74 apartment buildings and limited equity housing cooperatives, 35 of which received technical assistance through the, tenity, through the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act process. Close to 40 families purchased their first home through the Home Purchase Assistance Program, and 395 families prepared for future home ownership through, through pre-purchase counseling and training. But let's move beyond the numbers. The work is about one central point. Who gets to take part and benefit from the district's economic prosperity? We know the vision set forth to attract new businesses and residents to the city, but DHCD helps us keep our commitment to low to moderate income residents who are ready to be part of this dynamic change. This work means small business owners remain as thriving participants within our communities. New homeowners claim a stronger stake in their community, and tenants know their rights and live in better housing conditions. The mayor's focus on equity as part of a sustainable D.C. is where DHCD fits into this larger vision. And D.C. residents have the drive, capacity, and ability to take on the challenges that come with the city that is seeing the type of growth that we are seeing. Let's make the most of this opportunity. The mayor has announced a new one-time $100 million commitment to affordable housing. So let's make sure the adequate long-term funding of the Housing Production Trust Fund is a beacon of light for renters fighting displacement. To the new, to leverage the laudable efforts of the Gray administration to support small businesses through the new Business Regulatory Task Force and Small Business Resource Center, let's fully fund the Small Business Technical Assistance Program to help the city reach its goal of 100,000 new jobs. Let's push forward responsible development in the city, but let's fund the neighborhood-based services program so that renters and homeowners have support from our tenant organizers, our housing counselors, so they can take control of their housing and their quality of life. We agree with you, Chairwoman Bowser, housing is economic development, and so is small business development. Let's strengthen opportunities for economic advancement, business by business, building by building, and new homeowner by new homeowner. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Ochoa, is that right? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Chairperson Bowser. My name is Manuel Ochoa, Regional Director of Home Ownership for the Latino Economic Development Center. I'm here to share information about DC families that qualified for a home purchase assistance program in the district in FY 2012. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Home ownership is a key piece of our comprehensive approach to community-based economic development. This sense of accomplishment gives participants a sense of ownership, community, and long-term prosperity for their families. First-time home buyers share with us the transformative experience of seeing their children have more space to play, the opportunity to live in their own home, and perhaps discover a new part of the district and accomplish something they never dreamed possible. In FY 2012, as one of five HPAP intake centers, we helped 108 families qualify for the HPAP program, and 36 became first-time home buyers. For them, HPAP has made that dream possible. Yet, to find the right house and to meet the underwriting requirements of the HPAP program, prospective home buyers juggle many considerations and challenges in the marketplace. In preparation for today's hearing, we surveyed 42 of our prospective home buyers approved for an HPAP loan in 2012, but who did not go to closing to understand why some of them have been able to secure that dream with HPAP while others have not. And here's what we found. 
Almost one-third of respondents are in the last stages of the purchasing pro process. Many have ratified contracts and are waiting to go to closing. Some are waiting for construction on their homes to finish, while others have had delays working with their first trust lender. Many of these say they wouldn't be as close as they are without the HPAP loan. One-sixth of the respondents that we surveyed are still actively searching for a home and want to use HPAP. Many cite the high cost of housing in the district and the inability to find the right location at the right price point. Others reference the difficulty of finding potential homes that need repairs that sellers won't make to comply with the rigorous inspection criteria under the program, delaying the buying process. And then finally, one-fifth of the respondents we surveyed had decided not to use the HPAP program after all. Many cannot find homes that are affordable in the market, even with HPAP, while others are moving ahead to purchase homes with needed repairs in excess of what is allowable under HPAP. A pair of buyers cited the challenges of significant paperwork and having to work with many different agencies to use the HPAP program effectively. Despite these challenges, 81% indicated they had either used their HPAP loan to buy their first home or intended to use it to buy a home this year, citing the HPAP loan as an indispensable tool in their journey to become first-time home buyers. Given the demand for HPAP is strong, we need to holistically reform the program to strengthen what it provides to DC residents along the affordable continuum of housing. Let's start by leveraging the economic momentum in the district to increase the buying power of HPAP to more easily put ownership in reach within all DC's neighborhoods. Let's do what we can to streamline the administrative process involved to reduce delays and help homeowners access DC's affordable housing stock given its limited nature. We are looking forward to working with you to ensure the success of the HPAP program and ensure its full utilization given the tremendous need demonstrated in the community. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, very helpful. Ms. Fosse? Hi, good morning, uh, Chairperson Bowser. Good morning. My name is Farah Fosse and I'm the Director of the Affordable Housing Preservation Program at the Latino Economic Development Center. I'm also a Ward 4 homeowner and I recently served on the Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force. I'm here today to testify about our work through DHCD's Neighborhood Based Services Program and about the importance of the Housing Production Trust Fund and the Tenant Purchase Program. Um, as you heard during the last fiscal year, our program worked with over with 74 buildings, 35 of which were going through the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act process. 16 of those have since completed the process, and 14 of them have preserved affordability for all of the current residents. And we're very pleased that one building in your ward, which is on Colorado Avenue, has just been approved for an acquisition loan through the Housing Production Trust Fund. The tenants will be purchasing the building um, to fix it up and retain it as 100% affordable housing. And I'm sure they'd love to speak with you if they haven't yet. <laughs> um, and over the last year, we've seen a huge increase in the number of buildings going up for sale with viable third-party contracts, meaning something is going to happen. And as I tell residents, a sale in a multifamily building in DC is both a risk and an opportunity. It's a risk that the new, homeowner, the new owner may try to take it out of affordability, but it's an opportunity to preserve that affordability for the long term and to get um, improved conditions. This often happens by partnering um, with, a, with a developer or with a new owner or assigning their rights to a company that will fix up the building and preserve it as affordable housing, and less frequently um, through the tenants purchasing themselves. What I've seen is that when tenants have good options and when they have technical assistance, they make good decisions, meaning that when there's a party interested in purchasing and preserving the building as affordable housing and there's funds to actually do that, the tenants choose that over buyouts or over displacement. Um, and really with that funding, there are much better options. However, the last year, it's been very difficult to work through the TOPA process. There have been limited funds to support preservation and also a lack of clarity on exactly how much funding is available. Without the financial support in the form of low interest loans and tax credits, there's a missed preservation opportunity whenever these buildings go up for sale. As the co-chair of CNHUD's Support for Tenant Purchase Working Group, I've been meeting on a quarterly basis with DHCD over the last year to discuss how we can improve the tenant purchase program and process. We greatly appreciate the openness of DHCD and the willingness of staff to listen and collaborate. We're recommending to DHCD that they conduct a comprehensive review of the tenant purchase program. 
from our own reviews, which have been conducted by um, CNHED and DCFPI is currently doing one. We found that when DHCD funds are used to support tenant purchase, the results have been outstanding. Affordable housing is preserved for the long term at a per unit cost that's lower than most other preservation and production programs, with the added social benefits of preventing displacement and preserving mixed income communities. DHCD tenant purchase projects have been highly successful. And we know that since 2002, 1,500 units of affordable housing have been preserved through this program. Um, and I really do want to stress that when there's technical assistance and when there's trust fund dollars available, this long-term preservation is very successful. Currently, though, DHCD has a target of funding just 100 units per year. This goal is far below the opportunity and the need that are being presented. In the last fiscal year, almost 5,000 units of multifamily housing went up for sale. I and the tenants I work with were very pleased to hear the mayor's announcement that he will dedicate an additional $100 million to the production and preservation of affordable housing. Currently, LEDC is working with over 20 tenant associations that have the opportunity to purchase. Um, you've already heard from one today, and I believe you'll hear from one other. Additional funding in the trust fund could be put to great use by these groups and the partners they're working with to ensure low and moderate income residents can remain in DC's diverse neighborhoods, and that the prosperity that the district is currently experiencing benefits all residents and communities. I also want to express that I understand that our responsibility to preserve affordable housing does not end when a tenant association or a developer purchases the building. LEDC works with DHCD as a partner to ensure that our city's investment is safeguarded. We provide technical assistance to new and long-term cooperatives. Both LEDC and other CNHED members hope to work more closely with DHCD over the next year to regularly assess co-ops with DHCD funding and catch any problems before they're too far along. I look forward to working with both DHCD and the Council over the next year to ensure that these programs continue to be strengthened both through increased funding and through sound policy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I want to thank you all uh, for your testimony and thank you, ma'am, for presenting Ms. Uh, Phillips' testimony um, as well. Um, let me start with you, Mr. Haldaga. In the, I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, but welcome to Ward 4. I guess you're going to be moving soon, and you know quite rightly that uh, we have welcomed in, in our ward uh, the city's mo uh, most of the city's uh, Latino residents. Um, and now we're starting to see slowly, but we're encouraged, a lot of the organizations that have supported our Latino residents over the years also making a presence um, in Ward 4. And I think you could have chosen no better location uh, than uh, Georgia Avenue to make make your headquarters. So what's your timeline? Um, thank you. <laughs> and thanks for being a part of, of getting us to, to this point. Um, we are, right now we are hoping to get to um, acquisition actually before March 5th and to, to start the renovation process um, as probably mid-May. Uh, and we estimate it's going to take about six months so we're looking at it late October, November, move-in date. Um, that's that's the, the current timeline. But um, yeah, as you can imagine, the, a lot of moving parts. But th that's where we are right now. Okay. Well, that's helpful to know. And what services exactly will you have out of that building? So everything that we do currently. So that's all the small business technical assistance with the micro lending and the training and one-on-one TA. All the home owner home ownership counseling assistance, which of course first-time home buyers and foreclosure prevention and all the affordable housing preservation work with the tenant organizers. But probably the biggest change will be uh, a, like a, a real state-of-the-art training uh, section of the building, a, a, a real training room that can appropriately accommodate the number of people that we consistently have showing up for, for our trainings and seminars. Um, and and the, the possibility of growth. Right now we have 28 employees in the district and the new space will allow us to grow up to 40. So it'll, you know, for the next 20 years, we'll be well positioned to, to continue okay. to meet the demand. Okay. I would encourage you to introduce yourself to the neighborhood. Um, you're an ANC 4C. I think that's your ANC. That's Ms. Basse's ANC. And um, there are some businesses on that corridor as well. And we look forward to um, to those discussions. Thank you. You're, uh, you're welcome. Um, so, the, Mr. Ochoa, the, the information you've provided about um, why people haven't moved forward is very helpful and I think in informing um, our partner organizations as well as the government what we might do to get more um, money out the door and it's that type of data I think that can really uh, it can really help us so let me ask you this question when people say there aren't any homes in the district for under four hundred thousand dollars that's not exactly true is it 
No, it okay. just depends on the word and where they where they want to look, what they want to buy. But sometimes it's difficult for what they're looking for, and I think in that sense, perhaps maybe they they take longer. So a lot of the people that we work with, they take more than a year before they buy something that they like. And is there any expiration on their HPAP approval? There is, and that causes part of the delay because once their HPAP certificate expires and they have to go back and they have to get an extension. Now, sometimes things expire because somebody starts out and they're kind of looking, right? They're not really right. looking every day or every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and they, are there people that are in that category, that's why the time expires? Or these people are, these are people who are immediately looking to move and purchase imminently? Well, when they, are, when they are approved, by the time we get them to the point of approval, they're ready to go. So at that point, uh, they're usually looking for, for a home. Okay, so these aren't so, window shoppers. No, these oh, are so not So these window are people who are really can't find what they want. Right. In, the, in that period of That's time. Correct. Okay, so you identified some administrative fixes that you think the department could make. Have you shared that with them already? Not yet. Okay, so those are some things that um, that we would be interested to, to hear because it, it pains me when people say they want to buy houses and right. we have $1.4 million in the assistance that went unspent. Right. Yeah. Um, and the point that was made earlier, and I have had this experience, although I didn't think it was still happening, is that one of the our partners didn't get their contract approved for two months. Is that right? Right. So you were working for 10 months instead of 12 months. Okay, I got it. And um, I had another question. Can you just, you know, for the people who will be watching this hearing, just give a thumbnail of what HPAP would provide and how you would be eligible? Sure. Um, HPAP provides up to $40,000 in down payment assistance and uh, $4,000 in closing costs. You do have to be uh, income eligible, so depending on your eligibility will determine how much down payment assistance you receive. And you uh, participate in a minimum of uh, 16 hours of counseling. Part of that includes, um, like uh, University Legal Services mentioned, we also have an eight-hour home ownership workshop that they participate in, in and as well as the one-on-one. -on -one. So it really is beneficial because then the, the client and the counselor, they work together to look through any credit issues and get them to the point where they are prepared to become a home buyer and talk about what all the different steps are. Okay, so and the beneficial. down payment assistance, is that a grant or a loan? It's a, uh, a deferred forgivable loan. It's deferred a deferred loan. loan. How long Over is five that? years. Deferred for the first five years. Okay. So you would go and you get $40,000 that you right. wouldn't have to pay back for five years. Right. Okay. And is it, it, what kind of interest is the it? The second, uh, uh, zero interest. Zero interest. That's right. For five years or for, for the entire? For after, well, for, for, for the first five years they don't pay, and then after five years they begin to make payments. But there's so no interest? So it's the same way. It's a second second trust loan. So part of the... Part of the challenge, too, that a lot of our home buyers have is finding a bank that will have a first trust loan that will conform in the underwriting. So that's the part where they have to work with uh, um, Greater Washington Urban League. So we're always encouraging lenders to become familiar with the HPAP program and have a loan that can conform. A lot of the, um, a lot of the big lenders do have programs, uh, so we're increasingly always trying to make sure that, that uh, people get the word out that those special loans exist. So. But for the entirety of the loan, it's zero interest. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, you can't beat that. Right. <laughs> you really have $40,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to figure out the, the issues um, involved here. I say all the time mm -hmm. that, you know, the look, Probably the best decision I ever made was buying a home. Um, and at the time that I did, I did not make a lot of money. I went through a home assistance program. It was, I think, more stringent than the, even those requirements at NACA. But it has allowed me to make so many um, different uh, decisions in my life. So we, we want to make sure that we're always investing in these types of programs because yeah. they can really make a difference um, between if you can buy or if you cannot buy. Um, but I also want to say uh, there are a lot of homes in the district that are under $400,000 and I hope that we and all, all of our partners encourage people to open up their eyes to all of the district's neighborhoods, to all of the district's neighborhoods. 
Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Patricia Quinto. Okay. Tom da da Dawes. Tom Dawes. Gabriel Mosi. Gabrielle, you're not Gabriel. <laughs> oh, Patricia Quintus Sandoval. My chairperson, Bowser, I'll be doing interpretation. Buenos días, mi, nom mi nombre es Patricia Quinto Sandoval. Y he vivido en el Distrito de Columbia desde agosto del 2004. Good, good morning. My name is Patricia Quinto Sandoval, and I've lived in the District of Columbia since August of 2004. Tengo el sueño de tener una casa, un lugar donde mi familia pueda venir y estar conmigo. Actualmente vivo en un departamento de estudiante muy pequeño. I have the dream of owning a home, a place where my family can come and be with me. Currently, I live in a very small student apartment. Desde el 2006 supe del programa de HPAP. En el 2012 apliqué para el programa del HPAP porque estaba decidida a comprar una casa. Era la tercera vez que estaba aplicando. Solo esperaba que saliera la aprobación de mi aplicación para poder comprar mi casa, pues no quería esperar más. I have known about the HPAP program since 2006. In 2012, I applied for the program because I was committed to buying a home. It was the third time I was applying. This time I was hoping my application would be approved so I could buy a home because I didn't want to wait any longer. Latino Economic Development Center me ayudó mucho con la aplicación y cooperaron conmigo y respetaron mis creencias. Gracias a, di a Dios califiqué de nuevo, pero al final no decidí usar el programa HPA. ¿Por qué? LEDC helped me a lot with the application. They worked with me and respected my beliefs. Thanks to God, I qualified again. But at the end, I decided not to use the HPAP program. Como se sabe, los inmuebles en el Distrito de Columbia son casas antiguas, en las que la, en la mayoría de los casos tienen problemas estructurales, y el programa del HPAP no los acepta. As you know, houses in the district are old, and many of them have structural issues, and the HPAP program does not accept them. Empecé a buscar casa desde el julio del 2012. Finalmente, en noviembre del 2012, aceptaron una oferta y los vendedores también aceptaron el HPAP. I started to look for a house in July of 2012. In November 2012, I found a house and the seller accepted my offer and they also agreed to accept the HPAP. Estaba contenta. A simple vista, la casa se veía en buenas condiciones, sin humedad en el basement. Pero al momento de la inspección, se descubrió que las paredes estaban abombadas y que necesitaba reparación, la cual HPAP no acepta. I was happy to see at first sight that the house was in good conditions without humidity in the basement, but when the house was inspected, it was discovered that the walls were damaged and would need to be repaired for me to be able to use my HPAP loan. Así que después de, muchos, de mucho análisis y de hablar con el banco para ver si calificaba aún sin usar el HPAP, finalmente el banco me dijo que calificaba. Sin el HPAP. Por eso decidí no usar HPAP. After thinking it through and talking to the bank, I wanted to know if I could still qualify for a loan to buy the house without HPAP. The bank did say yes, so I decided not to use it. El movimiento inmobiliario en el área de DC es muy difícil y competitivo. Un ejemplo, un día chequeé una casa que salió en el mercado en la mañana, como a las 8 de la mañana, y llamé al realtor como a las 10 y media. Y el realtor me dijo, tienes 10 minutos para presentar tu oferta. Esa casa a las 11 de la mañana ya tenía una oferta aceptada. The real estate market in D.C. is very difficult and competitive. For example, one day I saw a house go on the market in the morning at 8 a.m. And by 11 a.m., there was already an accepted offer. I called the realtor at 10.30 and he told me I only had 10 minutes to send my offer. How could I do it? I would need to prepare the offer and get back in touch with the realtor. And this you cannot do in 10 minutes. El HPAP es un programa que ayuda a mucha gente y podría ayudar a mucha más, 
Lo único que le falta es que sea un poco más flexible con los requerimientos y considere también las casas con problemas estructurales. The HPAT program helps many people and could help many more. The only thing that is missing is a little bit more flexibility with the requirements so that it, be, it can be used to buy homes that may have some kind of structural problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Mr. Dawes. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mayor Bowser. My name is Thomas Dawes, and I'm the Business Development Director for the Development Corporation of Columbia Heights. Thank you for the opportunity to present to the Committee on the Performance of the Department of Housing and Community Development. As a community partner, DCH, DCCH has received a Small Business Program Grant and a Facades Storefront Improvement Grant for the Lower Georgia Avenue Business Corridor. As a result of these funds received from DH, DHCD, we will continue to sm provide small business technical assistance to the small businesses and provide facade storefront improvements in the 2600, 2700 blocks of Georgia Avenue. The improvements will include facade storefront improvements that will make the blocks more appealing. DCC staff, DCCH staff has constantly been meeting with the small business owners and business merchants over the last year in preparation for the facade storefront pre-development and post-construction phase of the program. DCCH staff has been working very closely with the Georgia Avenue Community Development Task Force and the Georgia Avenue Business Alliance to assist the small businesses with small business technical assistance in the area of business planning and identifying potential funding for their business. Each month, there's a meeting held to discuss significant issues as relate to the Lower Georgia Avenue Business Corridor. The meetings are very well attended by the residents and small business owners in the community. Most recently, the Office of Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development and DHCD collaborate on the Great Streets Initiative Improvement for the Lower and Upper Georgia Avenue Business Corridor. There were approximately 95 participants in attendance for the first orientation session held at the Banneker Recreation Center in Ward 1 for the DEMPAD Great Streets Initiative. Georgia Avenue, the city's longest commercial business corridor and a designated Great Street offers numerous retail and development opportunities for small businesses along the Lower Georgia Avenue Business Corridor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Mossy? Is it Mossy? Uh, yes, Mossy. Mossy. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Gabriela Mossy, and I'm the Director of Program and Resource Development at the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of our team, um, I am happy to be here to talk a little bit about our Small Business Technical Assistance Program, which is made possible through funding by DHCD. We uh, concentrate our funding on Ward 5, especially along the Rhode Island Avenue Northeast Corridor. Uh, last, with the money, fiscal year 12 money, we engage approximately 440 businesses. Um, and provided very intense and individualized technical assistance to 24 clients. Those clients were able to retain approximately 113 jobs and create another 24. We also provided 14 educational seminar and networking events. We did one small business matchmaking event, our small business expo. I have information for the next one that we're already planning. We hope that you will be joining us. And other uh, corridor promoting events and activities such as this directory. This year we did what we call a pull out and save directory that goes inside the Ward 5 heartbeat. We partnered with them. This goes to 1,800 households. This helps promote small businesses in Ward 5. Yeah, in addition to the educational activities, we try to provide innovative services and this is, again, the Small Business Expo and something we call the Small Business Matchmaking, which is designed to connect the small businesses, especially CBEs, to the larger contractors. And last year, we were able to pair them up and have a little bit of a speed networking or speed interviews with uh, companies such as WMATA, Clark Construction, Events DC, the U.S. Naval Department, uh, Red Cross International, and that type of large organization. Again, this was all in fiscal year uh, 2012, and our grant was about $124,000. Now, I have um, 
here very compelling testimony from three small business owners who unfortunately cannot be here with us. They are small and they have to tend to their business, but they are very kindly took time to write three letters, so I will submit those for the record and you can review them. You review them later. Uh, we are very happy to work with DACD. We are happy to work with our partners who do similar work so that we can provide better services. Our only comment is that our service would greatly improve if the contracting and payment process at DHCD were sped up somewhat. Last year, the contracts were delayed for a few months. We have seen improvements, I would like to say, for fiscal year 13 in the way that the entire application process and contracting agreement process has moved ahead, but it's still a little bit delayed, which means that we, we can't work Technically, we can't work for the 12 months if the contract doesn't come in uh, on time because, again, we don't want to work without a contract and some of our consultants are also don't want to work without a contract. So those are my only comments, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Ms. Fonsi, and I want to thank you all um, for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Sandoval, we, we heard you loud and clear, and it's always good to have a, a real-life example of how policies are working or not working as well as they should. Um, and let me just make sure I understand, and I will address this with the government um, as well. The, D, the um, HPAP loan doesn't permit, uh, is there a dollar amount of repairs that it permits or is there a certain type of repairs that are disallowed? Um, they allow it a two to three thousand dollar loan. The two or three K loan that it two or three thousand dollar loan to the two or three K loan is for the maximum thirty five thousand dollars. Okay, so if the damage, if the repairs that are needed are more than thirty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, then you can't Just purchase. Just for cosmetic repair, not for a structural. Got repair. it. Only for cosmetic repairs. I got it. Okay, so this is uh, something that I'll address with the department to see if we can understand their rationale or to see if there's any flexibility. Um, so you you have been able to get into your home. Yeah. Congratulations, congratulations. Thank so, you. what neighborhood is lucky to have you? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, in Woodbridge. In Woodbridge. Well, congratulations, yes. congratulations. <laughs> and so you'll, you'll be happy. Miss Mosi likes hearing that, since so she's working <laughs> yes. in Ward Five. Um, so, what hundred blocks are you on, Miss Mosi? Between what streets on Rhode Island Avenue? Um, well, we start Blo Bloomingdale. Okay. Around First Street, all the way to about Twenty Third or South Dakota Avenue, technically. Oh, that's a long distance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It is. is this the first? Um, is this the first? Do you know DHCD business assistance uh, on on the quarter, on that quarter that you're that you're we, implementing? We've been working there over three years with okay. DHCD funding. Okay. And there are other nonprofits who also provide small business technical assistance in in Ward Five. Okay. But it's in the past few couple of years that we have concentrated try to concentrate efforts because it's limited funding to that corridor. So we've worked with residents, you know, along the corridor and other nonprofits, Washington Area Community Investment Fund, Wake Up, for example, is in Ward 5. Um, and obviously some, some other, there's, there's a group called the Rhode Island Avenue Task Force. There are some other civic associations and other groups that are interested obviously, in the, in the improvement of, of the corridor. Now, are you doing yeah. any um, facade improvements? The, no, the chamber does not have funding for facade improvements. Okay. But we work with others who do okay. to try to coordinate, again, to try to bring some of, that, some of those facade improvements to Ward 5. And if we can, obviously, Rhode Island Avenue itself. Are there yeah. facade monies on, on your quarter, on that part of the quarter, do you know? They are this year. This for year. For the first time. Okay. What about? It can be directly used. And the, the, new, 
the new funding through Great Streets, which Tom talked about, uh, through Great Streets is the, it's called, technically it's called a capital improvement grant, right, Tom? That was for the first time touched on a little part of Rhode Island Avenue because technically there was money for North Capitol Street, which also needs it. So there's a little bit of Rhode Island Avenue there, but this, this round of funding for those improvements, which are, can be for facade and for internal improvements of the business, were, uh, Rhode Island Avenue Northeast was not eligible. So we're hoping that a round of money will be coming. And we're also hoping that the Great Streets program will, fully, will be fully funded for Rhode Island Avenue this coming year, because I know that there is an act, there's a Retail Amendment Act for Rhode Island Avenue, and it's been designated a Great Street, but without any funding. Got it. Obviously, all, the, all this would complement the work that we are doing, you know, the technical assistance and obviously. Well, the committee is very street interested street, yeah. in that uh, Great Streets yeah. retail TIF, and we're going to talk a lot about it next week. Um, so, and what about uh, any clean and safe monies? Are, is there a clean team? I believe there's a green, a green team, not through us. Okay. Not through the chamber, but there is, there is funding for, for that area. Okay. I, can't, I can't give you the details, but I believe there is. I don't know if there's anybody here okay, that knows well, a little bit more about that. But okay. we, we, also, we also welcome that, certainly. All, all these compliments, again, these, these things have to work. We have, we have to work comprehensively, comprehensively to try to improve our streets. It can't just be one program. We have to improve streetscape. We have to improve how our businesses operate, how they look is important. Obviously, clean and safe is key. A absolutely. So we want to do all we can to support um, your efforts in, on Rhode Island Avenue. Um, I probably, you know, all of the tools that we've been successful in getting on Georgia Avenue will will help um, right. help on that avenue as well. So we're we're looking forward to working with you and others concerned about it. Great. Mr. Doss, so which between what streets are you talking about about the facade improvement programs? You gave me the hundred blocks, but it would help if I knew the cross streets, the twenty six and twenty seven hundred. We're talking about Euclid and Georgia Avenue. Okay. Up to Fairmont. You can, okay. However, we are working with storefront owners from the 26 on your block up till the 4300 block of Georgia Avenue. As okay. a part of the collaboration between DHCD and DEMPEG, we submitted eight applications on the behalf of owners in Ward 4 and owners in Ward 1 as a part of the facade storefront improvement program. When is the deadline for those applications? It's it was February 15th, last okay. Friday. Okay. And I note, um, and we will talk to the government about uh, when um, grants start. Um, and it's, I've had this discussion with many agencies in this government. Our fiscal year starts on October the 1st. Every year it starts on October the 1st. And every year there's some gap in when services can restart because the, the contract's not in place. I've never understood it. Every year. Um, so we heard about it already with HPAP. Um, I've experienced it with DSLBD and some other agencies with the clean teams. Every year, there's a gap. And so you're quite right that, um, and I tell all of our contractors, you, you said it right, you, you can't work when you don't have a contract. Though some people think, well, just go ahead and, you know, nobody's looking. And no, you can't. And you can't, you shouldn't be expected to work and not get paid. Um, but certainly what I hear from my residents is, why don't I see my clean team? Or why can't I have my meeting? Well, somebody didn't um, put the contract in place. And, you know, that's, that's not acceptable. So maybe one, maybe Mr. Kelly will figure this out this year. Maybe we will. Okay. Thank you all for your testimony. Ted Trebu, Robert Pullman, Danielle Burrs,
Jenny Reed. Mr. Trebu, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madam Chairman, you ready for me to proceed? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser. Uh, for the record, my name is Ted Trebu. I serve as the Managing Director of the District of Columbia Sustainable Energy Utility, and I'm a fourth generation Washingtonian and a lifelong resident of your ward, Madam Chair, Ward 4. And I've heard the conversation for the last half an hour or so and want to say that uh, what a wonderful program HPAP is. And I purchased my first home in Ward 4 with the assistance of HPAP. So I uh, strongly commend that program to any citizens who are interested in purchasing a home here in the District of Columbia. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you how the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, working with the District of Columbia Department of Housing and Community Development, has helped district homeowners, renters, businesses, and institutions in all wards save energy and money. First of all, let me talk about the DC Sustainable Energy Utility for just a second and give some background. We were established by the Clean and Affordable Energy Act of 2008 that this council passed, but we only started delivering services. We finally got our contract, as you said, contract can take a while. Uh, we got our contract with the District Department of the Environment in March of 2011. So we've been operating now for about 22 months. And our goals are to reduce per capita energy consumption, increasing renewable energy generating capacity, and that's the piece I'm going to talk about a little while uh, today, reducing growth in peak demand, improving energy efficiency for low-income housing, reducing growth of energy demand of the largest energy users here in the District of Columbia, and most importantly, for my uh, sake here, in increasing the number of green jobs that we create for our residents of the District of Columbia. I'm delighted to report that in 2012, the DC Sustainable Energy Utility saved enough electricity to power more than 2,000 American homes for one year and served over 18,500 district households with energy efficiency and renewable energy initiatives. In addition, millions of dollars stayed in the local economy through contracts with local district-based services and product suppliers. Residents in every ward can now see the benefits of energy efficiency and renewable energy in action. Overall, our savings last year created the equivalent of taking 3,313 cars off the road for a year. The second goal that I talked about earlier about increasing renewable energy generating capacity is an area in which we collaborated with the Department of Housing and Community Development last year. One of the initiatives that we started was a small-scale solar initiative. We were installing solar panels on single-family low-income homes. And we didn't have a lot of time in which to facilitate or to complete these projects, and so we needed to find low-income homes, we concentrated on Ward 7 and 8 because we took a look at a map, this map I have here and I'll attach it to my testimony, that showed exactly how many homes throughout the various wards in the District of Columbia actually had solar panels already installed on them. And we looked at Wards 7 and 8 combined and less than a dozen homes in those two wards actually had solar panels. If you contrast that to wards like Ward 6, which has 165 homes in it, Ward 1, which has 149 homes in it. Ward 7 and 8 really did not uh, have much of this technology, and so we concentrated on those two wards. And then we looked to the Department of Housing and Community Development that to find homes that had been through their roofing program. One of the critical elements when you're installing solar panels on roofs is, of course, to make sure that the roof is structurally sound enough to support the weight of the systems. And so it was a way for us to quickly identify a potential pool of homes that we could serve. Uh, as I said, when we started this initiative, less than a dozen homes in Wards 7 and 8 had solar panels on them. By the time we completed the initiative in November of last year, almost we, we did 87 homes uh, throughout Wards uh, 7 and 8. So we, we really, really increased the amount of homes that, that had solar panels almost tenfold. Um, each system, each system that we installed will prevent nearly three tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. In total, these systems prevent more than 260 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is the equivalent of taking 49 cars off the road. 
These impressive savings contribute to the district's larger environmental goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 7.5 metric tons as laid out in the Climate Action Plan and to increase the renewable energy by 50 percent as presented in the district's DC sustainable uh, energy goals. Participating residents, those who participated with us last year, now benefit from no-cost electricity produced by the systems, saving each customer approximately $350 to $500 a year. In addition, these systems help pr prolong or prolong the life of the roofs themselves. Um, we worked with three DC-based contractors, and in addition to that, we provided jobs and training on installation, siting of systems, and post-installation inspections to make sure that the systems were operating at optimal efficiency. Um, also, I'd like to add that um, we partnered with the DC uh, Housing Community Development Agency last year in presenting benefits and procedures uh, to uh, several individuals, several people who came to a, uh, a forum to hear about some of the other programs. We've run about 10 programs at the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, and we were able to partner with DCHD to uh, present many of our programs to residents of the District of Columbia. We find that the, uh, the partnership with DCHD is very, very beneficial, not only to our organization, but to the residents as well, and, and we look forward to partnering with DCHD in the future. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Well, what a glowing report. I'm happy to hear that. I wasn't aware of that program, and I'll, I will have some questions for you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pullman. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Bowser, members of the committee, staff. My name is Robert Pullman. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, or CNHED. The Department of Housing and Community Development is a critically important partner of CNHED. DHCD's oversight of the Housing Production Trust Fund, federal housing programs such as CWG and Home, 9% tax credits and other local funds is central to, to the production and preservation of affordable housing in the district. Programs such as the Home Purchase Assistance Program, Small Business Technical Assistance Program, Facade Improvement Program, Housing Counseling, and the Tenant Purchase Program are all parts of the web of funding and services that make up an effective affordable housing program for the district. The primary factor that has been missing in recent years is adequate funding. Another factor affecting the department's performance has been turnover in senior staff, with DHCD having three directors within three years. We look forward to DHCD's current director, Michael Kelly, bringing needed stability to the department. He has been very accessible and responsive to the concerns of our members. We believe that good senior leadership and adequate staffing of the department are needed if we want to build and maintain the housing our residents need and deserve. We think of it as a continuum of housing, housing that's affordable and appropriate to meet the needs of all residents. In other words, housing for all, which is the tagline of our CNHED campaign for affordable housing. In thinking about the department's performance in FY 2012 and 2013, I want to comment on several of its programs and functions. First of all, su supportive housing. After having advocated for years for a consolidated RFP for supportive housing, I want to commend the department for its leadership in helping to bring together five agencies, I'll use the acronyms, the DHCD, DCHA, DCHFA, DMH, and DHS to sign a memorandum of understanding on jointly funding supportive housing projects. A consolidated RFP is planned for this spring, and affordable housing developers are looking forward to submitting one application for capital, operating subsidy, such as LRSP, and a commitment for supportive services for their planned projects. Tenant purchase. As you know, the tenant opportunity to purchase can result in a building that's being sold being converted to tenant ownership or maintained as continued affordable rental or converted to affordable condos. But without funding, none of this can be achieved, and we continue to lose buildings with affordable market rates. In the past year, at least 105 buildings with more than 1,400 apartments have been put up for sale. Uh, the district and DHCD needs to have a clear policy and strategy for preserving affordable multifamily housing and the resources to back up that policy. We need to know the status of funding available for purchases, have an expedited process for seed money, and have more comprehensive and timely data about buildings for sale and the outcome of those sales. Home ownership. 
Progress has been made in funding the production of affordable for sale homes, especially in Ivy City. However, the process of underwriting those projects has been unnecessarily painful and time consuming. Restrictive covenants, underwriting practices until recently have been an obstacle for nonprofits building affordable housing in Ivy City and financing those projects. Uh, we always say that we do not need DHED to operate as a bank. We have plenty of those already. What our members need is for the department to be appropriately flexible and committed to getting projects done as efficiently as possible, especially those projects that no for-profit developer will take on. Small Business Technical Assistance is a small but effective program for its size, 1.8 million, that assists thousands of small businesses in the district. That's already been talked about. Um, I will move on to the area of administration. There are several areas where DHCD could improve, including issuing timely quarterly and annual reports on the status of the Housing Production Trust Fund, providing maximum operating funds to what's called CHODOs from the HOME program. Nonprofits doing housing development haven't received operating funds from the HOME program for FY 2012, which is a concern. Uh, also, in the area of providing technical assistance to and funding annual checkups for limited equity co-ops. This is something that's needed, uh, and it would be an area of great improvement. Also, loading budgets at the beginning of the year that's been mentioned before in testimony. The current delay is unacceptable, and this committee should inquire as to why this cannot happen more quickly. Despite these challenges, we are optimistic that Director Kelly will continue to build a strong and even more effective DHCD. District residents who need decent, safe housing they can afford are counting on it. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, Pullman. Uh, Ms. Burrs. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser, um, any members of the committee who might be watching. My name is Danielle Burrs, and I am the Policy Officer of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. The 135 member organizations of the coalition fund, finance, produce, preserve, and provide affordable housing and neighborhood-based economic development in the district. Um, some of my testimony, as Sarah Scruggs warned, will be a little repetitive, but I think it's worth it, starting with um, pointing out that DHCD is an essential partner to us and our mission to ensure that residents with low and moderate incomes have housing and economic opportunities in neighborhoods throughout the district. And again, this can't be said enough. We sincerely appreciate Director Kelly's efforts to be available at a truly impressive number <laughs> of the uh, meetings and other events that we've held with practitioners and residents since he started his position. Uh, we also appreciate the rest of the DHCD staff um, who have made themselves available, and we look forward to keeping those lines of communication open. So thank you, all of you. Uh, CNHCD's Executive Director, Bob Pullman, has testified on several issues important to our members. Um, because it has been reported that there was underspending in the Home Purchase Assistance Program, or HPAP, my testimony today will focus on possible reasons for that underspending in fiscal, fiscal year 2012 and suggested improvements. Uh, one that hasn't really been mentioned yet is marketing for HPAP has been limited. Uh, in the past, DHCD has recognized the need for a citywide marketing effort for HPAP, but... Ms. Burris, if you could pull oh. the microphone a little bit closer to you so we can all hear you. Absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, so marketing has been limited, and community-based organizations that work with HPAP would be eager to support a citywide marketing effort to communicate the benefits of HPAP across the district but can't afford to sponsor it on their own. Uh, communication between the CBOs, DHCD, and the Urban League could also be improved. DHCD and the Urban League have not yet published the underwriting standards required by HUD's home regulations. Some potential buyers would be good fits for the program, but present situations that require some guidance. And without those published standards, the CBOs must wait for a reply for each circumstance, which adds additional time to the process. And as you've heard, it's already taking too long. Um, another possible improvement to the program would be increasing the HPAP loan amount. Um, inventory and sales have been low at the affordable end of the market. The overall December 2012 inventory dropped to 1,050 from over 1,600 in that January. According to the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors, listings under 300,000 dropped 43 percent from 654 to 376. In addition, HPAP's buying power is low compared to home prices that continue to rise. Uh, HPAP's buying power is particularly low in some district neighborhoods where ownership is out of reach with a $40,000 down payment and increasing the HPAP loan amount to reflect the current DC real estate market would give HPAP recipients much more meaningful buying power. 
uh, stre streamlining the administrative process to reduce delays. There are several administrative processes that cause delays and cause home buyers to lose out on a home to others or drop out of the program. Um, as others have already hit on this, I will skip over it, but it's included in my written testimony. Um, and I feel I must again reiterate the timing of HPAP funding has been uncertain. Um, every year the Urban League runs out of funds and must wait for DHCD to release more funding. And further, the budget for HPAP has not been loaded in a timely manner. So um, I, as I believe Sarah mentioned, fiscal 12 started with a nearly two month delay in any funding due to administrative issues, um, which leads to certificates expiring and deals falling through. Um, so I have also submitted with my testimony a one page handout kind of outlining those major issues. And I thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Burrs. I, I, this is very helpful. Um, very helpful. Ms. Reed, you're next. And I have, I have yours here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairwoman Bowser, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jenny Reed and I'm the policy director at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. I'm here today to testify on two Department of Housing and Community Development Managed programs, the Housing Production Trust Fund and Inclusionary Zoning. These two programs are crucial affordable housing tools, but a lack of transparency in the trust fund and implementation problems with IZ do raise some concerns. With a severe affordable housing shortage in the district, we look forward to improvements in these two areas. The Housing Production Trust Fund is DC's main source for affordable housing construction, renovation, and tenant purchase. Since 2000, the trust fund has supported the construction or rehabilitation of over 75 affordable housing units across the district. In recent years, funding for the trust fund has dropped significantly as a result of both budget cuts and the real estate market crash. Uh, the trust fund is supported by 15% of DC's deed recordation and deed transfer taxes, which dropped pretty sharply in the downturn. As the trust fund went through its rapid decline in resources, tens of, million dollar, tens of millions of dollars of affordable housing projects were stuck in the development pipeline. It's our understanding that DHCD has largely been able to work through the backlog and fund many of these projects at this point. However, DHCD hasn't produced a trust fund report since the fourth quarter report of fiscal year 2011. So we do not have a way of knowing what the resources in the H in the trust fund really look like for this fiscal year and the next fiscal year. The health in the, of and the resources within the HPTF are a crucial piece of solving the affordable housing issues in DC. The report produced by DHCD helps provide transparency of the trust fund report and allows the council and the public to see what resources are available, what projects continue to be committed or obligated in the pipeline, if the fund is oversubscribed, meaning it has more obligations and resources, and what the picture of available funds in the coming year looks like. The transparency of the trust fund throughout the year is especially important for tenant groups wishing to utilize DHCD's first right purchase program. As the TOPA process is triggered by sales of buildings throughout the years, it's really important for tenants to know if funds are available and how much. There have been instances where tenants groups have not pursued first right purchase program because they didn't think there were funds in the trust fund when there in fact were. Uh, turning now to DC's inclusionary zoning program, uh, it's also a very critical affordable housing tool. It helps to build moderate income housing throughout the district by requiring developers to include affordable housing and new housing developments in exchange for the right to build more densely than allowed by standard zoning rules. IZ was implemented right as the housing market crashed here in DC, and as a result, only 24 IZ units have been produced to date, although 900 are now in the pipeline. According to the Office of Planning, IZ is creating new affordable housing in neighborhoods where affordable housing is hard to come by, places like DuPont Circle, Adams Morgan, the 14th Street Corridor, and Shaw. However, IZ implementation is running into problems that are reducing its efficiency. We are very appreciative that DHCD is committed to addressing these growing pains and that they've been meeting with stakeholders, including DCFPI, to work through these issues. Um, and we also thank you for holding a meeting earlier this week uh, to dis or last week to discuss some of the uh, implementation issues. Some of the current areas that DHCD is working to improve include increased staffing, contracting with community-based organizations to recruit and manage IZ's home ownership units, and working to improve the administrative reg regulations to more efficiently and effectively match applicants to available IZ units. We think that these fixes, along with others, will help the IZ program run more smoothly and ensure its success as an important affordable housing tool. 
We look forward to working with DHCD as it continues to make these improvements and are glad that they are willing to reach out and work with community members. And before I finish up, I just want to echo the um, testimony of a number of people today about Director Kelly and his willingness and ability to meet with community members, work through issues, and hear concerns. Um, it's very, very welcome. And um, we look forward to working with him on IZ, on tenant purchase, on some of these other areas. So thank you for, again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Um, and I, I just wanted to turn to uh, Mr. Trebu again. Um, I, I'm encouraged by, and the reason why I said your report was glowing, because I'm encouraged that this SEU money is being used all across the city. Um, and you've identified ways to, to help people choose solar who might not otherwise be able to choose it. Um, and these are monies that we're all paying um, that support the SEU through our PEPCO bill. Absolutely. All right, Madam Chair, absolutely. You're, you're right there. Not only through our PEPCO bills, but through our Washington gas bills as well. Correct. So all residents and businesses in the District of Columbia, the federal government, the district government as well, everyone pays into the fund and everyone receives services from the fund. So um, what, what, so what are your solar programs currently? How do you support the implementation of solar currently, all of the programs? Last year, we ran the single-family low-income uh, solar program. In addition to that, we run solar programs for hot water on multifamily buildings. Uh, this year, we probably have at least a half dozen, maybe more, multifamily low-income buildings, uh, all identified as low-income buildings, in our pipeline where we would be installing systems to uh, help with solar hot water. Uh, in those buildings. We have not identified the funding yet this year to run another single family program. We would like to take it, we would like to leverage some resources and find more funding. As I mentioned, we looked at Ward 7 and 8 last year and there were only 11 or so homes between those two wards. If you take a look at Ward 5, the, the exact same situation exists. There are only a dozen homes in Ward 5 that have solar panels on them. We would like to attack some of these areas where these technologies have heretofore uh, not existed. But so uh, we do have funding limitations. The Department of the Environment managed a solar program, is that right? They, re, they managed the Renewable Energy, uh, pro, the REAP program, yes, they did. That program is separate and apart from the program that we run. But uh, that you, still as you exists? May recall, the REAP program was refunded uh, in FY13 to the tune of a million dollars with 200,000 of that dedicated to low-income housing. Okay, so the DHCD partnership that you have, um, these are homeowners who have requested DHCD's assistance with their roof. These were some of the individuals who participated in our program. Okay. When we started this program last year in about May, we knew we had to complete the installations roughly by about the end of September, the fiscal year, FY12. And so we we launched a pilot program. We contracted with three different CBEs, Certified Business Enterprises, here in the District of Columbia to um, come up with their um, uh, best practices, as you might say, to identify ways to install these systems on low-income houses. Not all of them participated with DHCD. Some of them participated with um, Habitat for Humanity, homes that had been built by Habitat for Humanity. Others went out into the ecumenical community within Ward 7 and 8 and found individuals who are willing to participate. It's kind of difficult. We, we launched this program with a goal of only installing about 20 solar panels throughout Ward 7 and 8 because we thought we don't have a lot of time and when you come to somebody's home and you know, go knock, knock, hey, we're here, we've got something to install that's free of charge to you, it's got a value of roughly $12,000, but we need to get up on your roof, we need to get into your electrical system. Understandably, there might be some hesitancy amongst yeah, the I'm residents. Sure I've have been there, done that. that. I've been sold a bill of goods before. Thank you very much. So we thought that if we found 20 residents who were willing to participate, that we would have uh, declared, you know, raised our hands and declared victory. But, but in fact, we were able to accomplish and, and install 87 systems 
throughout the summer and early fall of last year. Okay, so there was said no cost to the residents. And right. am I to understand that this takes care of all the electricity for their home? Not all of it. I would estimate about 50 per 40 to 50 percent. About 50 percent. Mm -hmm. So they've cut their electricity bills that's probably in half. In half. Yes. Well, exactly. that's, that's good news. And um, we would, of course, be interested to see um, you develop a single-family program where more people could participate. We would love to do it again this year and in the years moving beyond this. It's, it's simply a matter of, of funding, quite frankly. Um, okay. We have engaged with the mayor uh, with the $100 million surplus, and we're talking about a number of different ways that we can help residents. This helps residents stay in their houses. This is really a, a critical component to um, helping a resident reduce after rent what is probably for them the, the largest bill in their house. Okay. Which is their utility That's helpful. And I just state. happened upon one of your other programs mm -hmm. at the DC Costco. Yes, uh, yes. where I was uh, program. replacing some light bulbs. Uh -huh. um, and these light bulbs are kind of expensive that you have to, well, everybody who has these recess lights, and I have mm -hmm. some. Um, but you had the compact fluorescent light bulbs, which I think go for like $15, where I was able to get a $6 instant rebate. We have two different programs that we're running, not only in Costco, but in about 39 stores throughout the District of Columbia that deal with the lighting that you're talking about exactly. Okay. We have CFLs, which traditionally sell for between $3 and about $6 a piece. We have four or five different types of CFLs that we, were, we worked with six different manufacturers across the globe, quite frankly. And we were able to buy down the cost of those CFLs to as low as 49 cents a piece. So if you go into Safeway, if you go into Fragers on Capitol Hill, if you go into Costco, Bed Bath yes, & Beyond, you'll see those CFLs. What you purchased was LED lighting. And for LED lighting, as you're absolutely correct, the, the bulb itself probably cost about between 15. Some of the flood lighting, LED lighting, costs almost $30 a piece. So there's a rebate that you can just pull out. You probably pulled off the rebate tab right there in the store, and you can mail it in. You can buy up to a dozen bulbs. No, it was and, instant. Oh, instant. Oh, yes. even better. Okay, and um, and and you can get those. You can get those rebates um, instantly. And and as I said, some of those bulbs are expensive. Is normally they'd be thirty dollars, and the rebate on those is ten dollars a piece. So there's a significant savings. It's a big savings, and they tell me that they last forever. And I, I hope that's the they, case. They, they last forever. They save a lot of electricity. And just to tout the expansion of that program, um, later on this month or very early next month. We will be giving rebates on Energy Star refrigerators and dish uh, clothes washers. We'll start right. and, and I, I, I only take the time to, to mm -hmm. mention these things because oftentimes people think that they can't afford um, these items. And, and it is an investment, mm -hmm. frankly, but it's probably um, an, an investment that will pay off. And oh, I can't yeah. emphasize enough that we're paying for the incentives that the DC SCU is offering. Absolutely. Um, so take advantage of those incentives and rebates because um, I look at my electric bill and I see three or some dollars every month that I'm mm -hmm. paying into it and I intend to get my three dollars back. Absolutely. Thank uh, you so, very much for the And I hope that everybody will think about it. I, it just happened that I had all these light bulbs go out all at once. Uh -huh. yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's, uh -huh. uh, you know, that's enough. Enough said. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you all. I think each of you have uh, been in my office uh, to talk about housing uh, needs and uh, the focus that, that we need to continue to pay. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about TOPA, and I want to thank you, Ms. Reed, because I know that you're working on a project mm -hmm. to tell us how we're doing with TOPA. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that some of you have participated in this comprehensive housing strategy task force, and I don't know what this task force came up with about TOPA, but I'm eagerly awaiting um, its recommendations around uh, TOPA as well. Um, but l let me say this, and I think I've had this discussion with many of you. I encourage home ownership all the time, um, but I also am concerned with some experiences that I've had in our ward 
where um, residents some years later after a tenant purchase were in a pretty difficult situation in their building. They were either facing foreclosure or unable to meet the operating demands of their building um, and coming back saying, look, we need help with X, Y, and Z. So let, let me ask you, Ms. Reed, about what do you see as some of the risks um, that tenants need to be aware of um, before engaging in that decision? Well, I think that, as you mentioned before, tenants need to understand exactly what they're getting into, um, exactly what the opportunities are with tenant purchase, and exactly what they need to plan for in the long run. One of the things that our report is suggesting is greater technical assistance after the tenant purchase process has happened. So there's a lot of emphasis on the technical assistance as the tenants go through the very difficult process of acquiring the building. But then you need to maintain the building over a long period of time. And having more technical assistance and, as um, Mr. Pullman mentioned, more regular check-ins and how the co-ops are doing, assessing their strengths, um, maybe trying to catch some co-ops before problems really get uh, too hard to solve. Because we don't want people to end up being in a worse situation. Um, than they were before they were facing the sale of their building. So I think that those are some of the areas we can look at. We have been working with DHCD and talking through some of the recommendations, um, and they've been very open to some of them. Um, another area I think that can be worked on is, in addition to acquisition funding, do, doing more rehabilitation funding and maybe packaging it um, in the same loan. A lot of the buildings, when they go up for purchase, uh, are in really significant disrepair, and there are some immediate fixes that need to be done, but there are some pretty serious rehab needs that need to be factored in, and, and trying to look at the whole package in the beginning instead of, you know, the acquisition is needed, it's immediate, but there's usually rehab that needs to come along with it, and if DHCD is probably not going to be able to do it, then what's the plan for those tenants to be able to get that funding? I think that's an excellent point. Um, all the points Mr. Palman included about this check-in and who's really responsible. And um, I think we also have some data needs here. Where are all of these buildings? Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of data needs around housing, I'm learning. We do. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned earlier they want to know where the affordable dwelling units are. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a question we're going to have if somebody has that list. I want to know where the rent controlled units are. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we'll get to a point where we have all of that information um, in, in one place. And it would seem to me that DHCD uh, would be that place. So we will, um, I know there will be some other testimony about IZ, and I, I will cover uh, those questions then along with hearing from uh, my questions to the department. So I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Court. Tom Wilson, Ronald Clarkson, Andrew Lee Boos, okay, Ms. Court. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bowser. Um, uh, thanks so much for your um, interest in in affordable housing and inclusionary zoning. And I also actually want to recognize um, Director Michael Kelly for his um, responsiveness and accessibility. It's really terrific to work with him. Um, I'm, my name is Cheryl Court. I'm the policy director for the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, and also, I participated in the campaign for mandatory inclusionary zoning starting in 2003, which, which helped to put the inclusionary zoning program in place. Um, before I talk about inclusionary zoning, I just wanted to note that restoring the Housing Production Trust Fund should be our top priority for housing policy. I just wanted to make that statement, and, and we are very excited about the $100 million commitment that the 
mayor has um, has made, and um, we're looking forward to working with with the council and uh, the mayor to, to make sure that uh, money goes as far as it as it can. Um, in terms of uh, DHCD's administration of inclusionary zoning, um, we've. Uh, we remain committed to making this program work, but um, it has had some uh, difficulties with its startup, some serious challenges um, uh, on the administrative side, and um, we think that all of these challenges can be overcome. I just wanted to note, as uh, Jenny Reed did, that this is a, a very um, powerful affordable housing tool that has been practiced throughout hundreds of jurisdictions in the country, including Montgomery County. And just to note some of the details about Montgomery County's program, as we look at a successful path for implementation here, uh, 13,000 IZ units were, have been produced in Montgomery County since 1976, but due to short affordability terms, only 2,600 of those units um, exist today at uh, their income targeting, which is 65% of area median income. Additionally, though, there are 15, over 1,500 IZ units that were purchased by the county's housing authority and rented to even lower income families. This is a provision in the county's law that was prohibited in uh, the district's um, policy. The county's IZ program provides nearly half of the affordable housing production for that county. Um, and, and among the changes that the county has made to its program over the over its long lifetime, um, extending affordability terms to 30 years for home ownership units and 99 years for rental, allowing income targeting to rise from 65% of AMI to 70% AMI for high-rise construction, and the elimination of a troubled buyout provision that allowed fees to be paid in lieu of on-site construction. The administration of uh, DC's IZ program require urgent and specific attention to ensure that the 900 units that are coming online um, can um, experience a, a, a smooth um, implementation for all the parties involved. Um, there's three major administrative challenges, severe understaffing, the FHA rules, and overly rigid administrative regulations. Um, we, uh, DHCD has indicated they've hired another staff person. Um, the staffing not only administers and is launching this, this IZ program, but also is keeping track of the 1 to 2,000 ADUs, uh, which are affordable dwelling units that have been generated through plan unit developments and um, public land dispositions. And I note that under PUDs, these are actually um, in lieu of IZ um, since IZ was put into place. And uh, I acknowledge that the earlier um, uh, ADUs generated before IZ was a, a, a well-formulated policy um, did not have the benefit of the, um, the structure in terms of covenants and, um, and, and how they approached condo fees that the earlier ADUs um, have experienced. And that is a serious problem that, that we hope um, that looks like uh, the director and um, and the council are addressing. Um, in terms of staffing, um, we need to see a couple more staff positions here for both ADUs and, and IZ, and we suggest um, contracting with a nonprofit experienced in managing home ownership, per, the home ownership purchase process and, and stewarding permanently affordable homes. This should be a, um, this is a, really we think that this piece is done probably better by a nonprofit experienced in permanent um, ha, um, home ownership affordable, affordable Home ownership than by um, by the city, and also we need to sustain housing counseling assistance to IZ applicants. We understand that the FHA problems are being resolved, and um, we ask that DHCD go back to mortgage lenders um, like Bank of America, which has a list of approved IZ programs, and make sure that we get on that list. And um, thirdly, rigid regulations um, are in the works for being um, revised. It is, we urge that this process be expedited. Um, we suggest that. Um, suspending the overly prescriptive lottery requirements until a lottery is needed to manage a, a, a larger pool of qualified applicants be, um, uh, be um, instituted. Um, there are, there are longer term policy um, considerations, but I just wanted to note that um, the city is in the midst of a building boom as inclusionary zoning has been implemented. And, um, and so I think that this demonstrates that you would be hard pressed to claim that, um, that IZ has in any way been a drag on um, housing production. So that's, uh, I'll just leave it there, and I, I appreciate your attention to this issue. It's a very important program that we want to, to right the ship and um, make sure it's delivering all the benefits that it has for many other communities in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Court. 
Mr. Wilson? Yes, ma'am. Madam Chairman, my name is Tom Wilson. Uh, I live in Jim Graham's ward at 1919 Calvert Street. I've lived there since 1981. Uh, I'm the president of the 1919 Calvert Street Tenants Association. This building is a license as a single room occupancy accommodation, our rooming house. There are 14 units, each with basic kitchen facilities, and we share four bathrooms, one on each floor. When I first moved here in 1981, or 1971, I should say, there were numerous rooming houses in this area, in the Adams Morgan area, but gentrification since 1981 has left this property as one of the few remaining SROs providing affordable housing in the area. Uh, last February, uh, the owner put the building on the market and a Maryland uh, developer signed a contract for $925,000 to buy the property. Uh, naturally, the tenants were uh, concerned about losing their affordable housing to development. With the help of many Ruiz of the Latino Economic Development Corporation and John Mangin of the uh, uh, Harrison Institute for Housing and Community Development, we have been able to exercise our rights of first uh, refusal under the tenant's option to purchase Act Artopa. Uh, as a result, uh, time has become of the essence. We have until May 12th to match the development developer's offer. We have applied to the Department of Housing and Community Development for a $1.4 million, that is to say $1,400,000 low-cost loan to purchase and rehab the building. In addition, we have obtained $36,000 in earnest money deposits and $15,000 for pre-development costs from First City Enterprises Bank on U Street. And we are currently working with the Institute for Community Economics for a bridge loan to get us past uh, the May uh, 12th deadline and into the DCHD financing. Madam Chairman, I've come to ask the committee to provide the financing to the Coward Street Tenants Association to buy the building to preserve affordable housing in Adams Morgan and to help us become first-time homeowners. Uh, time has become of the essence. Um, we. Uh, would also like you to prod the uh, DCHD in their process, in their own processes, to move our application along. Uh, the sooner we can get out of our bridge loan, we can knock down the uh, uh, cost of the monies that the uh, ICE requires. As far as I know, uh, the conversion of an SRO to an equity uh, cooperative is nearly unique, unique in the United States. There's three or four others. Uh, around the country, up in Massachusetts and Illinois and some, some other places. But Madam Chairman, what we are asking in the final analysis is that Mayor Gray's $1 million, $100 million commitment to affordable housing begin with 1919 Calvert Street. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, happy to hear about the progress you're making. And so we'll see what uh, we can learn about the, the DHCD's timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Clarkson? Yes. And good morning, Madam Chairman. My name is Ronald Clarkson, and I am Program Director at Housing Counseling Services. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the staff, Board of Directors, and clients of Housing Counseling Services, also known as HCS. HCS is a nonprofit, community based organization that has provided housing counseling, training, advocacy, technical assistance, and provided um, technical assistance to low and moderate income district residents for over 40 years. Our goal is to build sustainable communities through informed tenants, home buyers, and homeowners. HCS works to increase homeownership opportunities, support enduring homeownership, prevent homelessness, and assist tenants to remain in affordable homes by providing the skills families need to improve themselves and their communities. This testimony is offered to document and support the needs of our community and to commend the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development for its commitment to the needs of low and moderate income families. Our funding through DHCD has enabled us to provide outreach, education, technical assistance, and counseling to over 40,000 D.C. residents during the previous fiscal year. HCS provides training and counseling for fair housing, home buyer education, post occupancy, locate housing, tenants' rights, budgeting, and credit issues. 
HCS takes applications for the city's home purchase assistance program, the single family residential rehabilitation program, Let's Save Washington program, and provides income verification for affordable housing programs. We provide technical assistance and crisis counseling for residents of low-income cooperatives and condominiums as they work to successfully manage their homes and their properties. HCS works with homeowners who are faced with losing their homes through foreclosure. We also work through our tenant anti-displacement program and the emergency rental assistance program, which um, provides education and assistance to those who are at risk of becoming homeless or losing their housing by providing counseling, training, education, and financial assistance to those district residents who are the most vulnerable and the most in need of housing security. HCS administers the Metropolitan Housing Access Program, the single point of entry program for the District of Columbia, providing persons living with HIV or AIDS access to the HOPWA housing programs as well as comprehensive housing services. Through its administration of the, of the MAP program, HCS utilizes a full complement of individual counseling, training, and advocacy to assist individuals in responding to their specific housing challenges so they can accomplish their housing goals. The economics of housing presents significant challenges to low-income families living in this city. The National Low-Income Housing Coalition estimates that in D.C., 32 percent of households that occupy rental housing are below 30 percent of the area median income, or AMI. Also, that 65% of families with incomes at or below 30% of AMI are severely rent burdened. While recent media attention to the number of homeless individuals and children residing in the district's shelter system should make us all pause and wonder about potential remedies, it should not hinder efforts to increase affordable housing opportunities and provide the resources necessary to help the city's needy to overcome the barriers to affordable housing. HCS looks forward to working with DHCD on new and continued efforts to increase the availability and accessibility to affordable housing. Our partnership with DHCD has allowed us to address these concerns. During the previous fiscal year, the outcomes of these services included 48 new district homeowners, over 900 families prepared for home ownership, 767 families avoiding eviction or resolving homelessness, 311 families avoiding foreclosure or resolving foreclosure issues, educating over 9,800 tenants who were at risk of losing their housing, and supporting the formation of 19 tenant associations, working with over 1,300 units of affordable co-ops, condos, and rental housing to develop management skills and preserve their homes. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. I'm going to have mm -hmm. some questions for you. Okay. Um, Mr. Booz? Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, uh, Chairperson Bowser. My name is Lee, Andrew Lee Booz. I'm the owner of the ALB LLC Home Improvement and uh, Landscaping Contractors. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding the Department of Housing and Community Development and the importance of funding programs like the Small Business Technical Assistance Program that support small businesses development in the district. My company is a veteran-owned business that provides residential, renovation, remodeling, and landscaping services. I'm a native Washingtonian and a son of a contractor who taught me to trade as a youngster and who groomed me and strengthened my skills to the point where I mastered them as a trade. I also served in the Army in a combat engineering company in Vietnam where I acquired significant technical and logistical skills. Uh, for 30 years since, I have worked on various home improvement projects and have enhanced my skills even further. I did this mostly on the weekends and holidays while working full time uh, for the Department of Defense as a supply technician and as a con uh, contracting officer's representative. As a small business owner, I know the very well of the uh, I know very well the challenges and barriers that are in place that to hinder the chances of opportunities and acquire financing, especially in, in the uh, startup phase. When I incorporated uh, my business in uh, 2005, I was faced with many obstacles that prevented me from getting the financial support that I so badly needed. For since not having perfect credit or not having high uh, end collateral, I approached many traditional lenders uh, with no success. Uh, all financial doors were closed. Then I turned to LEDC, a community-based economic development organization 
that evaluates the complete individual and the complete business concept. I was approved for a $7,000 Merco loan, and it was like magic. I was able to purchase construction and computer equipment, pay for a storage unit, up me my, uh, update my marketing skills, and hire additional five people to keep the business moving forward and expand my business. I attended a uh, job fair last year uh, sponsored by Congressman Norton. And after 10 minutes of setting up my table, there were approximately 150 people standing in line to fill out applications to work for my company. I wanted to hire them all, but I could not. But looking forward and hiring many more in the future. I want to thank LEDC and thank you, Chairperson Bowser, for the opportunity to share my personal story in hopes that you will continue to support the Small Business Technical Assistance Program and community-based organizations like LEDC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Booth, and uh, we appreciate your testimony, and uh, I'm glad your business is doing um, well also. Um, so uh, we have some testimony on IZ and Ms. Court. We have your recommendations, and we appreciate very much um, your participating in all of these issues. And we'll discuss some of this with the, the um with the director. As you noted, he has indicated his plans to hire additional staff and provide housing counseling uh, assistance by way of a contract. So we'll see what impact um, he thinks that will have. Um, you mentioned dismantling the lottery process for IZ units. Uh, I said suspend. Um, I'm suggesting that we might need to, you know, basically had a hard time putting together a good pool of qualified applicants, and so a lottery is used for when you have a whole lot of, you have a big pool and you need to come up with a fair way to to allocate. You know, I'm just interested in in creating an efficient matching uh, between interested applicants interested in qualified applicants and the units and with, you know, with a fair process, uh, however it is done. It just seems that the current regulations are very unwieldy and, and are part of the problem in terms of creating that, uh, that streamlining that match between um, applicants and, and appropriate union, units. Okay. So what do you think needs to be ha needs to happen with the question about um, condo fees? So a person gets into an IZ unit and the condo fees become um, unaffordable for them? Well, first of all, um, the the earlier problems of some of the earlier ADUs um, uh, did not, uh, I think, was, did not have the benefit of the IZ program, which developed um, a more systematic approach, and so IZ um, sets a an overall cost for the the unit being sold that is inclusive of the condo fees, and um, I believe actually uh, comes up with um, a realistic condo fee um, that might actually I, I you need to check with um, with uh, DC Office of Planning on this that might actually be higher than what might be. Um, being offered, basically. There's obviously a very strong incentive to lowball condo fees, and this is actually a consumer protection problem for any purchaser, mm -hmm. what, be it market rate or affordable. And, and in my testimony, I actually suggested um, there's sort of two basic things that can be done to address um, condo fees, although I, I don't see it as um, – IZ is sort of headed off a lot of that, but um, I think that it could become a problem over time. And so there's two um, main things is to require a par value approach to assessing condo fees. Right now, DHCD encourages a par value approach. And what that means is rather than um, assessing the condo fee on the basis of square footage, you assess it on the basis of the value of the property. The, and so it would be the... the um, the affordable price versus uh, a market rate price. This is a perfectly legal and common, it, it is practiced um, as a way to assess condo fees and that um, would be a way to safeguard um, so that as condo fees rise, I mean costs rise and so you can't, you don't want to freeze the, um, freeze that uh, cost but it would uh, start with a lower basis and go up um, and have a, a, lar a smaller rise that would be more just keeping up with inflation basically. Secondly, um, there needs to be sort of truth in, in condo fee setting from the outset. That's actually not so much of an IZ problem but um, it's a general problem among any 
uh, purchaser of a condo and, and could affect I ADUs. Um, and uh, the first of all, Office of Planning has talked about just being able to collect better data in order to know what condo fees are. Once they settle out, they tend to be lower when they start. And um, and then the condo board comes in and realizes that the, the the the, the, that the, they need more. They need to assess a higher fee, basically, to properly maintain the building. So, heading up that off, either through um, on the IZ ADU side through oversight, but then also um, going back and looking at how um, condo fees are very verified. I mean, all this is a consumer protection problem. Um, my understanding is that condo fees are verified by a third party that the developer hires. Uh, a, a way to switch that around is basically um, have the city um, receive the fee and then hire a, a third-party verifier so that the verifier is working for the city, not the developer who has every interest in coming up with a, a low figure, basically. Okay, so we, we will um, take your comments into consideration about that. We know that's been raised as a, a big issue to um, contend with. And Mr. Clarkson, I want to thank you for your testimony. We certainly are aware with the good works of your organization, and we appreciate your recommendations um, as, as well. And, and Mr. Wilson, again, will address your questions with the department. Thank you very much, you very much for your testimony. Welcome back, sir. Vietnam <laughs> veteran? Yes, sir. Thank you. So am I. Hey, welcome back. Welcome home. James Peters. Juliana Pena. Valerie Williams. Valerie Williams. Roxana Bilal. Roxana Bilal. <laughs> Eve Loader or Lauder, Eve Lauder. Lachelle Rivers. Oh, is that, are you Eve? Eve? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Peters, we'll start with you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Bowser. Good morning, sir. Uh, again, my name is James Peters. I own a small apartment building in Ward 4. It is in the middle of a row of other buildings that probably were all built around the same time. Sometime in December 2011, my building was flagged as having, possibly having lead in the property. Uh, this issue was all new to me, the procedures, the process was all new to me, and I was directed to Lead Safe DC. Um, and my first contact was with um, Constance Irvin in Lead Safe Washington DC. Um, and I must say that um, in dealing with Constance Irving, I was put the rest that the city would work with me to rid my property of lead. Uh, patience, knowledgeable, available, and one thing that I would say that's missing from a number of employees, being able to work off the clock. So we moved forward to get my building rid of lead. We had worked with uh, Constance. She had assembled a, a team that qualified my property, qualified me as the owner, qualified the tenants, and one process that we needed to go through, which was have the tenants meet with a uh, housing counselor to move the process forward. Everything was in place, we were ready to go, but we ran into a stumbling block, and the stumbling block was one tenant did not want to cooperate. And that one tenant that did not want to cooperate held the pro progress up to the point that I was almost out of the program because of the time delay. And I received a letter from Ms. Irving that said I needed to get the tenant on board. And I went through uh, the ombudsman, I went through uh, tenant advocate's office, I went through several council members. On your staff, Judy Go worked with me extensively to try to resolve this problem. I gotta give kudos to her because she worked hard to try to get this resolved. 
but we couldn't get the tenant to budge until I hired a lawyer to move the process forward. Now, hiring a lawyer is an expense that I didn't even calculate into this whole process, but we did get the process moved forward. And I'd just like to say that somewhere in, the, in this whole issue of lead and, and curing a property that obviously, according to what I've been told, had an issue that was safety, there needs to be some way that it can move forward even though someone is holding it up, not the owner, not the district, but a tenant. After the, my building was cleared of lead and I got a clearance, the uh, Lead Safe Program offers a clearance training seminar after the property has been cleared and I, I suspect that it's mandatory that not only do tenants make these sessions, that the owner also makes the sessions. Again, today it's a good program. I went there, great information, I learned a lot, but no tenant showed up. Uh, again, responsibility from a tenant standpoint as we move to clear this city of lead is something that somebody needs to put on the table. Additionally, as I said before, my building is connected to a number of other properties, probably all built at the same time. I got flagged for lead. I know two of the buildings in my line of properties have Section 8 tenants in the property. And I do know they also have, as I now understand, the possibility of having lead. So I think the program might be a little underutilized. Maybe it should be expanded to, let's say, all properties built before a certain date in the District of Columbia possibly have lead and they need to be examined to make sure. And that way we could clear up all properties, not just one property in a line of buildings. Thank you very much. That's helpful to know. Thank you, Mr. Peters. And I'll have some um, questions for you. Ms. Pena? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Juliana Pena, and I was able to buy my first home in 1458 Columbia Road Northwest on December 28, 2012. This user accomplishment would not have been possible if it had not been for the support and education that I received at the Latino Development Center and the financial aid I received from the HVAP program. As a young adult, I found myself struggling to pay off student loans and afford housing while attempting to find work. Beginning to find full-time job at the peak of the recession was very challenging, and as a result, I also incurred additional debt. While I was eventually able to find stable jobs, I was only being able to pay off my debt, leaving very little room for savings. Even though I was very conscious about the importance of savings, it would have been impossible for me to come up with a 20% down payment required to obtain the loan for the condo I bought. I was, it was only thanks to the HVAP program that I was able to fill the monetary gap and qualify for the loan. The stability that home ownership brings you is unparalleled. By being a homeowner, you not only begin to invest in your own future, but you also have a larger incentive to be involved in the community and care even more about the neighborhood and the city you live in. If we take away the tools that can help lower income individuals become homeowners, we're taking away the opportunity for people like me to become more financially secure and responsible. With the skyrocketing rent and real estate prices in the city, people like me have fewer and fewer housing options each year. HPAP help us, helps us realize our dreams and gives us a fairer chance when we're competing with higher income individuals in such a ruthless real estate market. If anything, I would, add, I would ask the committee to better fund the program so that it can have the sufficient staff to manage the workload and process, lo process loans fast and efficiently. Sufficient staff that has the proper training and tools would lead to timely settlements and as a result, less discouraged sellers dealing with a buyer using the HVAP program. Organizations like LEDC have to spread themselves thin trying to help people like me in the process. Trust me, I am very perseverant and patient, and, but when you're not used to them navigating the real estate market, and on top of everything, you have to make sure you meet the HVAP requirements. Even the most patient and motivated person can get frustrated and make mistakes. The process is not easy, and I'm not saying it should be, but some people do need more support than others, and I would not be surprised if many of them have been getting discouraged because they could not see the light at the end of the tunnel. Continuing funding of the program, coupled with strong support of organizations like LEDC, will allow more people to navigate the system and reap all the long-term economic benefits that come with homeownership. Thank you for hearing my story today. Thank you, Ms. Pena. Uh, are you Ms. Williams? I am. 
Ms. Mrs. Bilal. Roxanne okay, Mrs. Bilal. Bilal, please yeah. continue. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Bowser. Uh, hello to the chamber. My name is Roxana Bilal. I am the primary caregiver for my mother, Mrs. Edwin Williamson. She is a Ward 4 resident. Her home is located 300 Longfellow Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 211. My grandmother, Dinah Brewington, purchased this property in 1961 or 62, and my seven, seven siblings and I grew up in this house. This is our family home. Uh, my mother, Mrs. Williamson, is 84 years old. Between 1998 and 2005, she lost three of her children, three of my siblings, my two brothers, Albert and Joe, and my only sister, Reverend Lois Wooden. My oldest brother is a disabled veteran, he resides also with my mother. After many challenges uh, from such heavy losses, our mother needed a great deal more care, as did her home. My husband and I took on the challenge and blessing of caring for my mother, and I reached out to Housing Counseling Services, ACS, for help to restore mom's home and render it useful for her. She is disabled and walks with a walker and uses a wheelchair frequently. My mother is the pillar of her community. She knows most of her neighbors. Many come visit her at my home in Petworth while she is waiting, awaiting the time when she can return to her home. What is beautiful to note is that she is expecting and expected to return home to her house upon completion of this re restoration. This program is allowing her assistance through a grant to replace her roof, with handicap accessibility, um, a grant to provide for a wheelchair lift um, for the outside of the house to take a wheelchair from the first floor to the street level, um, and um, to have a widened doorway for ex access and a ramp and many supports within the house to include a chair lift to take her from the first to the second floor to her bedroom. Uh, the program has also allowed for many necessary code-related corrections and upgrades that we could never have made without the funding and support of the Single Family Rehabilitation Program uh, afforded us through the, the Department of Housing and Counseling Development. As a resident, daughter, and senior caregiver, I applaud and appreciate and thank this council and indeed all of the organizations and agencies, many represented here today, who provide so many necessary um, and outstanding services and programs for the senior residents of this city. And I also have a special um, thank you for um, Housing Counseling Services who pointed us to uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'd like to thank personally Mr. Michael Kelly and Mr. Fred Hill and their staff for the high level of professionalism and diligence with which they have worked uh, and to handle our mother's application and the process with this project. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Bilal. Uh, Ms. Loder? Um, good afternoon, Madam Chairman Browser and staff. My name is Eve Lauder, and I'm here to attest to the D.C. government's success in administering the federal government's Home Saver Program enacted by the Obama administration. As background, I've lived and worked in the District of Columbia since 1982 and owned my home since 1990. My home ownership has enabled me to raise family, educate my children through the D.C. public school system, and grow in a local as well as international environment. The stability and location of my home has always enhanced my ability to perform work in the district due to the proximity to jobs and access to the city. My home has always been and continues to be my most important investment. However, in late 2011, my employment was severed in a downsizing, and I experienced a job loss at a time of deep recession. It was a lapse of a few months that I connected with various DC agencies who advised me that I was eligible for federal assistance with my mortgage through a DC-administered Home Saver program. Quickly, one D.C. government contact led to another until I connected and qualified for the program. I was assigned a counselor who efficiently handled my situation and who was always available if I had questions. 
My counselor was knowledgeable about the ins and outs of my situation as well as current banking information. My meetings were always on time and every step of the way was orderly. This included closings and timely payments to my mortgage company. I had trust with the people who were handling my mortgage. At present, I have completed the program. I can now look back on my inclusion in this program as a most important contribution to keeping my home. While I do not know the extent of the entire machinery behind the work of others in the D.C. government who administer this program, I can attest to the efficiency and orderly workings of the program. In reflection, I now have a growing understanding of the program and the involvement of the many D.C. agencies needed to administer this federal mandate to help homeowners. It appears to me that the D.C. government made the program work seamlessly. My experience was one of success in every encounter and general goodwill. In conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity to say that this program speaks to the issue of stability and sustainability. I believe it is a new day in thinking of how to solve problems in our country and that it is very important to allow people to stabilize and sustain their lives in times of crisis. One incident of extreme weather, terrorist attack, or protracted economic trauma should not mean the wiping out of years, if not a lifetime of work. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you for coming down to testify, and I appreciate all of you putting uh, very good experiences with the government um, on the record. Um, I think each of you have spoken to uh, how uh, our employees come uh, to work and try to do the right thing by our residents, and we don't always hear those good stories, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day um, to, to share those stories um, with us. Um, now, Mr. Peters, I think you raised a lot of good questions about the lead safe program that I would like to investigate um, with you. So you have delivered a packet of information. Um, Judy, of course, had kept me appraised of what was going on. I'm glad she was helpful. Um, and hopefully everything is resolved at your building. Um, your concern is generally what are we doing about the rest of the buildings? Right. Okay. And, and some will be surprised to know that we have quite a lot of lead paint in our city still. Um, and we have quite a lot in our ward. Um, some of the age of the buildings, um, many of them are now being refurbished. So we're seeing some people probably in, in your neighborhood, Ms. Bilal, where there was a lot of lead paint. Now as those um, buildings are being refurbished, the, the lead paint is being removed. But lead paint is very serious. Um, I'm glad that we have uh, this program in place. Now this is administered by DHCD? The lead paint program? Okay. Um, so what, what did that entitle you to as a property owner? Uh, first of all, I had direction, which I didn't have in the beginning. Okay. Um, secondly, um, once the building was qualified, sometimes a landlord's communication to a tenant versus an outsider's communication to a tenant works a lot better. Okay. So they took the process away from me once I was qualified, my property was qualified, and they dealt with all the tenants, went through the whole process so that the tenants would understand it wasn't like tenants have to be relocated. Okay. If I, as a landlord, say I'm going to relocate you, they think that I'm putting them out. Okay. Through the program, it was made clear to them that not only um, would they be relocated, but they could come back and they would be compensated for their time being relocated. Uh, additionally, the program, um, and I'm sure someone here from the program can was carry the, Was that at the government's expense? Did the government pick up that relocation? The relocation fee for the tenants, yes, mm -hmm. they did. Okay. okay. There's a grant program that's involved in Lead Safe Washington, D.C. And under that, land, that grant program, I do believe that the tenants can get a certain amount of money. Um, everything involved with lead, the grant will take care of. Okay. But other housing code violations, the owner has to take care of. Okay. So I, as the owner, had to bring my building, even violations I didn't know existed, up to five. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, but you were able, the, the tenant was notified by the government that the, the unit would be abated. Right. Um, and they were assisted with relocation. How long does a, a abatement for lead take generally? And I, I can't put a, a time frame on it because my building got stuck because the tenant, the tenant that initially called in inspectors that started this process was the same tenant who did not want to cooperate. Did all the units have to be... Um, uh, the whole the, building had to be emptied. Emptied before you, any unit could start. Yes. You, okay. You, you, 
you lose control of your property because, which is which is a good thing, because the contractor locks the building down with their locks, so no one can come in while they're creating this dust. Okay. Because it's a health issue, so the building was locked down. They had the keys, so I couldn't come through, nor could the tenants come through. But there is a um, housing piece to this that the tenants must go through to not only um, get understanding of what happens for them, but also to let them know that um, they have to meet certain obligations also. Okay. And, you know, as I said before, sometimes a landlord and tenant, the relationship may not be the kind where you can make them feel comfortable with that. Okay. Well, that's uh, all helpful information, and so I, I'll have some questions for the government about um, how or how we're being proactive in, in getting into other buildings um, to see what, what that plan is, because that's very important. Uh, the, and I think most people know the effects of lead paint on children, um, and we want to do all that we can to, to abate that. So thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Pena, thank you for um, your testimony as well about the, uh, the HPAC program and your recommendations about how it can be um, improved. So let me just ask you this question. We heard like, some of the slowdown in HPAP purchases having to do with um, the cost of housing in the district. So how were you able to um, manage your house search um, in those confines? Um, I found two main roadblocks uh, with the program. Uh, what the first one was securing lending, find, finding a lender that was willing to work with HPAP. Um, I called all of the major banks and most of them do not um, do the loan with HVAP. The ones that do, you will call and they will kind of know and send you somewhere and somewhere within their system you'll find like this one person that will know about the program. So in general it's just difficult to find that person and then you call them, they will not call you back too eagerly. It's just, they just, they're, through a major bank it's really hard to get lending. I ended up getting it through um, a broker, not through a major bank, because it, it just, it wasn't easy. And then the second problem was, in my uh, budget, co-ops uh, were a good option. Uh, but with HVAP and co-ops, it's like impossible. I couldn't find one bank to do a loan uh, for a co-op using HVAP. Um, so that was another issue. And then the second problem is when you're, I think the market is getting a lot more active. It's been getting a lot more active in the past one or two years and the competition is getting harder. So what happens is that if you put an offer and someone has a non-HPAP offer as opposed to a, a, an HPAP offer, they're very more likely to choose the one that's not HPAP because they know HPAP will take longer, it's more paperwork for them, mm -hmm. and there's more red tape, mm -hmm. uh, the closing will likely be delayed. My, my own closing was delayed by two weeks. I almost lost it, but thankfully the seller held on, but my contract, I was not under contract by the time I closed. Um, so they could have technically just sold it to anyone else. Um, so those are the things that really make it hard, I think, for people to f go through the loan process and okay. actually purchase. Now, which neighborhood did you choose? Columbia Heights. Well, congratulations, congratulations. Ms. Bilal, so I'm glad to see that this process has worked for your mom. Yes. How did you find out about the single family home program? Well, through Housing Counseling Services. Okay. And um, I called around when I realized that it was time to take care of my mom um, because my oldest brother was ill, uh, the veteran, and uh, the, his psychologist let me know, your mother needs your help. Your mother needs some care. And she had to say it three times. I said, oh, you mean she needs help now? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I was given a list uh, to call some um, agencies that may have services that would benefit her and I had to do that take the time to call and housing council services was really um, wonderful okay. they were very uh, helpful and um, patient and informative with regard to getting mother qualified for for getting the help she needed at the house well I, I'm pleased to hear that because part of um, I think we're going to face as a city certainly we're facing in our ward is how we can help our seniors oh, age yeah. um, in their homes uh, yes. as you say this is your family home it's been in your family over 50 years um, and I'm sure your mother wants to stay there just as long mm -hmm. as she possibly can um, and uh, what I found about some of these programs and the reason I asked you how you found out about it is people don't know that they're out there uh, we had another 
another resident that called us on something um, totally unrelated. And we learned that, you know, there was a disabled resident in the house that was being lifted up the stairs every day. And we have programs in the district that can assist them. And they were similarly uh, assisted. So I, I'm very pleased that um, you, are, you, you came to, to put that um, on the table. Because when we talk about housing production, oftentimes we'll hear about the production of senior housing. And we won't be able to build enough senior housing for the baby boomers that are becoming seniors. So part of our strategy has to be how we maintain the housing that we have and allow people to, to age in their own homes. So thank you for that. I mean, Ms. Lauder, you have testified about a program that's managed by the D.C. Housing Finance Agency, who we'll, we'll hear from later. It's a hugely successful program that they're administering. They figured out a way to do it differently than many states are doing it, but it's actually putting money um, in the, the pockets of people to save their homes um, at a difficult time for a, a discrete period of time. Um, and we have seen, we have heard uh, wonderful stories about how it's working um, for residents to allow them to, to get reemployed so that they can continue to maintain um, their mortgage. And I'm always happy when you tell me the process was efficient um, and it worked well and that all the employees were um, very professional in dealing with you. So I, I appreciate you putting that on the record as well. Thank you. Those are my questions. Is Lachelle Rivers here? Lachelle Rivers? Um, are there any members of the public who I missed who wish to testify? Oh, I see. Um, Paul, this is going to be the final panel. Paul Holland, Arsile Deming, Dominga Torricios, is that right? Will Merrifield. So I'm just going to do a time check. So we will um, probably begin with the director of DHCD at 2 o'clock, um, which means we'll start taking witnesses for um, the Housing Finance Agency by 3 o'clock, just to give uh, the public witnesses and the government witnesses coming later uh, a heads up. Okay, so let's see. Paul Holland, Mr. Holland. You have the mic. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Ms. Bowser, we're happy to be here. I'm a Washingtonian. I was born here in 1938. I grew up here, and I can't get out of here. I'm not trying to either. It's a beautiful city, and it's, over these years, it's been a marvel to, to grow with the city, to see the city uh, become one of the most beautiful cities in the world when you speak of Washington, D.C. Uh, my wife, uh, we are uh, now uh, 56 years of marriage, all here in Washington, D.C. And this year, uh, uh, this month, I'm 75 years old, all here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, we've been in our home for 32 years. And so uh, you have, uh, the government, have uh, recognized us as in need of help. And we want to express our appreciation and uh, certainly uh, Mr. Hill and Mr. Hodge and his staff uh, have been working very diligently and very well. Uh, we have our roof on, and they're now inside of the house. Uh, they says, come on, you got to get out so we can get in here. And we got out, they got in, and they're doing very well. They're moving right along uh, in refurbishing our house from top to bottom. Uh, actually, in the Bible, you are referred to the government as uh, God's minister to the people. And uh, we're living to see the fulfillment of that and take care of his planet that he made for us. Uh, some ruining it, but you're trying to help uh, repair it and uh, keep it in good order and condition for people to live on it. And so uh, we just wanted to say we thank you very much for all of the hard work uh, that they are indeed doing. And uh, we just can't wait to get back in to see and enjoy the results. Mrs. Holland. Just to add that our... It's a delight to have work that is being done with senior citizens. 
we are advanced, I like to say, but are also we are on a fixed income, and that fixed income is low. And to have an organization that will assist persons and help them is greatly appreciated. Mr. Hill and the contractors that are working with us have been a tremendous help, and we'd like to thank you and them. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Thank you. Um, Ms. Deming, is Ms. Deming here? Ms. Deming? Yes, good, morning. good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here. Um, um, my name is Araceli Deming, and I'm on behalf of uh, Mr. Eddie Miguez. He's the vice president of I IS Enterprises, a uh, Washingtonian contractor that works with uh, DHCD on grants for, uh, on single family rehabilitation programs. So let me read my the, the statement that he has sent. Okay, I, IS Enterprises provides home improvement, lead-based paint, paint remediation, and roof repair services to the district residents that you qualify to receive DHED grants or loans. We have been participating with DHED single-family program, programs as a contractor for more than 10 years. During recent years, more district residents have been applying for DHED's programs. Funding has been steadily sustained. Thanks to DHED's single family programs, in a time of economic downturn, the citizens of the district have been able to stay in their homes, making their homes a safer place to live and keep their roofs from collapsing during the hard winters that the region has faced. Not only the homeowners have been benefited by these programs, the overall economic has been helped as a result. District residents have been employed to work on these projects. Contractors working on such projects have to hire more workers to keep the, with the demand. IS Enterprises is an example. We, as an example, we have hired two DC residents as a full-time employees last year and three the year before. We also purchased materials locally, partnered with local contractors, and as you can see, these programs help the local economy. I will also add that there is one small issue that we have been seeing that is hindering the deliverance of more projects to our community. The fact that the invoice payment has been slow at times, it has taken, it usually takes about 30 days to get payments from when we submit an invoice. For some instances, we have been waiting for about 120 days to get a payment from a complete services. As you can imagine, we use our, our at-hand capital to obtain materials, permits, and pay our workers. And it is very hard for us to, be, to bid on new opportunities when our cash flow is depleted and not being renewed. I would really appreciate if you could see or perhaps open up a forum to talk about invoice payment and processes. Perhaps allocate some funds to obtain uh, materials at a time that the contract is awarded that will alleviate us to have more cash flow. The lives that DHED programs touches are in fact many. Homeowners, workers, contractors, senior citizens as you can see, in city employees. Local suppliers, small subcontractors, utility companies, etc. And we appreciate all that they do for the city. On behalf of Mr. Eddie Miguez, I give you thanks. Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Terricios? Buenas tardes. Mi Buenas nombre tardes. es Dominga Cruz Turcio. Yo vivo en una cooperativa del 1425. Quiero. Good afternoon. My name is Dominga Cruz Torcios, and I live at a cooperative. It's located at 1425 T Street Northwest. Hace 20 años, nosotros compramos el, el edificio de la cooperativa con asistencia de, de HCD. Um, 20 years ago, we actually purchased the co-op with assistance from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Es, ese programa es para mantener la vivienda de bajo costo en el hace 14 gracias a, a la ciudad de concejales 
de la asistencia como WISH y LEIAN, hemos podido mantenerlos. And thanks to um, DHCD and to the City Council, who we worked with at the time and currently, and groups like WISH, who helped us um, back then to purchase, and now LEDC, um, we've been able to maintain our affordable housing for 20 years. Nosotros empezamos, como somos de bajo recurso, los costó, gracias a ustedes, les digo otra vez, por verlos ayudado y varias personas y por ver creído a las personas que estaban, por ejemplo, Mr. Marion Berry, David Clark, no sé si ustedes lo conocieron, o los han oído mencionar, que sí creyeron en mí y me miraban muy positiva, que era una persona de poderlo lograr. Um, and really because, you know, we were low-income people and this was a very difficult process to do and um, very, you know, difficult achievement. But really because of the support that we had and people who believed in us, um, like Mary and Barry and David Clout. I don't know if you know them. <laughs> yes, I, I know them. <laughs> um, but they really believed in us and helped us through this process. And so I just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So I want to thank you all for um, coming down and again um, just putting a face to the programs and what they really mean in people's lives I think um, is really helpful for us, especially as we can um, consider a new uh, budget. Uh, so I don't have any further questions, but I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to come down. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next we're going to hear from the government and the Department of Housing and Community Development will be represented by Mr. Michael Kelly. I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be back at 1.45.
Good afternoon. I'm Uriel Bowser. I represent Ward 4 in the Council of the District of Columbia, and I'm the chairwoman of this committee, the Committee on Economic Development. Um, today, uh, we are um, uh, reconvening the public oversight hearing for the Department of Housing um, and Community Development. Uh, we will hear from them on their performance in fiscal year 2012, um, and the, so, so far in fiscal 20. 13. Um, this morning we've heard from members of the public about the performance of DHCD um, and now we will hear from the government. Um, the government is being represented by Director Michael Kelly and his team. Director Kelly, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Bowser and members of the Committee on Economic Development. I am Michael Kelly, Director of the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm here to testify on the Department's performance in fiscal year 2012 and the goals for fiscal year 2013. Accompanying me today are Jessica Haynes Franklin, Chief of Staff, Andrew Chanman, the Agency Fiscal Officer, Nathan Sims, the Chief Program Officer, and Robert Trent, the Chief Administrative Officer. I'd like to start by thanking my colleagues in service at the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, for all their hard work and commitment to public service. I'd also like to thank the public witnesses that we heard this morning uh, and for sharing their testimony and providing valuable insight on how our performance might be better. Our mission at DHC is deeply rooted in the belief that we can improve the quality of life for all district residents by preserving and increasing the supply of affordable housing, increasing home ownership opportunities, and revitalizing underserved communities by providing economic opportunities to jumpstart community development. On a personal note, it's great being home and to returning to service to the district, and it's an honor to serve in the Vincent C. Gray administration under his watch, the District of Columbia is experiencing remarkable economic growth. The mayor has recently created a five-year economic plan uh, to guide us and sustain us toward a prosperous future. And earlier this week, uh, the mayor published a sustainable D.C. plan to make Washington the greenest and healthiest city in America. The district is also experiencing dramatic growth in its population, with more than 13,000 new residents entering the city from 2011 to July uh, 2012, which has impacted the need for more housing and options for employment opportunities. At DHCD, we recognize the upcoming challenge that the demand for housing could exceed the supply of available options here in the district. Therefore, it's critical that DHCD continue, continues to meet the goals of its mission at a time when the demands, costs, and resources required for more affordable housing increases. Despite the extreme difficulties of this challenge, the staff at DHCD and our other stakeholder partners are deeply committed to improving the lives of all the district residents through housing and neighborhood revitalization. DHCD places a high priority on addressing the needs of the city's low to moderate income residents. We do this by providing capital resources or property to housing developers to build affordable housing. The agency also offers financial assistance and counseling services to residents who want to buy their first home or stay in their current home. At DH City, we also ensure that the preservation and maintenance of affordable rental housing is uh, by administering the Rental Housing Act of 1985, the Rental Conversion and Sales Act of 1980, and other district housing regulatory programs such as the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, the TOPA, which was discussed this morning, the Affordable Dwelling Units Program, the ADUs, and the Inclusionary Zoning Program. In fiscal year 2012, We've had successes and made progress in upholding our responsibility to serve the housing needs of all residents here in the District of Columbia. It's with great pride I will now share with you, Madam Chair, and the committee some highlights from our Development Finance Division, our Property Acquisition Disposition Division, our Resident and Community Services Division, our Rental Housing Commission, our Housing Re Regulation Administration, and the Division of Program Monitoring. DHCD's Development Finance Division had nearly 50 projects in its pipeline to create and preserve more than 1,400 units of affordable housing at the start of fiscal year 2012. At the end, 17 projects were closed, representing a total of 798 units of affordable housing to be developed or preserved. The agency has implemented a new approach in its underwriting process to address certain development and financing obstacles that previously delayed project delivery. One challenge that the agency recognizes is our pipeline process and we have taken steps to streamline and reform this process. For, for instance, in 2012, we implemented new underwriting standards. 
These new standards were put into action after DHCD re released its Notice of Funding Availability, our NOFA, which offered developers access to various financing options for building and preserving affordable housing. In September, DHCD recommended that 11 projects receive approximately $24 million in development financing to create and preserve more than 700 units of affordable housing. And to date, eight of these projects have cleared the approval process and are, and are moving toward closing. As we move forward, our goals are to foster respect through understanding and to operate with transparency and accountability. To that end, last month, DHCD began a series of workshops for housing developers, general contractors, architects, and community-based organizations to become familiar with our expectations regarding their ability to fulfill our request for proposals. An audience of nearly 130 people attended the first workshop, which provided an overview of DHCD's funding sources, our programs, and divisions. More than half of the attendees did not, had not conducted business with DHCD within the past five years or at all. Our goal through these workshops is to educate as many current and future stakeholders as possible. The next workshop will be held at 11 a.m. Wednesday, February 27th on St. Elizabeth's campus at 1100 Alabama Avenue Southeast. This workshop will focus on ensuring that for-profit and non-profit applicants meet the capacity standards necessary to complete the projects they propose for our home rehabilitation program, our housing counseling, our small business financial and technical assistance, and affordable housing proposals. During fiscal year 2012, our Property Acquisition and Disposition Division developed a long-term strategy to dispose of vacant and blighted properties within its inventory that focuses on neighborhood development. This strategy can be seen in several neighborhoods throughout the city. In Ward 5, the Trinidad neighborhood, five scattered empty lots were awarded last February to a developer to construct affordable units on each lot. In Columbia Heights, our Property Acquisition Disposition Division sold two vacant buildings where one was developed into 11 affordable units and the other was sold as two condominium units at market rate. In Eckington, a building that was vacant for more than 20 years was sold to a developer who will create 37 condominium units, 11 of which will be made available for households at or below 60% of the area median income. <clears throat> Going forward, PAD will estimates that 13 formerly vacant or blighted properties will become available to potential home buyers within fiscal year 2013 and consequently return to the district's real estate tax rolls. <clears throat> there are also successes to report from our residential and community service division, which com is comprised of several program areas. Through our home buyer assistance programs, DHCD assisted 247 low to moderate income residents in becoming district first time home buyers. These programs are anchored by the Home Purchase Assistance Program, the HPAP program, which provides up to $44,000 in assistance as a second trust mortgage to qualified first time home buyers. An example of the impact of these programs can be seen in Ward 7, where 132 home buyers used our programs to purchase their homes. These home buyers accounted for nearly one in five sales of residential condominium or single sale homes in that ward. Significant progress has been made with our single family residential rehab program, which provides loans and grants to help low income homeowners bring their residences up to current housing codes and standards. Our single family residential rehab program overcame a large backlog of applicants by assisting 44 households with repairs in 2012 and in 2012, we cut the waiting list in half, and we expect that this backlog will be eliminated altogether by the end of this calendar year. Most of the households served by this program were senior citizens who have spent years in their homes. Half of the program's households in 2012 were residents split between wards four and five. The urgency on reducing this backlog helps seniors get some assistance to improve the quality of life at home and allows them to age gracefully, gracefully in place while preserving affordable housing. In addition to senior citizens, DHCD also provided an opportunity to improve the quality of life for families with young children through its Lead Safe Washington program. In 2012, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development awarded our agency with $3 million grant to address potential lead hazards in 225 district housing units. The program also received nearly $2 million in local funds to support the initiative. The grant provided further opportunities for program participants to receive additional lead poisoning prevention training. In, two, in fiscal year 2013, the program continues to raise awareness about lead safety 
through an aggressive marketing campaign. Our radio and television campaign in the fall of 2012 generated over 100 interested participants. And this campaign has triggered a partnership with the local NBC television affiliate to support the 20th anniversary of that station's health and fitness exposition uh, at the Washington Convention Center on March 16th and 17th. The importance of our lead safe outreach is critical to the health and well-being of families who are, un un who are unknowingly exposed to lead-based paint hazards. Although these hazards pose a risk to everyone, they are particularly harmful to children under the age of six. RCSD is also charged with administering the agency's housing counseling program. Through a network of community-based organizations, the district of uh, our DHCD offers housing counseling services to district residents providing valuable information on home ownership, home preservation, and tenant rights. In fiscal year 2012, the network provided more than 18,000 counseling sessions to district residents representing 40, a 40% 40 increase since 2009. This increase highlights the, continu the continuing need for housing assistance despite the, the current boom in the city's housing market. The Rental Housing Commission, which adjudicates appeals brought by the Rent Administrator and the Office of Administrative Hearings, has also earnestly working to clear a backlog in the issuances of final decisions. The Commission reduced the backlog from more than 90 cases to 55 within fiscal year 2012. The hearings are scheduled within 45 days of the filing of the appeal, and overall, the time period between filing an appeal and the Commission issuing a decision was reduced from 60 days to 45 days. We expect the Commission to continue its efforts to further reduce the backlog by the end of fiscal year 2013. The agency worked to properly staff the Commission and anticipates that the Commission, our Commissioners are presently well equipped to improve the time frame for processing cases and issuing decisions and thereby improving the critical services to tenants and to landlords. In fiscal year 2012, great strides were made in the area of compliance. One area was developing a policy to strengthen our oversight responsibilities over project construction completion. Affordable housing is not fully achieved until a unit is leased or sold to an eligible tenant or home buyer. We also improved our internal process for tracking the progress of all construction projects in our pipeline. Our accomplishments were shared with colleagues at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's field office and serves an example of our commitment to work with the federal officials on restoring public trust. DHCD has also completed and published its analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, a HUD reporting requirement every five years to examine our regulations, our legislation, and practices throughout the district, which directly or indirectly impact a person's choice of where they want to live. More than a dozen factors were highlighted that could lead to housing choice impediments for all district residents. For example, one factor is the high cost of housing in the district and potential racial and socioeconomic disparities that that would cause. Our Housing Regulation Administration oversees rental housing, the conversion and sale of rental housing, and the, and the agency's inclusionary zoning and affordable dwelling unit programs. DHCD operates the Housing Resource Center, which serves as a one-stop shop for information on our programs and other housing services. And in fiscal year 2012, our DHCD Housing Resource Center served over 6,500 residents and has serviced more than 15,000 since its opening in June of 2009. The center also has an active housing provider ombudsman who serves as a resource for small housing providers. In addition, DHCD sponsored an affordable housing locator. That's www.dchousingsearch.org, which is a service that links people to housing that best fits their needs. This service, which can also be accessed for free through the Housing Resource Center, currently has 15,000 available units online for district residents to search for their next possible dwelling. More than 320,000 searches are completed annually, and more than 1,500 landlords and sellers are, listed, are listing rental and for sale properties on this very valuable uh, resource. Finally, I want to invite you and members of the committee to, to, attend the public, uh, uh, to attend our fifth annual DC Housing Exposition. We're calling it Welcome Home. The event will be held on Saturday, June 1st at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And the goal of the event is to bring together all the district's housing resources, particularly those related to renter rights, housing counseling, home ownership, home improvement, home energy efficiency, foreclosure prevention, financial literacy, so that district residents can take advantage of the face-to-face -face and hands-on exhibition of our housing resource partners. In conclusion, 
The Department of Housing and Community Development is committed, is committed to ensuring that we, as public servants and public administrators, are aligned with the priorities set by the mayor and prepare ourselves to execute them efficiently and transparently. I look forward to working with you, Madam Chair, and the Economic Development Committee, as well as our internal and external stakeholders to advance our mission to serve district residents. My staff and I are available to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Thank you, Director, and thank you for um, providing your summary. But more than that, uh, for your staff and you who have submitted to the committee, and I like to show these because I know it takes a lot of time, a big binder of information, um, and we appreciate it. We have been able to go through all of your responses and found them to be responsive to the, the committee's questions. Some of them we'll go over on, on the record today. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like to start with kind of a rapid-fire session sure. about some of the, the issues that, that we've heard from a good number of witnesses. And I will say they, they all um, raise some questions, um, and many of them have recommend, recommended solutions as well. So let me start with the, the question of inclusionary zoning, which your department um, has the responsibility for um, managing. Uh, we had a big meeting uh, among uh, not only the government, uh, the housing provider community, the development community, uh, as well as just people who are generally interested in housing policy and affordable housing policy or mixed income housing policy. Um, and so some of the issues that have uh, been raised is first of all, we haven't produced that many IZ units and uh, many people point to just uh, general slowdown in production that now we're just catching up with, the market is catching up with. Um, there have been some questions about how the uh, the ownership component of affordable, of uh, inclusionary zoning is working um, and what we've done to address any impediments to that. So uh, I guess the gist of my question will be, you not only, you've been listening to this for several months now, I, I guess, mm -hmm. um, you are developing some ways to address it and I, I'd like to get that status and figure out um, if the, the fixes are on your side or if you're going to recommend some fixes on our side. So I'll let you address that. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, to begin with, I, I believe that this is one of the most valuable programs the city has to ensure that there is um, a diverse income of residents throughout the district. Um, it's really an opportunity for us to take advantage of the housing boom to ensure that there is inclusion of all incomes um, while, these, while these wonderful homes are being built. Um, I think the, um, the, when you look at it, again, just to, uh, for the record, we've got about, we have 24 units now, three of which um, are for sale and 21 are rental. They're in the process now of, of being filled. One of the things I think getting right to your question, it's looking at uh, the home buyers and some of the impediments that have, have presently um, sort of slowed down that progress has been with uh, lending. Right now, these, uh, up until this moment, there was a uh, covenants around foreclosure, um, so these, uh, these uh, units would remain affordable. Well, this was something that the uh, uh, FHA would not allow us to have a waiver from, and so we've recently went to HUD and received, and, and to the, uh, the Zoning Commission, and we've now adhering to the FHA rules around this, which would allow a average home buyer to borrow money from a traditional or standard lender for them to uh, purchase these units. This is a relatively new um, um, up, you know, update that is now allowing us to uh, market the program for, for folks that were having problems getting, um, getting uh, lending. That's a, sort of a major one. It's going through uh, zoning now for final um, um, uh, promulgation, and we're waiting for HUD to uh, receive a formal letter, though we've, we've received um, an informal approval from all the uh, uh, requirements of the program, we're waiting for a formal approval to uh, to get that uh, that obstacle away. So, a actually, now you're saying that there are FHA has not allowed any of its products to be used to purchase these units because we had these uh, uh, these covenants around long-term affordability. Okay, so what is changing to make them say it's okay now? Well, right now, as opposed to fighting FHA, we agree with them, and we're looking for other tools to ensure long-term affordability um, short of um, a battling uh, FHA on the subject. Okay, and so you have offered a change to them? We're, uh, we're conforming with their requirements. Okay, which means what? That uh, from now on, if, if you're a, uh, a 
home buyer, the wanting to buy a, uh, a condominium unit or unit within the inclusionary zoning program, uh, you can go to a, a regular lender and just borrow money without having to worry about that lender checking with FHA and saying that they would not support the loan. Okay, and so you're going to provide that letter from FHA to the banks in the area. It was suggested that Bank of America has a approved list of mm -hmm. IZ programs so that the district can get on that approved list. Exactly. We have a, a real good relationship with the lending community uh, locally here. We will be letting uh, our partners know of, um, of this change in the law. Okay. I'm going to ask you to speak or oh. pull that up, and then we may need to ask our support services to turn your mic up. Now, I guess they're listening to me. Okay, so um, Mr. Wilson, 1919 Calvert Street. Um, this is a group of people who want to maintain the affordability of um, their homes. They are in your process now. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I am. Are there any impediments to them moving forward? Well, it's uh, it's like anything, like the other kind of projects that are working through our system now. We require that there be market studies and all the sort of rigors of real estate discipline. Um, and so, right now, we look forward to continuing to work with uh, the 1919 folks. Uh, and uh, although I believe the ball is a little bit in their court right now to get back to us with some questions that we that we've asked them about the long-term uh, feasibility of the project. Are they working with um, a group to help them through the process? It's, yeah, it's uh, Latino Economic Development. They're, they're working with um, some individuals from, from Georgetown. Um, okay, I'm looking at it. They've received support from City First um, Enterprises. So I think obviously today they came to say, listen, help us. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you would be willing to, to just touch base to see if we can um, prompt um, whatever they need to get in to, to get in. It didn't, they didn't seem to suggest that they were holding um, anything from you. I'll, I'll follow. Okay, that would be helpful. Um, so I don't think I have any additional questions about the Lead Safe program, but it's certainly is there money left? You talked about yes. the grant. So yeah. there's, what are you doing proactively to identify properties that have lead paint? Well, I think it's really uh, developing a much more aggressive marketing campaign. Uh, last fall, we actually went on radio and television for the first time in a while, and we, we for the first time we really got a lot of feedback from. Uh, um, from residents that feared that they had lead-based pain. Again, it's, it's really targeting those families with uh, children uh, up to six years old and in buildings that were built probably before 78 or so. So it's not everybody. It's, uh, but we do have funding for it, and uh, it's a program where we're going to continue to reach out through these different uh, uh, media outlets to try to get folks aware of it to take advantage of the program. Where are your problem areas for lead paint? Where are the problem areas in the district? Well, I think we had most of it in, in wards four and five, um, but I believe it's it's pretty much everywhere. But it's going to older, it's older, it's older parts of town, I guess, is the way I'm saying it. Older multifamily buildings. Well, there, Georgetown is the oldest part of town. Right. So what happened to their lead paint? It's all been fixed. <laughs> well, yeah. But, well, again, Madam Chair, you know, uh, it's really a problem that gets resolved with uh, encapsulation, fresh coats of paint. And, and so it's one in which I think those properties that have had ongoing good maintenance or properties are, are less likely to have the lead th uh, threat today. Okay. What I would be interested in, because um, this continues to be a, a problem certainly for the neighborhoods that I represent, the families that I represent, but as you say, I think Ward 4 and Ward 5 are similarly situated about how we can kind of focus our outreach. Um, it sounds like your um, your campaign gets to the tenants. The tenants call the government, and the government gets um, so. But the you know, one suggestion was there are several buildings on the same block that are similarly situated. Right. If we went in one, maybe we should have gone in the other three or four, which seems like a reasonable approach. We also have a good relationship with the Ioba community. That's another thing, Madam Chair. I think we will we'll reach out to that community and just remind them of this product. Well, like the small housing providers like Mr. Peters, AOBA doesn't represent them. And there is a lot of those buildings, and those are probably the ones where you have lead paint. 
Um, and so we, we want to, and uh, we will ask the housing authority when they come in next week, because I know that they're probably getting into a lot of those buildings, and they could um, share that information with you when they do their inspections mm -hmm. um, for people. So that's helpful. Let's talk a little bit about HPAP. Um, we got a lot of testimony about HPAP. Um, we recognize that you would have liked to spend all $1.4 million. How are you doing so far this year? Well, again, I think the, the, the trending is picking up, so I, I concur with the testimony that, that the, the committee heard this morning about ensuring that there's a, you know, continued uh, level, at least level funding for the program. Uh, and to just kind of, I think it was pretty much uh, spelled out the kind of uh, market forces that were, that had contributed to the, uh, to the slowdown of the program last year. Was that $1.4 million just um, turned back? Or had it, had it been committed so that it could continue to be spent in this current fiscal year? Yeah, it was turned back, Madam Chair. Okay. So where, where are we at this point? And so we're a quarter and a couple of months into FY13. Can you um, talk to me about the, the line item for HPAP and where, and I'm going to ask my staff to find it so I can look on with you. Um, the line item for HPAP and what has been spent or committed thus far this fiscal year. One second, Madam Chair. Okay, the current HPAP budget for 2013 is in total $13.3 million. To date, we have <clears throat> Obligated 11.3, there's only $2 million, um, or rounded up $2.1 million of unobligated funding in the program. Um, in terms of the HPAP program, the entire um, uh, um, commitment and obligation with the community um, association that re helps the, 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 the agency has been totally obligated. Give me that again. So your your partnership was with, with the Urban League, right? Greater Washington Urban League, correct. So um, could you, you're the fiscal office. Could yes. you restate your name, ma'am? I'm Andre Chanman, the agency fiscal officer. Chanman? Chanman. Chanman, okay. Uh, so Ms. Chanman, you said that all 13.3 was committed. That means it's been committed to the Urban League? Um, so of the 13.3, 11.3 has been committed. There's $2 million not committed, but the com full committed commitment to GWL has been made under their grants program. And what part of the 13.3 million is um, their grant? Eleven point two million. Eleven point two. Um, so one thing that, that we've heard today, Director, is that this um, grant and the availability of these funds always comes late. Yeah. So can you talk to me about what, what that process is? Well, and why been, is it always a delay? Um, I can't really speak to the nine years worth of delay. Okay. But I, I would like to speak about moving forward, though. Okay. Uh, and a lot of it really is looking at having our ability to estimate the need after the, the, the October 1st you mentioned earlier today, and to have that rollover money available come October 1. The other is actually having our um, contractual documents signed and approved um, prior to that. Um, up to this point, there's been kind of there's been a need for Greater Washington Urban League, our partner, to take money out of their own resources to cover that difference. And again, that's something that I, I thank them for that effort up this point. But we believe that that's not going to be necessary moving forward. I guess it's an opportunity to address the larger question from our other partners around the same issue that it's uh, when contracts uh, need to be signed prior to the October 1 and funding needs to be available. It seems pretty simple, but, uh, but that's the kind of thing that I think that, that the, our super notice of funding availability at April 2nd with a March 31st closing and a mid-August review date will allow us to get the contracts in place and the dollars in place so there won't be a need for this uh, this, this kind of period where there's not funding or contract or approval to move forward. So the HPAP falls into that notice of no, funding just, availability? That's just an example. Is an, an example of actually having things done in a, in a timely manner so that we're shooting for that October 1 rather than shooting for January. 
So um, on the HPAP, the, your agreement with the Urban League, is, is that a multi-year agreement? It's a three-year uh, contract, and this is the last year of that contract. So we'll be going back out on the street with a request for proposals for a, a provider to respond to that. So they will have um, the last year, meaning it ends on September 30th? Correct. So you have to rebid the contract. Where are you in that process? Uh, the RFP is, is close to being clo uh, prepared. We, we hope to have that out relatively soon. So you're probably behind. No, it's, um, well. Well, is it going to, um, what happens if it's not in place on September the 30th? Well, that's not an option for us. That's so not an um, option. What's the value? Is the whole 11 What's the value of the contract? So it's 11, about $11 million yeah. every year? Yeah. Okay. Now, you heard about um, some other concerns about HPAP, especially having to do with the um, inability to buy homes that need structural repair. Is uh, that a fact? Uh, I think that is actually, you know, there was an earthquake that had occurred, and not to blame the earthquake, but there are some issues that have, that have, that have happened that actually had an impact on last year. Uh, but I think that there's each of the issues that have, that you were, um, uh, that were presented to you this morning, Madam Chair, I think there are ways that we can proactively start to respond to. Uh, on the earthquake, on the damage, for example, we have a wonderful relationship with Nick Majetta in the Department of uh, DCRA, um, for example, in terms of their, their inspection work. Um, there was an issue that was brought up about uh, banks not becoming, uh, becoming more strict with their qualifying criteria. That is an issue, but as I mentioned earlier, we have established, we've opened communications uh, with our lending partners, and we continue to remind them that this is a program that's is, is, it's in their best interest um, to continue to, uh, uh, to participate in. Um, you know, the interesting one, which is really, I think it's, you know, this is no parent order, by the way, this is just things that come up, the idea that our low-income residents uh, can't afford to buy. And right now we're looking that a lot of the folks that are coming in that are making thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year wanting to buy a home, their, their buying power isn't that great? But one of the things that have come out of the discussions with the Mayor's Housing Production Trust Fund, I mean, I'm sorry, the Mayor's Housing Strategy Task Force has been looking at increasing options for um, home buyers and, and renters by increasing their, uh, their, their uh, salaries. So it's an interesting kind of, my, the idea that it's not uh, a unilateral fix, that there's one that everything's related. As you can increase job opportunities, the options for, for, uh, for things like purchasing increase. Uh, and, and, and again, I think one of the big things is looking at the, the, um, the marketing of the program and letting folks know uh, that this valuable resource is, is out there. So similar to our lead-based paint program, we'll be looking to do a much greater uh, marketing effort to let the district know that this, that this uh, program is available to them. Okay. So you have, um, when you say all 11 million are committed, that, or 2 million remain, so you have $2 million worth of loans to make for this fiscal year. No, the two million covers the administrative costs for the program. For example, salaries and other administrative costs. That's why it's not currently obligated. The full contract amount for GWL has has okay. been obligated. But they have they have the uh, they have space to make loans. Yes. Okay. All right. I got it for the for the rest of the fiscal year. And then it was also mentioned that the HPAP amount should be increased. Have you considered that? Has that been evaluated? No, it has not been, um, though I think it's something that's probably worth taking a look at. Okay. Now, you talked about um, the single family home rehabilitation program. Uh, what level is that funded at? Um, it's up to $75,000 per, per household. What is the annual allotment? Um, the total budget for 2013 for single family program is $3.1 million. And how, how did you, did you expend all of those monies in uh, fiscal 12? Um, mostly all the program had a $2.8 million budget and they spent two point, almost $2.6 million of it. So you're, or do you think that you're on track? Uh, I, you, you testified that there was a waiting list. There's a backlog. There was a backlog that's gone back the last couple of years. So we hope that we get, um, and there's always 
uh, new requests coming in. We hope that this calendar year we take care of all the backlog and we become current moving forward. So if that's the case, why wouldn't all of the money, and this is a small amount, it's $200,000, but that represents three, three houses. Is there a reason why it wouldn't have been fully expended? Um, just timing, I think. I okay. think a lot of these, a lot of these uh, projects, uh, you know, would be started, like, for example, in September, and so that, that would be a cutoff point there, but the actual work wouldn't be done until December. So a, a person <laughs> becomes, um, how does the program work? Uh, uh, somebody contacts DHCD, they go through an eligibility process, and then they pick from a, li a, a qualified list of contractors? Exactly, Madam Chair. That it becomes that we, uh, we do an assessment, we do an inspection, uh, we, we set a dollar um, uh, threshold and that the private um, homeowner contacts a contractor based on a pre-approved list of contractors to actually do the work and that, um, and that um, and we pay the contractor. Yeah. You pay the contractor yeah. directly. Yeah. Does the homeowner have to contribute anything? No. Not this program. Okay. Do you think that um, program is adequately funded? Well, it's one in which I think that if people, if more people knew about it, I think there'd be more people wanting to take advantage of it. I don't think it's adequately funded. I mean, I think uh, I would regard it as a, you know, a um, a part of your affordable housing preservation program that needs some more steam. Because, like I said. Um, Part of our strategy has to be to, to preserve the affordable housing that we have, and that's not just multifamily housing. It's a lot of single-family housing. Um, these repairs also not just benefit the homeowner, they benefit the whole block, in turn benefit the whole neighborhood. Um, and where we have sections of our city where we have a, a big concentration of senior citizens, I see this as an increasing um, need. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, Madam Chair, and I look forward to working with you and the committee to ensure that, there, that the program um, is sustained and hopefully grows. And just a note, obviously, there's two, there's two sides of it. We can produce new housing or we can preserve the existing. We, so, we have to. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the point I want to make in that is that we talk a lot about multifamily housing production. Um, and there is a lot of single housing and, and preservation, but the single family housing needs to be preserved too. And if we start seeing whole blocks we know where we know we have older homes that are falling into disrepair, we know that what that can mean for, um, for our community. So um, let's talk a little bit about TOPA. Um, we've heard from a number of people. They're concerned about uh, there not being enough money for uh, tenant purchases. Can you just talk to me in general about um, what the availability of funds are for tenant purchases, how transparent um, that availability, you know, the, the monies for that program are, and uh, what do you see as the challenges in the tenant purchase programs? Well, again, the, the dollars come from our Housing Protection Trust Fund. Uh, there isn't a set dollar amount, though we do have a numeric goal that we do per, per year, the 100 unit per year, um, which, um, and again, I think the, uh, we look at the, um, the you know, sort of the feasibility of these projects and we would grant them, uh, you know, awards based on feasibility and need. Um, this is a program that doesn't require, uh, it doesn't fit within our annual super notice of funding availability, so we would be able to uh, fund these projects as they came in. Um, and it's really, I think, um, as we start to move forward and we start to look at, at uh, the Housing Protection Trust Fund and to start to recognize, um, you know, that, that this is an, an infinite amount of money. It's an it's amount of money that, that some needs to be dedicated to the creation of new housing, some for preservation, et cetera. I think we're not there yet, Madam Chair, but I think the idea of actually having a, a annual sort of set aside the right word for it, an annual recognition of this is the amount of money that would be available for that might make it easier for those um, um, resident groups to know what their, you know, what their chances are on an annual basis anyway. Okay, so that, that process doesn't exist now. You never right. know from year to year how much is available for tenants. Right, it's really, it's really looking at um, uh, 
What's, what's is left? it what's left over from the other commitments? Uh, kind of, and again, it's a difficult question because these are these our, our program is multi-year. What what can be funded one year doesn't necessarily you don't actually pay for it for like, maybe the year next year or the year after. So, um, um, so it's not necessarily last money in. It really is on a on a evaluated purpose on an evaluated basis. So how how much money was spent on tenant purchases in fiscal twelve? Uh, we spent. Uh, if you just state your name, sir, before you um, speak. Sure. Um, Nathan Sims, I'm the Chief Program Officer. So for fiscal year 2012, uh, DHCD <clears throat> spent uh, 38000 on seed money and I believe 3.2 in acquisition uh, for uh, one project. For one project? Yes, ma'am. That was in all of 2012? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many requests did you get? I believe that was um, the only, no, actually, no. We, we received a request towards the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we're certainly are pro processing those in FY13. Okay. So you only got one request in FY12 for a tenant purchase? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that was funded? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you say seed money, what does that mean? Uh, it, essentially, it's like pre-development. Pre it funds pre-development activity. So uh, uh, cooperative can purchase, uh, not purchase, excuse me, they can go out and obtain appraisals and, and things of that nature. Now, um, one of the, the issues that I hear come up frequently and recognize as a problem is that DHCD will provide the acquisition funding and then there's no more money to do the rehab. And some of these buildings not only need like, or I'm not talking about cosmetic things, many of the tenants purchase buildings that have housing code violations. Right, right. And so now they're no longer tenants, they're owners, and they're not in the, they don't have any money to fix the problems. So how are you addressing that problem? Well, we're working with our, our uh, community-based organizations and our stakeholder partners to, that are working with these tenant groups to just remind them of the risk and responsibility that homeownership entails um, and trying to be as honest and as um, forthright about what the actual dollars and cents are. You're right, there are projects that, um, I'm absolutely right, especially in this market, these, the cost of acquisition alone is increasing. Um, and then when you, when you add on that the cost of rehabilitation, it's going to be a very expensive proposition. But should you provide acquisition money without rehabilitation money? Well, I think one of the things we're doing now is ensuring that um, that it's it's a, it's got to be a comprehensive look at the overall project. So prior to us providing funding for acquisition, we go back and we ask this, the second question: How are you, how are you looking at the overall cost of the project, including rehabilitation? So when I talked about the sort of the pro formas or looking at the viabilities of it, we're now taking a, a much um, a more strict look at uh, success in the project. Are you, um, before you provide the acquisition funding, do you have an assessment of the building condition in terms of um, building code violations? That's all. Yes, yeah, so we, we do go out and do a site inspection, um, and it, it's it's uh, part of the recommendation. It's part of the acquisition recommendation. It, it is. It's not a full blown. I mean, I think to to your point, it's not a full blown in terms of um, most or, or all buildings will get a physical what's called a physical needs assessment, and that will be a full assessment of the building. Um, but we do go out and look at. Uh, the property to see what, what code violations exist and make sure that um, any loan that we close, uh, that those violations are addressed. In the, in the amount of money that you provide for the acquisition? Yes, ma'am. Or that they are addressed by the owner before the sale? We, we've, done it, we've done it both ways. We've done it both ways. We've made sure that enough funding is there to address um, that issue, and we, if we know that it's going to be a lengthy process that um, is addressed, so depending on what the matter is, if it's certainly life, life and safety, I mean, we would say right away that it needs to get done. I would strongly suggest, Director, you find a, a way to formalize that process, especially for the building code violations, um, but also for the rehabs. I mean, what, we, what we've seen is that people get in a desperate situation and they go out and get a loan that the terms are just untenable. And then, next thing you know, guess what? They're not paying the mortgages 
And then they're coming to DHCD and say, DHCD, look, you gave us, you, you put us in this situation. Help us get out. Mm -hmm. um, and then they come to, to us, and my council member colleague Jim Graham just joined us, and here we can have a building full of people with low incomes that don't have anywhere to, any way to go, right. any recourse. Um, and I think that if we're making these acquisition loans, um, knowing that's coming, and that, that, that's foolhardy. Um, so are you going to make some recommendations about changing that process in the near future? We've already started that with internally. I think the, the recommendation of, of codifying it is something we will go back and, and work as a team to do. Okay. I'd appreciate um, that as well. So I, um, I've been joined by my colleague, Jim Graham. I'm going to turn to him um, and acknowledge him for a 10-minute round where, okay, he says he won't need that much, but we will um, let him have a statement and any questions for the government. Thank you very much. There's, uh, and hello, Director Kelly, Council again. again. <laughs> this has been a familiar situation between us, hasn't it? Absolutely. But I, I, there were two issues particularly that I wanted to come here uh, on. One is in my role as chairman of the Human Services Committee and how we're all struggling at present with the situation at D.C. General. And we have now have 284 families and 600 children at D.C. General. So we've created in that single building a small town. That's what we've done. And uh, it certainly is a better situation than Plan B which is to be wandering to the bus station and stairwells and everything else. But the fact of the matter is that we should be doing more at DC General than what we're doing at present. And we could either move people out into permanent supportive housing, which really leads to the Department of Housing and Community Development, mm -hmm. or we could get the support of the Department of Housing and Community Development to, to develop some quality housing on the site of DC General. Mm -hmm where we own the land, we own the buildings, we have the space, and we could have apartments. Now, in Ward 1 and Ward 4, right on the border of Spring Road, we have a, a family uh, unit, two family units. We have 1448 Park Road in Ward 1, which has family apartments. And there are family apartment buildings uh, for homeless, otherwise homeless persons elsewhere. But one option, and, and we're, we're all so very encouraged by Mayor Gray's announcement that there's going to be $100 million uh, to the Housing Production Trust Fund, which is within the purview of this committee. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on how, I mean, we talk a lot about affordable housing, mm -hmm. but we need to talk about affordable housing for extremely low-income persons because that is a, a commanding and compelling situation that everybody's agreed upon. Mm -hmm. that we don't want children being raised at Union Station. You know, we want people to have a sense of home. So, um, Mr. Director, I'd appreciate your comment on good. that. Good. Well, Councilman, it's good to see you again and to work with you again. Um, I've had the honor to uh, serve as co-chair of the, the, uh, the interagency um, um, sort of Coalition on the Homeless's Permanent Supportive Housing Task Force, which we took a, we had an opportunity to take a deeper dive looking at specifically permanent supportive housing. Uh, looking at a, a, a uh, um, in time sort of need and moving forward the kind of incremental numbers um, that, that the city may want to uh, invest in moving forward. Uh, the dovetail with the Department of Housing Community Development, as you noted just a second ago, is, is really in our ability to provide um, gap financing for developers to create housing, uh, long-term housing units that have permanent supportive housing uh, incorporated in. What's coming before this committee and the, and the council very soon will, is, a, some, is a, a bit of legislation that will allow the Department of Housing and Community Development to use Department of Human Service dollars as well as uh, Department of Mental Health dollars for service provisions. So we'll be looking to do our uh, procurement with really hard stakeholder partners with the other agencies to, to ensure that there's the wraparound services that go with these. Uh, what that also brings us some additional resources. The Department of Mental Health, for example, has about $8 million that, uh, that, they're, willing, that they're looking to invest in the creation of long-term permanent supportive housing. So we recognize uh, you know, at this point we have, a, we have a number we've been working closely and we are a member of the, the Mayor's Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force and recognizes that's an important component of it as well. And I think at this point it's really looking at how the dust settles on the $100 million 
question and how the Department of Housing and Community Development with its existing tools can use to support that. At this point, I think that we all agree that the, uh, that the goal is to have families in units long term and if they need help, that there's help that will be available to them through the other support services. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that in Ward 1, uh, on the 1400 block of Irving, right in the heart of our, you know, uh, very bustling retail residential center of Columbia Heights, we are today building, uh, uh, I believe it's 44 units of, of permanent supportive housing, apartments, not SROs, apartments. And, and I'm very pleased with that, but of course that's for single adults. And I'm, I'm very supportive of what we're doing also on Girard, which has also got a lot of otherwise homeless families in the Girard property. But I think, you know, I, I, we were at D.C. General, uh, when was that? I guess it was yesterday or the day before. And the place looks good. It really does. And the people, the staff, uh, Director Burns is doing uh, really, I think, a bang-up job in terms of working with what he has. But I think we're beyond the point of putting lipstick on the pig. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've got to wrestle with these 284 families, 600 children that we are creating into a small town where we have five member families in a single room. Four children and an adult in a single room, or three children and two adults in a single room. Uh, if you get much above that, then they, they give you two rooms. You know, and again, I, it's better than Union Station or some stairwell. But the fact of the matter is that it's not what we should be doing. And so I come here today to pit, make a pitch for, the, uh, uh, for our fair share of the $100 million mm -hmm. in a new uh, housing money. The second issue I want to raise with you it concerns affordable dwelling units. And this is something that uh, Council Member Bowser has been very much involved in, I've been very much involved in over the years. And with the best of intentions, we created these ADUs, as they're called, in buildings that were brand new buildings in many cases that were to be developed so that we would have a percentage affordable. The NCRC, which you may remember, mm -hmm. uh, had, had, had some of this work done in Columbia Heights. I was very supportive of it. And so like on Kenyon Square, which is a condominium building, or is it a cooperative? I think it's condominium. Uh, we created a number of units, but what's happened is that the assessments have increased. Yep. There have been special assessments. The fees have gone up. And so those people who can afford market rate apartments, you know, I'm not saying it's been easy because, you know, it's, it's been an increased expense, but it's been a much lighter burden than people who have low incomes. And so I don't think... Um, my recollection is I don't think we anticipated to a sufficient extent this problem. And we've created, you know, inclusionary development and all of that. And we've created a lot of new apartments, as you well know. But what, what are we going to do as the costs associated with those apartments increase, as they have to, because you might need a new boiler, you might need a new roof, I, who knows? Uh, in the building I'm living in, we've, we've just spent something on the order of $8 million to redo the exterior and, and with a heavy assessment, new assessment. When that happens, what are we going to do for these ADU holders? Well, I think uh, this, I too have met with many of the, uh, the same constituencies that you have around this and, and the feeling of how trapped they are. Um, I have committed to getting back to a smaller group, a working group, um, to look at, to kick around different op op options. I think we unfortunately may be looking at two approaches. One, establishing a fresh stake and moving forward. How do we get the, the, the ADUs and, uh, to be in a, in a, uh, and the owners of, of ADUs to be in a situation where not, they don't have that same kind of trappedness come from condo fees, et cetera. And sort of looking back at the, at the covenants of places like Kenyon Square and others, each one of these things is different. That's the other issue we have right now is that there's hundreds of different covenants around each of these properties to almost look at a case-by-case at -case basis about how do we provide some relief to those, those families that are currently in that situation. So I look forward to continuing to work with you um, uh, and, um, and in this committee uh, to come up with, to have a, rec uh, uh, a resolution on those families that are currently burdened, but as importantly as we move forward, because it continues to be a very important program, especially when we look at McMillan and Walter Reed and et cetera, it's going to be critically important for us to continue to invest that type of affordable dwelling units in our inventory, 
um, but to look at based on the experience that we've had now of escalating condo fees and, and the other kinds of things that, that make these units sort of de facto unaffordable um, are things that we have a, a chance to do. The short, I think, is to really look at, at uh, um, now at condo, at, at, at sites that have some stabilization about what actual hard costs are and to, to um, incorporate that data on the selling price to begin with. So, so we, 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 you know, we'd, we'd be realistic about what the long-term cost would be. And so the initial cost of uh, purchase sort of thinks through the long-term cost of, of, of staying there. Madam Chair, it's very good of you to permit me to have these few minutes. I'm not a member of this committee, but I, I, I do think we need to have a regime associated with the ADUs because there are a whole raft of issues about subleasing, uh, to some extent sale, although there's, there are limited equity apartments, I believe. Uh, but, but there's a whole raft of issues that we just didn't anticipate having. And as the numbers of these units increase, uh, we, we really, uh, and, and as our experience with all of this increases, which is really what happened, is all of a sudden people are saying, I can't afford this apartment uh, anymore. And then what do I do with it? What, you know, what, what, what are my rights here? I've been here five years. Is that uh, this is a, something that I think we could well afford to spend some time on. Because there are now a lot of people in these units, and we're grateful that they are there. But, but we've got to answer some of these questions also. But do keep the extremely low-income persons in mind in terms of this new housing money. Yeah. Because the greatest plights are to be found with people who have absolutely nothing sh other than TANF and food stamps. And those are the people that we have at DC General. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't mind at all being a strong advocate for their interests in this affordable housing discussion. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, brag about our new sort of public public partnership with the Department of General Services and um, and Director Hanlon's sort of outreach of, and, and commitment to uh, being a, a larger player in affordable housing as well. So these are all, also things that are on our radar screen right now moving forward. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Graham. And, and Director, it's the process that a number of people referred to you being the keeper or the manager of a memorandum of understanding among several agencies that have housing money um, to put out one uh, RFP. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Because there may be some intersections with Mr. Graham's committee. Yeah, it's um, uh, right now uh, the, uh, there was part of this permanent supportive housing committee of the interagency, you know, um, coalition on the homeless, um, has signed a memorandum of agreement in which we've all committed at a very high level to commit to the creation of uh, permanent supportive housing. And so, um, the the funding, for example, as I mentioned before, that may be available through the Department of Mental Health will be coming through uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development on our April second notice of funding availability. Um, so we will be incorporating as we call it, the underwriting criteria, we'll be incorporating the kind of um, uh, requirements to produce permanent affordable housing in our uh, super notice of funding availability, which will be coming out April 2nd. Um, and we had the opportunity to talk about, um, in a meeting this week, the, uh, along with inclusionary zoning, the affordable dwelling unit um, program where these um, developments, the city requires these units either through a plan unit development process or through some other disposition of government land or rights. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. And your office is responsible for managing how people seeking affordable housing connect with those units. Is correct. that correct? That's correct. Okay. Is it also correct that we need to do some work around being uh, having a central database of where those units are. Yes, and that's something that that uh, I want to thank you this opportunity. To thank you for your leadership, by the way, convening. That was a really remarkable meeting. I think everyone that was there um, uh, expressed that. But yeah, I think it's about data management, and um, and it's now we're now working with the deputy mayor's office to to collect not only that data, but all the data around um, housing uh, availability, both hard units as well as subsidized units. Um, I think that, you know, right now we have about um, 1,400 units. This is a clarification of, of a response I gave you. We have about 1,400 units um, in our inventory and about 600 that are pipeline right now that are, that are ADU units. 
Um, and so one of the things I think that we, um, we do have a responsibility to um, ensure that, that folks know what their rights and responsibilities are and connecting those, um, those clients to those units. Okay. And so um, when do you think you'll have the kind of the data management under control? Well, uh, right now we're shooting, it's, I think uh, we're now looking at the end of this, uh, the third quarter of this calendar year for actually having the larger project completed. This is something that's, that's um, as you might imagine, a very major project that, uh, that Octo is involved in as well as the Deputy Mayor's Office is involved in. Um, but on this particular one, the, uh, the ADU question, um, we actually are starting to solicit um, information from existing um, folks that are in the program to try to glean out at a very high level the kind of data that we might have to recommend policy changes. Okay, and um, I know we'll update Mr. Graham, but your office is currently working on some recommended changes to the IZ. Correct. And I understand that you'll also have some recommendations for the affordable dwelling unit at the same time. Well, timing-wise, we actually have the uh, inclusionary zoning recommendations closer to completion okay. than the ADUs. Okay, so that will come shortly thereafter. Correct. Okay. Um, and these ADUs, not to be confused with the accessory dwelling units <laughs> right. um, that we're talking about in the zoning rewrite process, um, but might be referred to as mixed income units. So they're, they're um, units that the city has invested in by way of um, some consideration in a land disposition of land that we own or by allowing a developer to build more than his right or her right. Um, okay. So we, we regard it as a, a unit that the city is subsidized in some way. Okay, so um, let me turn to the questions around Skyland. Um, in, I guess it was December, you got a letter from the Department of Housing and Community Development that outlined six findings uh, for the, dis the, that, you know, that the district needs to respond to. Um, you requested some additional time um, in order to respond to those items. But why don't you uh, just go over with me and I will probably review some of the findings in uh, more detail, but what you see as the problem. What did HUD ask you to do? Uh, well, uh, HUD asked us for the simple request of um, explain where the money went. Um, and because this was a project that had touched so many different government agencies over the course of the year, uh, over the course of this project, that uh, the records weren't all in one spot. And like any auditor or reviewer, if you, don't, if you can't respond in real time, then they just write you up as a finding. Um, what we've done uh, since that December letter is to uh, have a, a concerted effort with the Deputy Mayor's Office to look at um, identifying, um, well, again, there were six findings. The first finding was uh, reconciliation of the $28 million community development block grant monies that was dedicated to this project. Findings two through six were findings that were really related to record keeping, accounting, and, and overall uh, project management. Um, so uh, I asked for an initial two weeks because we, were, we, we wanted to make sure that what we submitted to HUD met the HUD format of what they would need to, um, to close the finding, uh, of which we did. We've been working very closely with the Department of Housing and Urban Development's field office here in the district um, to uh, submit the data that they have. Uh, we have a February 28th deadline. Uh, we will meet that deadline uh, to submit our, um, our overall response to the review, uh, of which I'm confident at this point that there is no malfeasance, no uh, waste, fraud, or abuse issues that, uh, that you know, the, the earlier implications of not having the documents in place would, would imply. And that um, I'm quite confident that the, you know, the, of the $28 million, uh, uh, most, if not all, will be accounted for and will be, um, will be confirmed by HUD, and that items two through six, the, administ the administrative recommendations, are frankly administrative recommendations that impact our overall operations, and we, we thank HUD for those recommendations, and we're incorporating those in our standard operating procedures moving forward. So there's two, there's, there's two kind of larger federal programs that we're doing, we're looking to respond to simultaneously. There's the home program, in which there was a review, uh, which which noted um, you know many items about uh, again record keeping and accountability, that we submitted everything we needed to at HUD for them to close, and we hope to have a response by early March from them about where we are with that particular review, 
or actually that was a, uh, an IG finding. On the CDBG finding or review, uh, we actually will be submitting something next week, and I actually and I have a schedule to meet with the Deputy Assistant Secretary at HUD Central um, the week after that, just to um, hear firsthand uh, did they get the did they get the product, and to ensure them that uh, moving forward. Well, two things: that one, the CDBG jars that were associated with Skyland are accountable, and that we have systems in place so that the, any other reviews that happen in the future can be responded to in a much more expeditious fashion. And two, specifically, um, how do we get to closing of this finding? As you might imagine, it's a, it's the, this is a very important project for the city, and it's one in which HUD has been very supportive of. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a hearts and mind exercise that I, I'm very confident that by summertime, we should have some rec uh, re uh, resolution on. What period of time were these uh, monies expended? From what to what? It's from 2000. Uh, it's from uh, it's mainly from 2002 through 2008. And so, how, what's the process for the monies being expended? So there were the you were kind of the were you would it be right correct to say that you were like a pass through agency? Well, yes, yeah, the CBG uh, dollars as well as the home dollars go through the Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay, so um, in so 2002, we have responsibility reporting. right, it was in, our, in NCRC that was generating the request for the dollars, right? Yeah, correct. Is that correct? And then at some point, it went over to DEMPED. But DEM, one of those agencies, one of the economic development agencies would have said, okay, this is our need. Here, pay us. I know that sounds simplistic, but how, how does it work? How is a, a check cut um, or checks up to $28 million cut through your so, agency? I'm sorry. Um, so we do cost reimbursement. So we don't disperse anything prior to having an invoice and a review. So the $28.7 million was for land acquisition um, and related costs associated with that. So that made it a lot easier. So you had two scenarios. You had either property that was uh, obtained through voluntary sale where you would have uh, a settlement statement uh, to that effect, or you had a situation where, not to use the uh, eminent domain word, but you would have uh, condemnation. So that would go through the courts. And that uh, would, once that process was finalized, then a determination in terms of uh, what was owed was paid out. And so there are prop there's the property aspect, and then there's the business aspect. So um, the CDBG has a what's re referred to as a URA, Uniform Relocation Act. So that means that businesses that were located at the site um, were provided funding and opportunity to move their business. Uh, so that was another cost is, that was associated with it. So for the land acquisition piece, we uh, had um, not only the appraisals, but the settlement statements, the review of those uh, those types of uh, that process along with the invoices to support that and along with the court records from the com commendation side. So you would have been given one of three things. You would have the, the sales agreement if they sold Correct. voluntarily, the court documents if Correct. it went through eminent domain, and a host of relocation expenses. Correct. Okay. And you say you it's a cost reimbursement. Correct. So that means that um, DEMPED would have paid through it, its it, resources? It would have been a, an advancement of district funds in some form or fashion or funding that DR, uh, NCRC had of its own, and we were reimbursed based on that. And you reimbursed the aid. So all, did all of this happen while NCRC was in existence? Were all of these payments made during that time? Uh, I think the bulk, the pre, well, actually pretty much all of the payments um, took place. The condemnation for voluntary sale took place during NCRC period. Uh, the uh, properties that had to go through condemnation, um, obviously DEMPA had picked up uh, some of those. So if, um, if the, the expenditures were in those types of discrete buckets, um, why are they hard to find or document? Well, uh, it was not really a question of uh, it's it, it, having them in a central location was the, the biggest issue. Um, now that we've actually pulled them together, the documentation is is uh, very good, I believe, and it's something that again we've we've kind of tested 
uh, with the local field office to ensure that they think it's good enough moving forward. So I think it, the answer, I think, is it really is about where they were located more than more than what was in the files. But they would have had to, at some point, been located at DHCD, correct? Not, not until recent. Well, how is it that you made the, what did you base those cost reimbursements on? So, last, so well, yes, yes. We, the financial records, yes, we, we did. Okay. But not necessarily the backup. Yeah, the backup. So the backup may have been insufficient for the payments that you made. Would correct. that be safe to say? Yes. That when HUD was looking for the backup, we did not have it. Okay, and you didn't have it at the time of payment? No, no. I think the difference is that we did have the backup at the time of payment happened along a, a prior, in a prior fiscal year, but the backup documentation was there at the time when HUD came to do their review. Um, the documentation was spread amongst um, things that were in the warehouse for NCRC, things that were uh, with the deputy mayor's office and things that were DEMP, with, with DEMPET. So last summer, the decision was made to bring all of those documents all of those documents together, as well as OAG had documents as well. Okay, but my question is, when they say, you know, we need three million dollars, right? What did what did you know? Somebody at at DHCD had to authorize that payment. Right. Probably it had to go up to the director, I would guess. Probably. Um, so what was the director looking at? The director would be looking at the, um, so we have a form payment that's the 306A, so that's their standard uh, documentation, but along, so that would list the dollar figure, but behind that, so if it's voluntary, so we would have the settlement statement and things of that nature associated with that. So contract. you would have everything that HUD is looking for now? Oh, now, yes. Okay. And so after the recommendation was put before the director with all the backup documents, you then sent the backup documents back to their owning agencies? I can't speak to the process at that period, okay. but um, in terms of, I mean, that's how, in, in the way it would work it, it, in terms of DACD at this moment, the, the backup documentation would be part of the payment process. And it would stay at DHCD? Correct. Right. Okay, got it. Um, are there any more uh, CB, CBG, CDBG. CBDG? Fund expenditures expected for Skyland. I'm not going to call on you, ma'am. Uh, the public test, I see you waving. It's, uh, it's, it's distracted me a little bit, but this is only the government portion of the. I know. No, you can't. You can't. No, I'm sorry. You can't now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to. I know I have to move on, but I will have the opportunity to follow up with them. Are there any more expenditures expected? Not from CDBG. From anything? Not anything? on Skyland. Not on Skyland. No, ma'am. So a DHCD is out of the Skyland business? Well, um, <laughs> we still have oversight responsibility. Yeah, over a, the CBG, yeah. CBG yes. over the funds. So okay. it's not necessarily completed. Into, so, I mean, you heard earlier about the national objective. So a national objective was identified at the time of acquisition. Um, there has to be a, a meeting national objective at the end in terms of disposition. So that until that period, um, comes and goes, and there will be a level of oversight that takes place. I mean, we certainly have to work that out between us and the deputy mayor's office. Um, but that's the okay. process. So are you satisfied that the, the proposals you've seen on the, the table meet that national objective? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And so um, you don't expect any more delays in responding to HUD? None. No, okay. it, it's actually, it's, it's sort of done now. We're actually now at this point just doing the final checks with the local office to ensure it's in the format uh, that, they, that they will require. All right, the next um, area I want to go to is the Housing Production Trust Fund. And I want to make sure I'm understanding your budget documents from uh, fiscal 12. Let me go on my tab here. <clears throat> okay, so um, in fiscal twelve, what was available to be spent? in the Housing Production Trust Fund. 
and what was actually spent. Because what I'm showing, and I just want to make sure I understand this, is that $23,791,000 was unspent. Is that correct? Yes. However, of that um, amount, it was primarily um, related to obligated project funding in 2012 that carries over, for example, the DFD construction projects that go over multiple years. Okay. So it looks like a surplus, but it's actually obligated project funding on the table as we speak. So, um, Director, can you talk to me about um, how you commit these projects? I think you reported that 17 were finished in fiscal 12, or 17 were funded. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do have the, the spreadsheet um, before me, and um, it looks like these projects were from mostly from all over the city. But not quite. So I have one, two, three, four projects in Ward 1, uh, one project in Ward 4, four projects in Ward 5, one project in Ward 6, three projects in Ward 7, and four projects in, in Ward 8. And you have remaining projects. You're carrying over 23,791. And that's on top of what's going to be available to be spent for 13, correct? All right. So let's talk about, go ahead. Just as a correction, 23 is not available money, for example, for the April RFP. That is money that goes back into the projects that are already under construction. Are they under construction or are they just in or the pipeline? In, in the pipeline, in, in the funding pipeline. And All right. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about it. those projects? Do we, have a, do we have a list that shows the balance of the projects that didn't get started last year? Have they gotten started this year? I'm not sure what's well, being looking. Can I just kind of share with you also kind of the big picture real quick? Yeah, the, uh, so this April 2nd super notice of funding availability we've been talking about is looking at all the federal as well as the local dollars, uh, specifically the Housing Protection Trust Fund dollars. So on top of, you know, the dollars that, that we're, we're, we're doing a deeper dive right now, we're looking at um, funding from CDBG and HOME and the 9% credits that we get from the, uh, 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 from the t taxes to, uh, to and as well as the other partnership programs that fit into this, uh, this notice of funding availability. So when you start to look at what's available to us moving forward, the good, the good news is it's not just Housing Protection Trust Fund dollars. It's also dollars that, that come from federal sources as well. Sure. Um, so that's April that you issue that. Okay. And Correct. that'll be for all the Housing Protection Trust Fund that's available that's not committed. Correct. Correct. It's, um, and I'm looking at a sheet that you provided for us. And I, I just want to make it's called the Development Finance Division. Closed projects with obligated funds to be drawn and is dated 2-12-13. It's tab 20. It's in tab 20. So I just, I want to make sure I understand, would these be the projects that are subject to this 23 million some dollars that carried over from last year? Okay. And so... This doesn't give me their status. You have something that would show their status. For example, are these projects going to move forward in this fiscal year, or is this money going to carry over? Uh, I think in terms of what our projections are, we have about 16 projects uh, that will close in uh, FY13. Okay, so 16 out of these 41 will move Probably, actually, probably more. About actually, about three, about three fourths of our pipeline uh, are kind of past the approval stage. Uh, so, I mean, I want to highlight that first and foremost. And so, as we begin to get the um, go through the process of trying to close, um, get the commitments, the council approval for those over one million, 
um, we, we should have a considerable um, amount in 2030. Well, let me put it another way. Are there some of these that aren't going to happen, like they're not feasible, something about the deal has fallen apart? There, I mean, that's a very small amount in terms of um, our, our portfolio. So we worked very, so we worked very diligently over the last year to make sure that everyone is in a position to to move forward. Okay, so you you feel comfortable that these 41 projects are feasible, nothing has fallen apart, and they're going to move. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, and I asked this question because, you know, there's a finite amount of money here. Yes, ma'am. And we don't want any um, any projects that aren't real to hold up space for other projects. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and so, so that's good to know. So, for example, we heard a testimony earlier about the Buxton condominium. Yes, ma'am. That's done. That's uh, said be closing uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think we heard about the Colorado Avenue apartments earlier. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? And where, where does where is that? Uh, we, we certainly have. We've had discussions with both the tenant association as well as the development consultant on moving it forward. Uh, we, we had some issues with the initial proposal, and we, we met to discuss that. And so we've outlined a, a pathway forward that we think is viable um, for both the, the residents and the long-term stability of the building, preservation oh, of the building. Okay. I think actually, it, um, did you host that forum? No, that was the, the coalition hosted the forum at Martin Luther King. Um, and I was approached about the 6925 and 6929 Georgia Avenue. Yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with that? Yes, ma'am. And where is that? Uh, we are working to close toward uh, April 30th, closing. And so these are project. These have already been through the the com competitive process, and they're on the list to be funded. Yes, ma'am. And so you're working towards funding those. Um, what about Momi's uh, Mentors for Minorities in Education at 2626 Georgia Avenue? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we've been working with um, the developer on their proposal um, because I think it's morphed a, a couple of different times. So we're, we're certainly trying to, to work, uh, work with him to see if there is a viable proposal that can move forward. Are there any of these projects, Director, that are related to the new communities um, that some of this, these funds are being used to uh, build replacement housing? I don't believe so. No. no I don't believe so. No. Okay. No, But I think I would like to sort of echo the, to the, the, the spirit of your, your questioning here. We did do a, uh, a more rigorous job on the um, – on the underwriting requirements and the feasibility on the front end, and I think, uh, Madam Chair, you and probably other members of the council were told about projects that didn't that didn't go forward. I think it's a, we're now working with those same uh, projects to ensure that they meet the threshold requirements and they thought through all the real estate requirements so that they can be successful moving forward. But I believe it's this this the the set that have that you're uh, reviewing before you now are all solid real estate deals. Okay. Um, now, you, do you, you have some vacancies. Now, we have another opportunity to talk to you about budget. So if anybody is not, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the budget today, but you, you do have some vacancies at your organization. Correct. How many? Um, Good afternoon, Councilman Bowser. Um, my name is Robert Trent. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, we currently have 18 vacancies. 18? Uh, five, um, actually 15 of those are currently in the process of recruitment. We currently have five uh, that are pending. Two of those are um, managerial positions uh, that just recently became vacant or in the final stage of recruitment. So you intend to fill all 18 positions? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, w would you say that's a three-month process or you're along the way, I take it, but... The majority of them, uh, 15 of them, are in the final stages. Uh, so we have, uh, it's really just so about three or four. So does that mean you're ready four. to make an offer? Yes. We okay. have uh, one uh, position that will be starting on Monday uh, and several that have received uh, approval through the city administrator's office, and we're working with DCHR. Okay. So um, that's, that's helpful. Um, to know, obviously, you have a big mission, and I know you want to have all of your people. Yeah. 
And Madam Chair, I think with potentially the additional dollars that the mayor has uh, committed to affordable housing, uh, any kind of additional responsibilities that our shop would have would probably need to look at additional uh, staffing to make that successful. I've had some conversations with the mayor's uh, economic folks about that already, and their budgeting folks. And you are in a new building that the district owns, correct? No, it's, you, uh, lease. It's, it's lease. It's lease. In on Good, on Good Hope Road. Correct. Okay. Good Hope and, and uh, Martin Luther King. Do you have any other facilities? No. What about the housing we, center? The we actually center? Share, um, have a small office where the commissioner um, actually resides at 441, so that's part of our facility listing also. And then our storage warehouse would be the third. Okay. Do you have any, you have a storage warehouse? Well, for our files. For your files, okay. Do you, are your, oh yeah, those files. <laughs> I mean, when you're talking about the loan program alone over deferment of 25 uh, to multiple years, and we have portfolio of excess of 20 years, we okay. have massive files. So you have storage. You have a your your commission office. You call it. Yeah, correct. That's, now, which the rental housing commission. rental housing commission, and so they're all over at um, 441. Right. I'm going to want to visit with your rental housing commission, and maybe you can tell me what will be the best um, day, and we can walk over and um, take a look at that. I'm sure they would welcome that you. operation. <laughs> I know it. It's going to be fun, um, and 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 visit there. And I actually haven't been to the new building, Good. so. Uh, but before we have um, the budget uh, hearing, we should do that. Um, Madam Chair, along those lines, you know, I, as, as, you, as you well know, I've I had the, the, the honor to serve in a lot of different communities across the country. The Housing Resource Center that is at uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development is really top-notch. It's really one of the best, best operations so ever. So it's at your Good Hope Road location? Yes. Okay. And so we're about to hear from Mr. Sewell. and He also has a, a storefront for housing information, correct? Mm -hmm. And, and he has it his own shop, and the, but then yes. we have a close working relationship with okay. not only housing finance, but with the housing authority. Okay. Um, so a lot of uh, the questions that will re remain will be um, about the budget, and we're going to reserve that for your for your budget hearing. And uh, I think we, we got a very good flavor of what your department is working on. Um, but one thing that became clear also is that a lot of people think that you've breathed some um, fresh air and, and um, community engagement. That's what I heard quite a lot of, um, that you have been willing to be available uh, to the community. Um, and I think you'll see that that's going to pay off. Um, and I, I know your staff will agree that your willingness to do that will make their jobs easier um, as well. So um, I want to congratulate you on your first five months and I look forward to, to working with you. And also your thoughts about how your agency is going to be impacted by any infusion of affordable housing dollars. And as you can see, there's going to be um, uh, some grab for it. But where else should the, the housing dollars go? Um, but I, I bet you're going to have to make that argument. We will. Okay. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to put on the record about uh, the performance of your agency in fiscal 12 and so far in fiscal 13? No, I'd just like to once again uh, thank my colleagues in service at the Department of Housing and Community Development. A great working, great team. Thank you, and I, I want to thank them as well. We didn't uh, get to, and I, I said that I would visit, which means we're going to talk about it next time, about uh, the rental housing and condo conversion. That's quite a big chunk of what your um, agency is responsible for, and I'm going to have some questions at your next hearing about them. But it is 3.20, and I want to conclude this part of the hearing, and we're going to reconvene at 3.30 to hear from the public on the house um, housing Finance Agency, and then on the Office of Cable Television. Yeah.
I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm reconvening this uh, performance oversight hearing of the Committee on Economic Development. Um, today we have heard from public witnesses and from the government uh, representing the Department of Housing and Community Development. Our next agency will be the DC Housing Finance Agency um, and we're going to hear from, I think we have, are there any members of the public who want to testify? Misty Thomas, are you here? Misty, please come up. Thanks for your coming down to testify, and I will recognize you um, for three minutes. Oh, good afternoon, and pardon my voice, I've been ill, but thank you, Chairwoman Bowser and the members of this committee. My name is Misty Thomas, and I'm a staff attorney with the Affordable Housing Initiative at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. I want to start by thanking DCHFA for the often unrecognized, I think, and very hard work that they do, and I was just reminded in, in greeting Mr. Sewell the amount of lion's share <clears throat> of time that he and his staff just spent on the Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force and thanking them for that time and service as well to the city. Um, they have some really bright minds and they've also dedicated some of their time to coming to the um, housing production or housing preservation network meetings where we discuss city at-risk properties. Um, and I also am here to discuss today the policy choices that DCHFA has to make when it's dealing with defaulting rental housing properties. In the last few years, DCHFA has had the unfortunate burden of having to address a handful of investments where property owners fail to make their mortgage payments, leaving DCHFA in the lurch as a lender. And while these situations are rare, the choices that are made in those situations have serious impacts on the people who live in those properties and on the dedicated hard stock of affordable housing in the city. Um, so what choices do I mean? Well, first, um, whether, how, and how often to communicate with the various stakeholders about what's going on, including the tenants and tenant associations following a default. Second, whether and how to engage the tenants in the decision-making pro process about the disposition of the property. And third, the determination of how to actually dispose of the defaulting HUD-backed property. And I also would like to discuss sort of what I think are several unintended consequences that come with doing a foreclosure sale as the method of disposition. Um, I hope this committee will ask DCHFA to address their policy positions on these issues and talk about the thinking that goes behind them. While I don't by any means pretend to understand all the complex factors that DCHFA has to consider in its role as a lender, I do know that they're tasked with a mission to increase the supply of affordable rental housing and home ownership in this city. So I have been flummoxed at times to learn that their preference is to use a foreclosure auction to get these properties off their books when they fail, and this doesn't allow for giving preference to developers who might be inclined to preserve affordability, improve the conditions at the property, and work really collaboratively with the residents. Um, I've worked with tenants in at least two properties where DCHFA is making these kinds of decisions about new ownership, Parkway Overlook in Ward 8 and Elsinore Courtyards in Ward 7. Both of these properties had long-term, had subsidies on them, had other long-term affordability requirements, had significant conditions problems, and both have vibrant and engaged tenants who really want to ensure that their homes remain affordable to them and their neighbors despite the failings of the prior owners. Um, in 2007, HUD terminated the Section 8 contract um, due to physical conditions at Parkway Overlook, and DCHFA took over as mortgagee in possession due to a default there as well. Um, DCHFA's initial plan was to hold an auction, but later agreed to issue an RFP that would have preserved affordability, um, but only after extensive advocacy to, to do that. And unfortunately, there have now been several RFPs, in part, we think, because of problems caused by HUD, not DCHFA, but how very recently there's been another contract that's fallen through, um, and why did this happen? Well, there was a sighting of a significant funding gap, but unfortunately I can't really tell you why else sort of this process wasn't successful, what the source of that gap was, whether it could be remedied, um, why, because in some ways I think as a lender, DCA feels like DCHFA has to keep that pretty close to the vest in their process. And while, again, I, I understand it leaves some gaps in our understanding as, as advocates in figuring out how to help. And that's not at all to say that DCHFA hasn't engaged with me and my office and, and the tenants. They, they definitely have. But nevertheless, these processes have not been completely transparent to us throughout. Um, and 
I, the tenants, I think, we as affordable housing advocates, you and council, we're all invested in seeing these projects succeed, but without better information about why deals aren't coming together and what other resources could be helpful, none of us are really useful allies to DCHFA in preserving affordable housing and protecting these communities. Um, unfortunately, we did also just recently lose affordability protections at Elsinore Courtyards, despite the protestations of the tenant association there, who did want a voice in picking out their new owner, um, someone who might be more committed to property maintenance, who might be more committed to security and, and affordability. Um, DCHFA proceeded with an as-is foreclosure auction in September 2012, which required the bidders to be able to close on the property within 30 days of um, winning the auction. The agency wasn't willing to extend that closing period, um, which, and, and the, the, the foreclosure auction did proceed, and that meant none of the affordability protections were preserved that ran with the land, those lift when there's a foreclosure. Um, and there, even though there could have been more than 17 years of um, tax credit affordability layered on the property, um, I do want to be clear that the foreclosure auction is not the required process here. Um, HUD gives DCHFA at least five years, is my understanding, following a default to resolve the situation either with the current owner or through a competitive bid process that can consider various factors about the purchasers or a foreclosure. And while an auction certainly gets it off the books quickly, I think it leads to several other unintended consequences um, and negative ones. That um, first, it ensures, as I mentioned, that all the affordability protections that are linked to the land, poof. Um, second, it has, um, and I've been told directly by developers, that it has a pretty strong chilling effect on the participation of mission-driven affordable housing developers because, one, the price is pretty unpredictable and that's hard for, for these smaller nonprofit or arms that do affordable housing to plan how to participate. Two, the limited due diligence information that often goes along with a foreclosure sale. Not none, but more limited than they might do, build into a, a contract where they have more time. And three, because that very short closing window doesn't allow time for even getting funding from conventional lenders sometimes, but definitely not to line up these creative DHCD solutions or other governmental funding sources devoted specifically to affordable housing. And finally, I think the auction format, as we saw, can cause a bidding war that might lead to an inflated purchase price um, unintentionally resulting in a new owner who's paid this higher price to get the building but now has less cash on hand or funding available to actually do renovations or rehab um, to improve a property that was already in disrepair. Um, so this harms the tenants, but it also may long-term diminish the value of the property if they're constantly playing catch-up to, to get the status and condition of the property um, I do strongly believe that the value of finalizing a sale doesn't and should not outweigh the value of, for this city, of finding the best all-around buyer who can successfully close with smart, stable, and affordability protecting financing. It is unfortunate that these prior owners defaulted, but I don't think there's any need for low-income DC residents to be the one to carry the heaviest impact of a bad loan on their backs. Um, and I hope this committee will ask DCHFA to talk about their policy positions surrounding failing properties. I also want to use this hearing as a chance to ask the council to use your influence um, to encourage DCHFA and other agencies like DHCD to work really collaboratively at the first signs of default. Um, perhaps there are creative ways to line up financing that would allow affordable-minded developers to come in and take over failing properties without resorting to a foreclosure sale or facilitate this dispositions in a way that would allow DCHFA to pay back their obligations, which obviously it's important and needs to be able to do, but still prioritizing affordable housing preservation in this dwindling stock we already have. Um, I do thank them for doing work that I don't completely understand and can't do myself, but hope we can do in a really transparent and thoughtful way. Thank you, and thank you for your um, testimony. And uh, you, you've brought up actually a project that has my attention, um, and that's Parkway Overlook. Um, so what is your involvement with Parkway Overlook? Um, my office worked with the residents. A, a lawyer prior to me worked with the residents um, when the, the initial um, default happened and there were a variety of sort of other issues related to voucher issuance when the re residents had to be relocated, some security deposit issues, uh, just a, a hodgepodge of, of sort of more in the weeds than just pure preserving affordability at the time, but built a relationship with the residents at that point. And then as over the years, they've been taking a look at um, development proposals. They have asked us to 
um, help them in making sure they understood what they were reading, what they were being told, and sort of guiding them through these RFP processes um, along with pro bono counsel. When did um, the residents leave Parkway Overlook? How long has it been? I believe people mostly were out by the end of 2007-8. Okay. I believe this is correct. And what do you think should happen at Parkway Overlook now? Well, you know, I think it would be great if now there was a developer, which there have been people who have made themselves present who were, were interested in affordable, who could renovate, deal with some of the really physical challenging conditions issues there, prevent the rising tide of development that's going to go on around St. Elizabeth's and really commit to being affordable housing in that area. We saw, you know, people that are interested in protecting the seniors that live there, activities and positive things for the kids in the community, but fundamentally, rental housing that people of low and medium income can come back to, uh, which is what the tenant's primary goal, as I've understood, has always been, that they can return to, that they'll be safe, they'll be habitable, and they can afford long term. The neighbors, the tenants don't want to see a place all of a sudden that their friends and neighbors that have always lived in that community can't come back to live at. Okay. But they want to be back, and you know, it's been unfortunate and for a thousand factors from what I understand about why it hasn't happened more quickly, but here we so are. So you're keeping track of all the tenants? Um, there, there is a tenant association still in place, okay. and they do their best to keep a roster. I think that DCHFA has some listing. I think DC Housing Authority has some listings because of the way vouchers were issued. But it's a little, it's a hard game, right, to keep an eye on on people as they move and try to continue normal life. Sure. Well, I met uh, many, uh, some, a handful, I think, of tenants from Parkway Overlook when I hosted a meeting um, in that neighborhood around metro issues mm -hmm. um, with Council Member Barry. Um, and that's when I became very aware of the issues at Parkway Overlook um, and very aware of how a blighted and vacant Parkway Overlook is infecting the entire community. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've, I've been very interested in, in seeing something uh, move there, and I certainly will look forward to hearing from the department department about what's next. I'm, I'm not familiar with Elsinore Courtyards. Where is that? It's in um, Ward 7 off, you, well, you can off sort of North, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how to do the, the directional. Okay, it's in, it's in Ward 7. Yeah. Um, and is that a similar situation? N no, not okay. completely. It has been, it's still occupied. It wasn't at the, s the level of severity of condition um, that um, Parkway Overlook was, nor did DCHFA have to take the identical steps in that case. They didn't have to become mortgagee in possession. Um, there, you know, I, I, there may be slightly underlying funding structure differences that um, okay. I couldn't tell you offhand. But what did happen is a, a owner who went bankrupt and then sort of residually it affected their mortgage payments from what I understand. And um, they had been, I think, remiss for quite a while on tenant relations, they were doing aggressive evictions, not taking care of some physical needs at the property, and more fundamentally, defaulted on their loan. And the residents were initially, I think, in some ways optimistic, like, okay, well, here's this chance to highlight the fact that we've been having serious problems here, and maybe this is a chance for something new and positive, and someone who will come in and, and do right by us, not realizing that, the, that what the potential risk was was all these affordability protections being gone, and the risk completely of someone coming in who had no link to affordable housing vision who bought at an auction. They could come in and now the market forces are the market forces and, and that neighborhood is not rapidly gentrifying in the way that we see other parts of town, but development is happening um, not too far away. So someone could come in and decide they want to do major substantial rehabilitation and do a dramatic rent increase because now all they have to comply with is rent control. Um, and there's I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So generally speaking, we're, we'll hear from the director about mm -hmm. what his um, general approach and policy is towards these troubled assets. Right. Um, and not only that, but how can we continue to have those assets uh, in our affordable housing stock? So um, those are good examples, and thank you for coming down to testify. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, next, we're going to hear from the government. And as Mr. Sewell, as you approach, I'm just going to say a few things about um, um, your agency. The Housing Finance Agency was established in 1979 to stimulate and expand home ownership and rental housing opportunities uh, in the district. And uh, they accomplished this by issuing mortgage revenue bonds that lower the home buyer's cost of purchasing homes um, and developer's cost of acquiring, constructing, and rehabilitating uh, rental housing. Um, so HFA has two uh, 
two primary program areas, multifamily housing development um, and its home ownership area. Uh, the agency has developed, uh, has provided capital for more than 14,000 units of affordable rental housing, helped over 6,000 D.C. residents achieve home ownership, and invested over $2.5 billion in the district's economy. Um, in, the most, in this fiscal year, HFA has, approved, has an approved budget of 8.7 $4 million. Um, that's a slight decrease from fiscal 12, um, and the agency has 40 employees. Um, the agency's role is uh, even more vital in the midst of uh, volatile economic times, especially those affecting um, the provision of affordable housing. So we agree that there is a need to identify uh, more resources always and better approaches that will build on the affordable housing programs currently being administered in the district. Um, there is more, I'm sure, that we can do around home ownership opportunities across the district um, and more that we can do to conserve current affordable housing and produce more affordable housing. Um, so it's no secret that we, uh, many D.C. residents say that they can't afford to stay here or their children can't afford to live here. Um, and you always hear that affordable housing is uh, the single um, biggest issue that will help us grow together as a city. Um, so Mr. Sewell has been um, leading this effort for quite some time and has done an impressive job at implementing solutions around affordable housing. Um, and I, I quote him always. And I think you heard the director of DHCD quote you, that the best housing program is a good job. Amen. And um, that's easier said than, than done, so we try to approach them always, but certainly um, providing great education and skills for our residents will um, help us solve the problem of having uh, of people being able to afford housing in the district and always keeping an eye towards creating um, affordable, moderately priced uh, mixed income units all over our city. So with that, uh, Mr. Sewell, I want to thank you and your staff for being completely responsive to our questions. Um, which we sent over to you probably about a month ago, and you have returned uh, a big binder of information which we, we have reviewed. Um, some of those questions we'll um, put on the record today, but I'd like to turn to you for your statement. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Bowser and members of the Committee on Economic Development. I am Harry D. Sewell, Executive Director of the D.C. Housing Finance Agency. On behalf of the Board of Directors and our staff, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this fiscal year 12 and 13 to date performance oversight and budget hearing. Accompanying me today, our friend Makel on my right, the Deputy Executive Director, and Allison Ladd, the Associate Executive Director. And I would also like to acknowledge two members of our board in the audience, Derek Ford, the Chairman of the Housing Finance Agency, and Charles Lowry, a member of our board. Before discussing where we currently are as an agency, please allow me to recap where our multifamily program has been over the past five years. In 2008, the year of the financial collapse, the DCHFA provided roughly $95 million in taxes and bond financing for nine projects yielding 955 rental units. As a result of the near complete collapse of the capital markets, that number dwindled in 2009 to roughly 30 million in taxes and bonds for only two projects, yielding 297 rental units. Due in large part to low cost capital made available through the Obama administration's new issue bond program administered by the U.S. Department of Treasury in fiscal year 2010, the agency's investment in rental housing skyrocketed to roughly $132 million in support of nine projects and 987 units of rental housing. In fiscal year 2011, the new issue bond program enabled DCHFA to provide roughly $87 million in financing for seven projects and 729 units of rental housing. The clear success of the new issue bond program in the district is evidenced by the slingshot effect that the program has had in transitioning capital markets to the present environment. I am pleased to report that based on data for fiscal year 12 and 13, 13 to date, 
DCH, DCHFA has utilized that momentum to great effect. Specifically, in 2012, the Housing Finance Agency issued close to $178 million in tax exempt bonds and allocated over $87 million in federal low income housing tax credits for nine developments delivering 1,600 units of new or preserved affordable housing in the district. So far in 2013, we have financed four multifamily rental projects by issuing $42 million in taxes and bonds and over $24 million in federal low-income housing tax credits, yielding to date 505 units of affordable housing. We currently expect to close an additional six transactions, delivering an additional 842 affordable units by the end of this fiscal year. While the worst of the financial meltdown is behind us, there are past events which still affect the agency's business operation. In the fall of 2011, Bank of America, our master servicer for our single family program, announced its complete withdrawal from the correspondent lending business. In the, in the year before the single family program was suspended, average sales prices of homes purchased with our low interest Fixed rate mortgages stood at roughly $210,000, and loan amounts averaged around $190,000. While the mechanism for loan delivery involves new players, our single family program will remain well suited for working district families, and we fully expect to relaunch our program this fiscal year. As you know, Chairman Bowser, in February 2010, the Obama administration announced $1.5 billion in Housing Finance Agency Innovation Fund dollars for the U.S. Treasury's hardest hit program. Through the program, state housing finance agencies received funding in support of innovative programs intended to stabilize the local housing markets and help families avoid foreclosure. In September 2010, the Housing Finance Agency was awarded over $20 million under the hardest hit fund to imp implement an effort we named Home Saver our foreclosure prevention program for district residents, and I note that one of the people testifying in the uh, previous um, testimony talked about Home Saver being uh, critical to help them save their home while they were experiencing unemployment. To date, Home Saver has an 86% approval rate, yielding 476 successful applicants, with a total approved amount exceeding $10 million the second highest amount by percentage in the country to be expended. This money is available until 2017. Understanding that the shifting employment trends in the district, understanding the shifting employment trends in the district, DCHFA took full advantage of the hardest hit initiative's hallmark flexibility to craft an expansion of the program to underemployed district residents at risk of foreclosure. Now, not only do unemployed residents stand to benefit from the program, Home Saver can assist individuals experience, experiencing involuntary reduction in income of 25% or more. Assistance is available for up to 18 months of mortgage payment, capped at $32,385. Interested district residents can go to www.homesaverdc.org or call 202-777-1690 to see whether they qualify. Madam Chair, in previous hearings before Council, I commented that the financial world is in completely uncharted territory. The waters are certainly calmer today than they were immediately following the financial collapse. That said, there remains a great deal of uncertainty surrounding housing and the financial services industry which has great potential to affect DCHFA and the market that it serves. While several key housing regulations have been promulgated, still budget sequestration, federal tax reform, continued promulgation of Dodd-Frank regulation mandates, and the wind down of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac still loom large in the background. With these issues in mind, we continue to closely examine changes at the federal level that affect our business and are prepared to appropriately respond to those changes. Finally, in an effort to encourage timely approval and construction of multifamily housing, 
Several district agencies, really through the auspices of the Housing Task Force, have recently begun to examine the possibility of a single streamlined underwriting process. While this delegated underwriting concept has gained traction and increased examination in fiscal year 2012, it has not yet been implemented. DCHFA will keep this committee informed as the concept is further developed and as we work in other ways to collaboratively expand affordable housing opportunities across the district. Uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my testimony and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Director Sewell, and I want to thank your staff um, as well. Uh, let's start with, you alluded to your role as the co-chair of this housing comprehensive housing strategies task force, and I hope that you would bring us up to date on, um, on the areas that the task force um, attacked and evaluated and the status of the recommendations. Very well. As you uh, mentioned, Madam Chair, I was asked to co-chair along with Deborah Ratner Salzberg uh, the, the revised, if you will, Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force. Such a task force was uh, previously impaneled in 2003, uh, chaired by Alice Rivlin and Adrian Washington. They issued their report in uh, 2006 entitled Homes for an Inclusive City. I think the notable recommendations of that task force were that the city should encourage uh, itself to grow by about 100,000 citizens by the year 2020, that um, given household formation size, it would take about 59,000 housing units to accommodate that growth. And in order to remain inclusive, they call for fully one-third of those housing units to be affordable, or about 19,000. Uh, the legislation that created the task force called for any findings to be revisited in five years. And therefore, in 2011-2012, Mayor Gray uh, re-impaneled uh, 36 members of the housing task force. We started from a premise, and, and to uh, build on what you previously mentioned, we started from a premise that in a city where there's over 60,000 uh, residents waiting for public housing, that a supply side strategy alone would not be sufficient to meet the housing needs of the district. So our premise was that we needed to work on two fronts. We needed to have a supply side strategy. How can we increase the supply of affordable housing? But we also needed a demand side strategy. How can we depress the demand for housing subsidy by enabling people to get the jobs and training that they need so that they can increase their incomes. Uh, one of the research items that we found to that point, people at 30% of median income or below can presently afford about 18% of housing units in the district. Rental housing, zero uh, efficiency, zero bedroom units up to three or four bedroom. When their income increases to 50% of median, they can afford 42 to 43% of the housing units in the district. So just by moving that needle from 30% to 50%, we have increased people's affordability exponentially. So one of the main premises of the task force was to work on both sides. Uh, we concluded, we sunset on January 31 of 2013. Uh, the final report is currently being written and I'm pleased to say that the mayor has already embraced two of the major findings that you will see in the recommendations. Uh, one, we're recommending the completion of those 19,000 housing units called for in the first task force. And therefore, the mayor, when he announced that the state of, state of the district address 10,000 new units by 2020, uh, that is one of the recommendations that you'll see coming out of the task force, and we're calling it 10 by 20. Uh, secondly, uh, we are recommending the creation of a fund over top of all of the existing budgeted funds for housing in 2013. And again, the mayor announced in his state of the district address another $100 million in such a fund. So we're pleased that uh, some of the recommendations have already been embraced. There are several others. Uh, and again, we expect to have the, the glossy printed report 
um, sometime later this month or early March. Okay, and so the you, you when you talk about the completion of 19,000 units by 2010, so since the first report, you say are you suggesting there were 9,000 units? Well, we we just cut the baby in half. Okay. Uh, as you know, I think from previous testimony, there isn't at present a good tracking mechanism. We don't know for exactly what has been produced. Right. So again, we we thought that given what capacity is given what's currently being produced and being somewhat aspirational, we thought that 10,000 units by 2020 certainly should be an achievable goal. And, and when we say affordable, we mean affor units, and these are rental units that are affordable to people at 60 percent of median and below. What is the average subsidy for an affordable unit at that income level? On, on the operating side or on the, on the capital side? On the cap, well, I was thinking about on the capital side, but I, I suppose what, we should what talk What we've about seen on the, on the bricks and mortar side, um, anywhere from fifty to hundred thousand dollars a unit, uh, and that money has been come from sources like the Housing Production Trust Fund. It's come from CDBG. It's come from Home Dollars. The, the principal source of gap financing uh, has been through DACD from those three programs. From Housing Production Trust Fund, what were the other two? Community Development Block Grant, mm -hmm. CDBG, and Home Dollars. Okay, so if, if the average subsidy is fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, how far will that hundred million dollars go? A hundred million is a good down payment. It certainly is okay. not sufficient to do ten thousand units. And I think one of the things that it's we're ten thousand times a hundred thousand. A billion. That's a billion. Dollars. A cool billion. So what is that? Ten. That's uh, ten thousand per unit. Well, if you did the hundred million, but again, I think the way the mayor announced it, the hundred million is only for one year. It, it's not okay. meant to be for between now and twenty twenty. So, it so as I said, a hundred million dollars for the next six years. Approximately, or or something in that neighborhood. Yeah, six years. So that'll get us to sixty thousand. Okay. Or or some or something in that neighborhood, yes. And it, and it perhaps won't all be new money. One of the things that we studied in the task force, we had five working groups. One working group was called Rethinking Local Funding. The city already spends close to eight or nine hundred million dollars on housing, uh, about four hundred million in bricks and mortar, and another four hundred million in operating subsidy. Uh, we think that some of that money can be reprogrammed and spent more effectively. Uh, for instance, uh, there was previous discussion about D.C. General. Uh, we also know that the Department of Human Services spends money on motels on New York Avenue to house homeless families. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of that stay, uh, the city has not created an, an asset for itself. So again, we, one of the things we're recommending is that the city rethink how some of that $800 million to $900 million is spent uh, so that assets can be created, so that we can have additional gap financing, uh, and so that we can support things like permanent supportive housing. So you're, we already spend, you're saying, 800 to $900 million? That is correct. Annually? Annually. All right. So. And, that, and, and as Allison Ladd reminds me, that's federal and local. So that includes the operating subsidy, the ACC money that uh, the Housing Authority gets from HUD. That includes the bond authority that we have. That includes uh, money in uh, the Departments of Mental Health and Human Services and so forth. Okay. So it's, it's federal and local sources. Okay. And, and again, we, we have some of that research on the task force w website. Uh, taskforce2012.org, and uh, did, did we put that up, the uh, research that was done by that working group? That will be in the report. It'll, okay. it'll show where those, where those sources of, of funds are. So let me ask you this then. Has the task force um, contemplated and or recommended how the $100 million for the subsequent six or seven years is going to be identified? We, we have discussed it. We think that a large portion of the money uh, should be for production, uh, and it can supplement gap financing uh, using things like the delegated streamlined underwriting process that I talked about. 
No, we, not how you're going to spend it. Where is it going to come from? Uh, the we mayor have to identify new revenues. We one of the things we talked about in the task force is taking advantage of the low interest rates in the current environment, and that the city would borrow money uh, and use the proceeds of that borrowing over the next several years. Um, so again, that will be in the task force report. The recommendations on how to uh, fund this? Because yes. Because you're saying 10 by 20. 10 by 20. Okay. And you're saying that the average subsidy is 50 to $100,000. That's correct. You might want to split the baby, but I, I go with the worst case scenario. Okay. So let's call it $100,000. $100, that means 1,000 units per $100 million. So right. it's going to be about, it's about a billion dollars. No, your math was correct. Okay. So it's a, it's a billion dollars. Um, and you will identify, for example, like we, when we have $26 billion in metro investments we mm -hmm. need to make by 2040. So what we're trying to say is, okay, we've identified our aspiration. We know we need this to keep the system going, but how are we going to pay for it among the jurisdictions? So, so that's what we can expect to see when we see your report. As, as an example, uh, Dr. Gandhi came and made a presentation to the task force and talked about the fact that from fiscal year 2011 to the present, the city's income tax revenue has increased by $40 million annually. If we took half of that increase, or $20 million, and dedicated that to debt service at today's interest rates, we could raise three to $400 million uh, in some type of borrowing, some type of city-backed debt. Uh, one of the things we did with the task force is we looked at what other jurisdictions have done. We looked at what uh, Mayor Bloomberg did in New York City with the new housing marketplace plan. We looked at what uh, Governor Deval Patrick is doing up in Massachusetts. Uh, we looked at what our neighbors next door in Montgomery County did. And again, we, we think that one of the things we, we would be proposing, again, especially in this low interest rate environment, that some form of city-backed debt uh, could be a part of the equation for how we could reach 10 by 20. Um, well, what impact will that have on our debt cap? That, that I don't think would have an impact. It wouldn't because it'd be... If, if the city, uh, to really go big, if you will, if the city looked at a voluntary 1% increase in its debt cap, that would be about $80 million a year. We could raise a billion dollars in today's debt market. So again, there are different ways to approach it. Uh, I think that uh, obviously the that would- The mayor is going to recommend an increase in the he debt did not. He did not recommend that. I'm talking from the task force perspective now. I'm not speaking for the mayor. Okay. okay. So you were asking me, are there ways to pay for it? So yes, we, we looked at ways that we could potentially support- Right, but the scenario that Dr. Gandhi outlined with, um, in his presentation, we yes. have the debt cap raised. No, he was talking about how the income tax has increased. The income okay. tax take to the city has increased because of the increase in population. Okay. So again, I'm not speaking for Dr. Gandhi. I'm speaking for what the task force looked at. Other jurisdictions around the country who thought that they needed to do something about production of affordable housing, how did they pay for it? So when we talked, for instance, to the housing commissioner for New York, uh, they had a much more ambitious goal from, from 2007 until 2013. They were looking to create some 163,000 housing units, affordable housing units. The Commissioner of Housing in New York, as part of his toolkit for this year, has $250 million coming from the city that the city raised through a borrowing to help them meet that goal. So again, we're just recommending what can be done based on what other jurisdictions have done. I'm not speaking no, I on, on behalf of the administration I or Dr. I just wanted Gandhi. to make sure that there will be a number of scenarios. Um, so, there will, and, and, so, there will, so there will be. Okay. There will be. I, I can certainly um, appreciate that. Now, you testified about your single-family mortgage program. Yes. So that's been suspended? It was. Uh, Bank of America, which served as our master servicer and the master servicer for several housing finance agencies around the country, in 2011 decided that they were going to exit the correspondent lending business. And what that simply means is that they would no longer be buying loans from other originators.
they would only uh, do mortgages for bank customers. Uh, and they also then exited the, um, exited the master service of business. So without someone to service the mortgage loans, we had to, we had to stop uh, issuing mortgage loans while we went through a process of uh, reexamination of the program, the procurement process for a new master servicer. Uh, we have gone through that procurement process, and we now have U.S. Bank on board as a new master servicer. Uh, but we thought it was uh, actually good to take time to reexamine how our mortgage product worked, what changes we should make. So in that intervening period, we've been studying again what the D.C. housing market looks like coming out of the downturn, uh, who should our primary target customer be. I gave some statistics in my testimony that the previous uh, mortgage amounts were around $190,000. Uh, we note that uh, the average mortgage amount in D.C. now is probably up to the three or $400,000 range. So we're trying to identify what role can we really play to help stimulate home ownership. And uh, having procured another master servicer, which was a major step, we hope to have that program back up uh, by the end of this fiscal year, Ho now, hopefully sooner than that. What advantage do D.C. residents have in having your agency provide mortgages? Principally a lower mortgage interest rate. Um, and in addition to that, in, before we curtailed the program, we were also offering our own down payment assistance program that could be used with HPAP. So we were offering borrowers a lower interest rate plus $10,000 of, of down payment assistance. Uh, so again, as we're looking at what we can offer, we're trying to craft a product based on the borrower population that we think would be most needy of it. Now, We've also had a couple of discussions with uh, city agencies. Apparently, the um, teachers have a mandate to provide um, down payment and closing cost assistance for teachers who are identified as high performing, and they're working through that, and we've talked with them. And we've also talked with members from the uh, Deputy Mayor's Office for um, Criminal Justice about ways we may be able to uh, incent first responders, police, firefighters, and so forth, uh, again, through a, a low-cost mortgage product. So we're, we're taking all of that into account as we think through uh, how we'll relaunch the mortgage product. Now, is, is your uh, program compatible with HPAP? It is. Okay. And have uh, and I've heard uh, in my discussions with Council Member Barry, uh, one of his goals is to increase home ownership opportunities in Ward 8. Um, just over a quarter of the residents are homeowners. Um, have you had any particular discussions about uh, focused activities in Ward 8? We have. Well, again, just from our previous statistics, the highest users of our previous mortgage product were uh, wards 5, 7, and 8 historically. And in the last year before we suspended the program, uh, wards 4, 5, 7, and 8 have traditionally been the highest users of our mortgage product. Residents who, who were moving into those areas, whether they lived there previously or not, but that was the destination that they moved to using our mortgage product. Okay. Um, speaking of Ward 8, and we've had conversations, we heard from a witness earlier about um, Parkway Overlook. Um, so before we talk about that specifically, more generally, I think she was talking about distress um, mm -hmm. assets and how you approach, approach them. So you can start from the, the most basic kind of level of that discussion and talk about your approach. Absolutely. Uh, very recently, we've undertaken in our asset management area uh, to stratify our properties into A, B, and C categories. Properties in category A uh, have no issues. They're meeting their debt service coverage. They have no physical issues. Properties in category C, I'm, I'm sorry, in category B, have either a financial issue, they're not meeting their debt service coverage requirements, or they have a physical issue, they need repairs that have to be made. And, and properties in category C uh, may have a combination of both. Uh, and we did that in order that we could really turn our attention to properties in that category C uh, to help them before they reach default. So and it's from a macro perspective, that's what we've done recently 
in terms of how we approach the uh, properties that we finance that are in our portfolio. The two uh, properties that Ms. Thomas mentioned in particular had another overlay in that they were so-called risk sharing projects. We have an arrangement with HUD FHA where that if we assume a portion of the risk for an FHA insured mortgage, uh, we can do the majority of the underwriting, but then if that property defaults, we also have a responsibility to share in any loss. Uh, so you've heard a lot of discussion in the uh, papers recently, in the media recently, about FHA and the insurance fund. Well, that's separate. The risk sharing, which housing finance agencies can do, um, imposes that financial risk on top of the housing finance agency as well as FHA. So those two properties were in our risk sharing portfolio, where in essence, when they default, we get, we get the insurance claim money from FHA uh, to pay the investors off, but then we give an IOU to HUD, call it debenture, for that money that we received from the insurance claim. And then over the five-year period, again, that Ms. Thomas mentioned, that for the life of that debenture, uh, we have to dispose of the property and or otherwise settle that insurance claim. So those two properties in particular had that extra um, burden on the housing finance agency of having direct monetary risk to us in terms of how those properties were disposed of and the settlement of the insurance claim. Okay, so you, you were a claimant on an insurance claim. We, we were a co-insurer. You were a co-insurer. Yes, along with HUD FHA. Okay, so... Why then do you owe the, why did you have to pay HUD an IOU? Again, when the, when the claim, typically if a property is defaulting under, under the FHA scenario, FHA pays the entire amount okay. um, to the investors, to the mortgage holder. Uh, under risk sharing, and there's several categories, we're in the category right now of 90-10, so HUD will ensure 90% of the loss, the other 10% comes from us. So for easy math purposes, if, if the claim to pay the investors was $100, uh, HUD would pay $90, we would pay 10. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the claim for Parkway Overlook was $14.5 million, rather substantial. So that 10% uh, that we're on the hook for, we have to find a way to dispose of the property such that we can repay HUD uh, the amount in the debenture and also try to, re, uh, try to cover our 10% uh, that, we, that we are due, that we are paid, rather, uh, for that claim. So who's the owner of the property now? The, the owner is, is still, for which part, for Parkway, Parkway Overlook? Overlook? The owner is still the uh, owner that it was, as, as was mentioned. We are the mortgagee in possession. We did not assume ownership of the property. Um, it, was a, it was a general partnership. Um, the managing member was from Atlanta, and the, there was a uh, local member. Um, but they are still the actual owner of title for that property, the owner of record for that property. And who's responsible for maintaining it during this period? As a mortgagee in possession, we are responsible for maintaining it. So we have been paying for things like uh, cutting the grass, having the property, having the properties boarded up, and having physical security on the site, and fencing at the site. So we have been maintaining that. Okay. Um, so I know that there have been uh, several RFPs around Parkway Overlook. Um, what is your kind of long-term out? Um, what do you see happening? What's the timeline for at, at this point, our, our major concern, again, when you issue, when you do the initial claim, which raises the amount of money that can pay off the investors, we give that debenture, which is an IOU, that has a five-year life. Um, we're now in year six so that we had to ask HUD for permission to go beyond that five years. Our main concern right now uh, is that we resolve the claim with HUD to get HUD out of the picture, and we, we intend to do that by July of this year. But what will that mean for the property? What, what happens to the property? There, there are two or three paths that we are exploring for the property. One is a simple auction, uh, high dollar bid, 
One would be, again, attempt to have some type of, of um, RFP process um, or redevelopment plan as part of the disposition process. Again, the issue is every year we have to make an interest payment on that debenture. Uh, that interest payment is in July, which is why I mentioned the disposition date. The interest on that debenture is around eight hundred between eight and nine hundred thousand dollars. It's a substantial amount of money for us. Uh, however, you cannot prepay the interest uh, given the way HUD's uh, system works. So we can't pay the interest off now. We have to wait until July, and we want to be able then to dispose of the property as soon as possible before that so we can settle the claim as soon as possible after we make the debenture payment because your interest starts to accrue um, into the next year. So we don't want to run up another interest bill. So we're, we're trying to think through uh, the, the people that had just given an RFP response uh, have failed to live up to their requirements. We gave them three chances to move the ball down the field, as it were. They had their original deadline. We gave them a first extension, and we gave them a second extension. Uh, we, and this is going on from April of 2012 until January 15 of 2013. Right. So I see how you will resolve the housing finance agency's commitments by July. But what I don't see is what happens to the property. Well, the disposition of the property is integral to resolving our claim. So you can't resolve your claim until you've disposed of the property. Correct. Okay. Um, and the, the issues that were raised earlier about maintaining affordability, do the options that you outline, um, are we able to uh, preserve affordability of those parcels? It's a big, it's a big to, space. To a certain extent. Again, with, with Elsinore, even though there was a foreclosure, um, because there were tax credits involved, the, the minimum period of affordability was three years before any rents could be raised above and beyond the um, tax credit rents. In the case of Parkway Overlook, the property is vacant at this point. All of the previous residents have received vouchers. They've been living off of the property since 2007, 2008 with those vouchers. Um, so in, in that case, none of, the, none of the current residents would be injured because they do have housing choice vouchers where they live now. Were there any um, commitments to those residents to return from the government? In, in the RFP process, we allowed the residents to be uh, an integral part of it. They were part, they were non-voting members of the selection team. Uh, we had things like um, their um, reentry criteria would have to be looked at by the residents that we had put all of that into the previous RFP process. I don't know whether we're going that way this time. Again, our primary concern this time is the resolution of the claim. So, uh, and given that we just had the experience of the previous uh, successful bidder not being able to fulfill their commitment, we're thinking through now what our, what our uh, ultimate path will be. Are the buildings salvageable? Are they repairable? We don't know. And again, that became part of the problem. Um, when, when the gap was mentioned, the, the bidder uh, proposed a redevelopment plan through a competitive process. The bidder then came back and said that what they had proposed to do, they were about $3 million short, $2.9 million short, uh, that they couldn't, they couldn't build what they bid. Uh, and we spent time with them trying to resolve that $2.9 million gap. <clears throat> For an instance, we went with them up to HUD in Baltimore in an attempt to seek another FHA insurance, not risk sharing, but 100% insured by the federal government. And the federal government said no, they refused to do that. What does that have to do with the build, this, the condition of the building? They could get more. Well, again, the, the condition of the building is going to relate to the can they get enough proceeds and a loan to cover the cost of the acquisition and the rehabilitation? Okay, I guess where I'm going with this is depending on which of these uh, routes you take and are able to resolve by July 1, we may still be sitting there with these boarded up um, buildings that may be um, salvageable. Well, it, and 
I think in either path we choose, the buildings will not be rehabilitated by July 1. I don't, that's not going to happen in either path we choose. The issue is whether we're going to impose a redevelopment requirement that will then happen subsequent, or will we just auction off the property and, and let that successful bidder come up with a redevelopment uh, plan post, the, uh, post their acquisition? Okay. That, that's really the two major differences. But in either case, the property will not be redeveloped by July 1. Okay. Um, let me put it a different way. If the um, property can't be fixed, and you're not sure about that, should it, should it be standing there? Well, we're, we're, like? we're exploring demolition. That, that is one of the paths that we're exploring. And should we demolish the property prior to uh, disposition, and then in that case, the auction or the disposition itself would be for vacant, for vacant land. Right. So we're, we're, we're getting cost estimates uh, to see what the cost would be. Only if it's not repairable. Only if it's not reparable and or, again, if this, if this bidder experienced a gap and, the, and their bid relative to the appraised value of the property was very low. Uh, they, their bid was about $2.5 million. The appraised value was over $14 million. Um, if, so th it, there comes a point where you have to look at what, what can the property bear in terms of the acquisition cost and then how much money can be raised to do any type of rehabilitation that's going to have a useful life of at least for the length of the loan, 15, 20, 30 years. Right, and it would be helpful, too, to know and if your previous RFE process has considered the residents coming back, I'm sure yes. you're going to evaluate that carefully um, because I know that there are people that are following this who have lived there and would very much like to come back to their neighborhood. Not we, to we've met them. with the uh, president and vice president of the resident council as recently as about two weeks ago. Okay. Um, and so do you want to talk about the projects you're considering now? I'm just going to turn to my list one second. So, Mr. Sewell, do you, you have, um, are you involved in helping to finance projects that are part of the new community's replacement housing? We, we have. We financed uh, Matthews Memorial, which is part of it, for Barry Farm. We financed uh, the Severna II, which recently had their uh, groundbreaking. And the third was... Mary Helen, and then the fourth was the avenue on Georgia Avenue, which is part of the Park Morton new community. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very encouraged to, to see that. I think you know well, last week we had a hearing about the new community's projects. Um, and I guess this kind of goes to the question of coordination, among, as you mentioned earlier, among all of our housing dollars. Mm -hmm. um, some housing production trust fund, clearly you're involved uh, quite heavily in some of the new communities projects here. I asked the DHC director earlier, he didn't appear to have any money invested there. But part of the promise of new communities is um, that we're able to have big transformations, but to, to build a replacement housing first. Um, and it doesn't appear that anybody's kind of pushing the construction of the replacement housing that is kind of driven by what projects come up and maybe we'll, what type of gap they have and who they're going to come with to, to get um, some money. So um, I don't know what role your, your office can continue to play in that. Some of the leadership in the, the production of the new community's replacement housing is going to be very important to um, what uh, they're able to do at Berry Farm and Park Martin um, and on all of uh, the new community's projects. Is there um, any discussion among um, the, the Housing Authority, your office, and DEMPED about that? Yes, I think the um, Housing Authority and DEMPED are the leaders. I mean, the property is Housing Authority property. 
uh, DEMPED has been using monies out of the securitization of housing production trust fund dollars for some of the gap financing. And we, as, a, as I mentioned in the name, projects have been the provider of the first debt, the, the largest amount of debt. So yeah, there have been discussions. Um, probably the most recent that I was personally involved in were some additional discussions around Park Morton. Um, that was some time ago. And we've also been uh, contacted by several of the teams that are planning to bid on the Barry Farm uh, solicitation that's on the street right now as to whether or not we'd be willing to provide uh, debt to support their effort to uh, acquire and rehabilitate property. Well, we appreciate your, um, your consideration of it. It's certainly a, a I think a priority in our whole house, well, for me it is, in our affordable housing strategies is that we replace that housing and um, do it with some urgency. That it seems to be a little haphazard currently about how the, the housing is getting, um, is getting replaced. And uh, we just want to look at your, your um, activity so far in 2013. Are you, um, do you think your investments are proceeding at the, the rate you expected? Yeah, so, so far, again, we've, we've been very fortunate that uh, the investment community has, has targeted D.C. as a, a principal place that they want to invest. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, there are several bumps in the road, uh, sequestration, which could hamper uh, home and CDBG dollars, for instance, if, they, if HUD has to take that across-the-board cut. Uh, there have been discussions about whether or not tax exemption in general is appropriate uh, in terms of being able to lower the federal income tax tax uh, rate by broadening the base. Uh, tax exempt bonds and no income housing tax credits are loopholes, if you will, because they do allow people to escape uh, federal tax liability. So again, we're watching very closely those discussions on Capitol Hill because they could impact in the second half of the year our, our ability to do what we've done previously. I will say, however, we're actively talking with other lenders at various levels, money center banks in New York, large regional banks and local banks about ways that we can continue to be a financier of real estate even if there's changes at the federal level. Okay. Now, I'm, I have a couple of quick questions for you just about um, your operation. Sure. Um, and you're located on Florida Avenue. 815 Florida Avenue Northwest. And all of your employees are there? Yes. Okay. And how many employees do you have? Uh, 40. 40 positions and 36 filled. Okay. I'm sorry, 46 positions and 40 filled. And do you expect to fill those vacancies? Um, we basically, be because we are self-funded, we really look at our expense levels versus our activity levels. Um, we're in the process, of, I know, of, of actively filling two of those vacant positions. One would be an HR position, and the other is a financial analyst in our uh, asset management um, department. But other than that, we generally look at our activity levels and we make decisions around hiring based on is there enough money in the till to pay the salary. Or if you need it, right? I'm sorry? Or if you need the position. Or if, or if we need the position based on our activity level, that's okay. correct. Um, now, you're sitting on a nice piece of a property there. You own it? We do. Okay. Do you, what are your plans? To sit there. <laughs> okay. I ask all of the agency directors this question. No, to sit there. Again, um, our area is undergoing tremendous redevelopment. In, in that Shaw area and, and kind of the, the bottom, if you will, lower Georgia Avenue. Um, several private companies have bought properties in front of us and behind us. Um, the Howard Town Center project has been uh, recently reactivated as we understand it. They've gotten a tax abatement and they've come talking with us. Um, just from a basic real estate perspective, for us, um, we know that the minute any of that that's being talked about comes to fruition, there'll be an entirely new set of comparables in terms of what real estate is valued at. So right now, if we did anything, we'd be doing it at the bottom of the market. Uh, if 
the area around us, the area around us develop as, develops as promised, again, there will be an, an entirely new set of comparables. Uh, the values would presumably could be lower, but 99 out of 100, the values would be higher. And at that point, we may be um, willing to enter into active discussions about the development of that site. Okay. Uh, you report to a board? Yes, you have a board of five members who are appointed by the mayor. And is your board the is fully, um, you have all your members? At this point, we have a full complement, thanks to the mayor and to council, because as you know, all of the board members have to be confirmed by council. At, at this point, we have a full complement, yes. Is there anything that the committee can do to um, help you advance your mission during this fiscal year? Probably the biggest thing I would like to, once we um, complete the report, I would like to have the opportunity to come and sit and talk with you, again, about some of the options that, that we talked about earlier and get your uh, guidance as to which of those options you think are feasible and should be pursued. Uh, in terms of raising funding toward that 10 by 20 goal. Uh, I would really appreciate time to sit and talk with you about that. We can sit here just like this. <laughs> I think that would be... Uh... Well, I would prefer a, a little more comfortable <laughs> setting. I, I'm going I'm to have a Marco Rubio moment in the minute and have to be okay. for some water. But... No, you're almost done. <laughs> um, no, and uh, I, actually I've been thinking about what... what um, because I'm, I'm at a disadvantage. I don't really know the confines of the report or, you know, what the recommendations are going to be. Um, but it may be a good opportunity after we have, after you brief me on it, of course, um, to have a, a more full um, public discussion about it. I know oh, that we'd there, be glad to yes, do that as well. Um, and and uh, take some, you know, while there has been a task force, a pretty good-sized task force meeting about it, I'm sure you uh, gathered from the interest in today's hearing a a lot of people have a lot to say about affordable housing, and, and they'll want to weigh in as well. There'll be opportunities, especially if there's a budget implication, which I expect that there will be, um, also uh, to talk about the recommendations of the report. So that, that might be um, the best way to handle it. No, we, we welcome that. Um, so with that, I, I will give you the opportunity to put anything else on the record about your agency's performance over the last uh, 18 months. Only, again, that uh, we've been very fortunate to be in, a, in an environment where investors, uh, particularly those investors who are looking for Community Reinvestment Act credit, have targeted the District of Columbia uh, as a place they want to invest their money. And I believe that's also because we've been good stewards of that. Uh, they get paid back. I mean, investors do like to be repaid. So what we've done in terms of managing our portfolio, the things that we've had to do uh, in terms of distressed properties, still made sure that the investors were repaid. That has a couple of, of positive effects. A, uh, it means they will put their money back in D.C., but B, it also means that we won't have to be, be charged a premium for them to put their money back because they know they will be repaid. Uh, our tax credit pricing uh, has risen to over a dollar. Uh, where a lot of communities, I think we're second probably only to New York City in terms of the amount that we're uh, able to raise when we sell low-income housing tax credits. So all of that has been extremely helpful, and we look forward to working with you and the committee over the, over the next year, uh, again, as we share the recommendations of the task force, but also some of the plans that we have as an agency to help expand uh, affordable housing opportunity in the district. Well, thank you, Mr. Sewell, and I want to thank your team as well, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. You bet. Um, our next agency will be the Office of Cable Television. And as we transition, let me just say uh, a few things about the Office of Cable Television. Uh, it is responsible for facilitating the provision of cable services to district residents, producing live and recorded video programming via the district's public educational and government cable channels, um, and protecting and advancing the cable service-related interests of the District of Columbia. The Office of Cable Television seeks to accomplish 
these objectives by regulating the district's cable service providers and ensuring their adherence to federal and district cable television laws and regulations. Engaging in the process of establishing franchise agreements on behalf of the district with cable providers and making sure that these providers are in compliance with their franchise agreements. Um, the office is also responsible for mediating disputes between customers and cable service providers um, to ensure quality service, um, promoting transparency in the district by facilitating open access to the district government through district's um, public access channels, and by working to attract the deployment and maintenance of cable services in the, dis in the district. Organizationally, the office is made up of three divisions, programming, operations, and regulation. The sum of these divisions uh, regulate the district's um, cable service uh, uh, providers, including Comcast, RCN, and Verizon, um, and produce programming, uh, which is broadcast on TV 13, TV 16, and the District Knowledge Network. Um, they provide oversight of all of the administrative um, functions in support of the agency's mission. In fiscal 13, um, Office of Cable Television had an operating budget of $8.5 million, all of which um, is derived from franchise fees. Um, and these are the fees that we pay and pay and pay to cable providers. Um, before turning to the witnesses, I uh, just like a, a st I'll for a second talk about um, some issues that we hear from from constituents. Uh, cable bills are very expensive, uh, so they we realize that we have access to to channels um, delivering entertainment um, to to our homes. Um, but we want to hear what the office's role is in. Um, making sure that we have affordable rates. Uh, we're also receiving news from sources that are there are that things are different than they were of course 20 or 30 years ago and one of the primary sources um, that we find these differences is in television. So it should be able we think that things that the, the services should be available at more affordable prices. So let's now turn to um, the Office of Cable Television to, oh, actually, I think we have a, one public witness. Is Michael Gravino here? Yes. Mr. Gravino, if you would come up. Thank you, Mr. Gravino. Please proceed. Um, I'm pleased to talk with you this afternoon. I'm Michael Gravino. I'm a new resident to the District of Columbia. I live on 420 16th Street Southeast. I think that's Ward 6. Uh, Tommy Wells District. Where is it? Uh, 16th Street Southeast. Okay. Potomac Avenue Metro. Um, yes, that's I moved here in June specifically to build a new national civic affairs television network. Our market are those people who do not get C-SPAN, do not have cable television, and we intend to build a new network to deliver federal content, state and local content to them. As we were doing our research for this new national network, we uncovered what is called the D D the Civic Broadcast Digital Divide. You'll, you can see from the chart we've given you to review that it goes over this. In general, in every co community in the country, there is a Civic Broadcast Digital Divide. 
These are the homes that do not subscribe to cable. And what that means is that they do not get the channel, like the Office of Cable Television is producing and we are looking, uh, we are being viewed on right now. All across the country, this problem exists. We have recently submitted testimony to the FCC for the new spectrum auctions that they're doing, because they're going to be auctioning off some more of the television spectrum, about this problem. And we've, produced, we've uh, proposed a plan to set aside a broadcast station in every community uh, so that civic content can be aired on it, so people who do not have cable, who are antenna users um, or satellite users, can get channels like the OCT channels. Now what this means is in every community in the country that has cable, you don't get the education channels or the government channels. And most governments around the country, what they've done is they've said the internet can take care of this. Well, interestingly, what happens is that the civic broadcast digital divide overlaps 75% with the internet digital divide. So you have many people that do not have access to the programming. Also, you have the younger generation, which are cable nevers. We have 1,100 new people now moving into the district every month. Approximately f half of those are not even going to ever get cable because they're cable nevers. They use the Internet instead for different services. So when I first got here, I was m involved mostly with dealing with the federal content, setting up congressional feeds and information from the federal agencies. And we attracted about 30 or so different affiliates around the country. And as we were polling those affiliates, we ran into the same problem. And we ran into a problem they all were having in that at the local level, they couldn't get access to their government and education channels produced by local governments. So as we were doing that, we said, well, how do we deal with that here in DC? Uh, I'm part owner of a local television station, WWTD Channel 49, and have been that for a while. And since we switched over to digital, we now have plenty of channels. So back in September, I approached the Office of Cable Television and made an offer. I said, we'd be willing to put the three channels that you currently have on our station. There's a cost to doing that, a monthly carriage cost. But we'd be willing to offset that cost by selling PBS-like sponsorships. Um, this was initially met with excitement that, wow, we could reach the, the people in D.C. that don't have cable. Well, how many? But where, how does one pick up your channel? With an antenna. Okay. We're old school. Just get a little digital antenna and you can pick us up. I, I live on Capitol Hill and I have a digital antenna and I get 43 stations from Washington and Baltimore, Got most it. in high definition. Okay, so what, what was your offer? Well, our offer was to, supply, to provide the channels. District would pay for that, a monthly fee. And then what we, would the fee be? Well, the fee would be, mar there's, there's a market base to the channel. I, I, I'm hesitant in the public session to give you the exact number, but let's say this, it would be under $500,000 a year to carry all three channels 24-7. Mm -hmm. Actually, we could do four for under that 24-7. Now, realizing that the Office of Cable Television has its own budget generated from the funds that it gets from the cable franchise fees, um, it's not like we have to go out and look for these funds. And especially since that the, the way that these funds are generated, the cable companies are leasing the public right-of-ways that all of us citizens in the district provide. And uh, this public right-of-way, we exchange the use of that for the cable companies, and they, what they give to us back is they give us the money. They also give us some channels, and they give us some equipment, and they outfit the various schools and government buildings with the cable services. Now what happens is that on those specific cable channels where OCT has its programming, the education and the government channels, they're prohibited under that contract from doing any kind of monetization, any kind of uh, selling things, any calls to action. They could do sponsorships if they wanted. That's always allowable, but uh, they're not allowed to sell stuff, to monetize those channels. 
But the big question becomes, who owns the content? The cable companies do not own the content created by the OCT. The cable companies have no right to that content whatsoever. The government puts that content on those cable channels and agrees not to monetize it. But the government, we the people, own the content that we create. So there should be no hassle in letting us put that content on the air. Now, in our negotiation, well, first let me backtrack and say 58% of the people in the District of Columbia subscribe to cable services. What does that mean? 42% do not. That's a big number. That's 260,000 people you can sit behind, see sitting behind me right now saying, where's our content? We want access to the government information. Why are you not spending a penny to get it to us? Well, you might be spending some on the Internet, but who's going to look at this hearing on a little handheld mobile device? Besides, you don't get the full channels. You just get some of the hearings. You just get the hearings. So 42% of the district, district residents are sitting behind me right now saying, we want this content. Now, while they haven't all come here and stampeded and said they want it, they don't get it. And that's one of the most, ba other than the public safety, it's probably the most basic public function that goes on in this community is to get the information out. I sat here since 10 o'clock this morning listening to every housing person testify, and there must have been at least 20 to 30 different instances where you and the people behind this desk said, yeah, we got to get this information out to the people. They need to know about this program. Boy, they need to know about what's happening. Well, 42% of the people don't because they don't get it on the cable system. I mean, they get it on the cable system, but not over the air. All right. Well, thank you for um, – this is not a, um issue that is new to me. I have raised this issue, but mostly in terms of people, uh, subscribers, and I don't know if you had that number, to the, the DISH service, the uh, That would be a – in service. the district, it, call it 20 to 25 percent. Right. So right. we know, and we, we do hear from them, actually, because they are Well, I'm looking for remedy, for and this is probably the only place I can ask for remedy other than I'll be speaking to all the rest of the counselors. Sure. Well, I saw, I saw the mayor two weeks ago at a meeting, and the deputy mayor, they did not know about this problem. I brought it up to them. They said, wow, this is amazing. We've got to figure this out. I get an email back from the director of communications saying, no, no, no. The, my proposals to the Office of Cable Television have been you can't do it the way you say. Go, pre go create a nonprofit. You know, we can't, we can't work like this. Well, there's a problem here. And there's an oversight hearing, and I'd like to know how we're going to solve this problem. Well, um, I, I was going to speak, so I'm now, sorry. now it's my turn. Is that going to be okay? Um, we are going to, and this is not the first time I've asked this question, but it's mostly been in the context of uh, the, like I was saying, the satellite providers, because we do hear from people about um, having pay, paying for their satellite service yet missing out on some other channels. Many of these people have oh, they, switched. That, hold called, on, hold on. I was just gonna. Uh, um, I was just gonna help you and say that's called. Don't help oh, me. Okay. Don't help me. Let me speak. I'll okay. Let you speak. Thank you. Okay. So. And now I lost my train of thought. But I, I get what your point is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address it with the government. But thank you for your testimony. Thank you. We're going to hear from the government, and we're going to start at 5 o'clock.
Okay. I'm Muriel Bowser. It's 5 o'clock on February the, what is today? Is it still February? Yes, it's February the 22nd. And I'm reconvening this hearing of, of the Committee on Economic Development. Um, today has been our first day of performance oversight with three agencies in the committee's purview. Um, we started with the, Dep the Department of Housing and Community Development. We also heard from the D.C. Housing, Housing Finance Agency. Um, and now we will take the government's testimony um, from the Office of Cable Television. Uh, we We've had a full day of hearing from um, members of the public as well, including uh, 35 witnesses. Uh, we've heard one witness on the Office of Cable Television, and now we'll hear from um, the director and his team. Um, so please, director, um, join us at the table. Director Richardson, if you take the center seat, well, one of them. And I have a copy of your statement, Director, and you may um, present your statement. Great. Good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser, members of the Committee on Economic Development, and staff. My name is Eric E. Richardson, and I serve as the Executive Director of the D.C. Office of Cable Television, also known as OCT. Joining me is Jim Hurley, our physical officer from the Office of Finance and Resource Management, OFRM. As OCT's physical officer, Jim is responsible for the development, execution, and annual closing of our yearly appropriation. I'm also joined by Angela Harper, our Director of Operations, and Nikkel Allen, the Assistant Attorney General for the agency. Ms. Harper is responsible for the agency's human resources, budgeting, customer service, and information technology areas. Ms. Allen is responsible for resolving many of the cable-related legal and regulatory issues faced by the district government and its residents. She's also a part of the team responsible for the current negotiations with Comcast for the pending franchise agreement. As you know, the mission of the Office of Cable Television is to regulate the provision of cable service in the District of Columbia, also to protect and advance the cable service-related interests of the district and its residents, and to produce and cable cast live and recording video and other programming by the way of the district's public education and government channels. We take the performance of the agency seriously, and I'm proud to be serving as the agency director and representing the district for over six years. We thank you for this opportunity today to talk about the agency's FY12 and 13 performance plan. Since our last performance oversight hearing, we've made some significant progress in many areas, and we've outlined a performance plan for FY13 that will assure that we are on that same path. I'm also pleased to report that our programming department successfully rebranded TV16 as the District of Columbia Network, DCN. This all-new approach to programming and rebranding was embraced with a new name, a new look, and it really appeals to the residents who seek government, public affairs, and lifestyle programming. Building on 27 years of government programming and strong audience growth, DCN is still evolving and has increased its original content by adding six additional programs and created partnership with other entities that have resulted in five acquired programs being added to the program schedule. This effort is a cost savings to the agency and allows us to reach a greater demographic by presenting a larger variety of shows that range from current events and public affairs to arts and entertainment. The rebranding of the channel also accomplished the dire need of creating a program schedule that was more broadcast friendly and would allow the viewers the opportunity to know when a show would air on DCN. As a result, we've received very favorable feedback from the public. Many of them have commented on the fact that they're able to actually utilize the channel guide to find out what's coming on on DCN. And they can do this effectively on all of the cable systems. The programming team has ushered in several other unprecedented accomplishments in FY12. We've experienced an 18% increase in the amount of programming produced on DCN and expanded our programming platform and our presence. We made programming available on the Internet via YouTube and promote them on Facebook and Twitter. 
We also partnered with BET Centric on a history making program that was shown nationally on the Centric TV channel. OCT also understands that the management and supervision of our yearly appropriation is critical to the operation of the agency. OCT ended FY12 with a strong financial performance and we're spending very wisely thus far in FY13 to assure that we're able to continue to stay within budget for the seventh consecutive year under my leadership. Our FY13 spending plan includes a strong investment in small and local businesses that assures that we continue to be proactive and ambitious in meeting our efforts to meet the 50% SBE requirement. OCT created a successful partnership with the Office of Risk Management to employ return to work employees. These are employees that are assigned for light duty positions and they have temporary or partial disabilities and participate in a modified work program. This partnership has proven very successful and the participants assist with research, tape logging, special projects, program scheduling and other administrative tasks. The RTW program provides a platform for OCT to partner with another agency, providing critical services to OCT and offering RTW employees an opportunity to develop new skills and to hone their transferable crafts. Beginning in FY08, OCT made professional and personal development key components of the agency employee's internal performance goals. We've collaborated with the Department of Human Resources, Office of Contract and Procurement, the Office of Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining, the Office of Disability Rights, the Office of Risk Management as well as professional development organizations such as the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, the Society of Te uh, Telecommunications Engineers, and the DC Chamber of Commerce. These organizations and their training programs ensure that OCT staff keep a grip of the emerging technology trends and their practical application practices. In addition to that, 100% of all of the OCT employees completed the mandatory ethics training, that is. The Office of Risk Management set forth a 10% goal for OCT employees to complete OSHA training. We surpassed that goal by 40% of the employees completing the training. In addition to the training element, we set forth a professional development training goal of 700 hours. In FY12, we were able to reach that 740 hour, uh, that 700 hour goal by exceeding it by 40 hours, reaching 740. Pursuant to the terms of the cable television franchise agreement with Verizon, the regulatory division continues to monitor Verizon's district wide rollout of Fios cable television system. Verizon's continued deployment of the fiber optic cable system in the district is currently on schedule and services are available in wards 3, 4, and 8. The next phase of deployment currently in progress will make files available to residents in ward 1, 2, 5, 6, and 7. OCT encourages the development of new cable technologies and increased cable television services in the deployment of Fios and other systems. OCT has worked with both RCN and Verizon to increase their penetration throughout the district and OCT facilitated a partnership between RCN and the Office of the Chief Technology Office to enable RCN to reach more customers in the district. Verizon has experienced some difficulties in servicing apartments and condominiums known as multi-dwelling units. As a result of the issues, OCT has created a system where we reach out to individual residents condominium managers, landlords, and we encourage them to permit multiple cable providers in the building. The agency has been successful in facilitating the availability of multiple cable providers in some of the condominiums and apartment buildings, and we will continue to work with all of the parties to ensure that the deployment strategy continues to grow in the district. In September of 2010, rather, OCT acquired the former Black Entertainment Television Network Operation Facility. The facility is located at 1899 9th Street Northeast. Currently working with the Department of Government Services to improve and move forward with the project, the Office of Cable Television Project Award document is being reviewed now and the DGS director should sign that hopefully early next week. OCP is also working in drafting the award letters to notify the contractor that the award has been given to them. Once the award letter is signed, the letter contract will be issued for signature and the contractor can begin construction. 
Earlier this week, we confirmed with the Procurement Division of DGS that all of the items are on track and that the workflow is going well. We're pleased with the encouraging feedback and estimate that the construction will begin within the first two weeks of, of March. In the event that all of these elements are in place, OCT will relocate to the new location in late September of 2013. We will continue to use our current location at 3007 Tilden Street Northwest as a production facility and other related needs for the agency. The lease at that space expires in August of next year. In addition to use, utilizing the space, we will continue to work with DGS to fill the space and hopefully have a tenant to backfill it uh, or possibly another government agency in that space. In addition to moving forward with our capital project for the relocation, I am thrilled at the great advances we are making in connecting with our customers. It is our conviction, our commitment, and our belief that we're more than just the regulatory agency for the district and the operator of the education and government channels. We are a critical resource for the residents, the visitors, and the government officials in the district. As a result, we plan to execute more outlets for the public to view and interact with the content and services that we supply. In the near future, we will launch several initiatives and projects that connect the public to our content and hope to be one of the pipelines to a more open and accessible government. I'm a firm believer that we must be attentive to the changing needs and the changing trends in cable and broadcast technology. To accomplish this goal, we must craft a product that will reach a wider audience, and we also have to explore revenue sources to sustain the agencies for years to come. As a result, we continue to seek methods to support growth for various audiences and plan to conduct focus groups to ascertain feedback from the public and key stakeholders. We have an aggressive plan to accomplish great strides in FY13, and we will work to create a next generation OCT that can continue to preserve the showcase of great things that happen in the city and definitely embrace the executive, legislative, and cultural history of the District of Columbia. We will be describing some of those details in the near future and look forward to working with you and the committee to move these critical issues forward. While we're one of the few jurisdictions in the country to have three cable providers and we're known throughout the country for our award-winning programming, we continue to showcase it in different outlets. We're also facing many of the same challenges that other cities are faced with concerning the future of cable television. Despite these issues, we remain a solid agency and a beacon in the public education and government world. I cannot do this work without the commitment, dedication, and capable skills of the outstanding 34 employees that continue to go beyond the call of duty each and every day at the Office of Cable Television. To the staff and management team, I appreciate your support and honor your belief that exceptional service is the only alternative for the district residents. This concludes my prepared testimony, and I want to take the time to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We supplied the written responses to the questions that were delivered prior to the hearing, and we've also supplied my testimony to the committee. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director, for um, your testimony. And it does indeed sound like some very good things are happening. And I also want to uh, thank your staff, and I want to thank my staff um, for preparing a lot of very good questions. Um, we have uh, Crystal Godfrey, who's here. She's our intern from the University of the District of Columbia. Um, she, and she has helped me get ready um, for, for your hearing. And I want to... Um, why don't we start with one of the biggest issues that I know that that's on your uh, desk right now. And you talked some about it, uh, but it will also allow us to uh, examine your role in um, not only the fact that you're managing the cable franchise, but how much we're paying for the cable. Um, the opportunity to have cable in our homes. Um, so currently, you've already mentioned that we have three cable providers, um, Comcast, RCN, and now Verizon. Correct. And so you have an agreement. You're responsible for negotiating an agreement with each of these providers from time to time. And what is that period of time? Uh, depending on the agreement, we have a 15-year agreement with 
Verizon. Uh, we are working toward a new agreement with Comcast. The agreement that we currently have with Comcast will expire in April of this year. And how long was that term? That was a 15-year term. Okay. Uh, we are trying to uh, negotiate a long-term deal now, and we'll have information to the council before the April 20th uh, deadline. That's the goal. April 20th is the deadline? Yes, that's when the agreement will expire. Oh, okay. So, so basically what we're saying is um, the district is allowing you, private cable company, access to our space, um, and you're going to pay us for 15 years in order to have that um, access. Correct. Th that in simple terms. Correct. Is there, is there something else to that agreement other than just the here's the access and here's what you pay? There are a number of elements. Uh, there is a cross-channel promotion piece where the district is able to uh, promote some of their services to other cable channels. So that's one piece, but there are many different layers, and depending on the particular cable provider, there are different pieces uh, with uh, the right-of-ways uh, and other pieces that um, are negotiated. Uh, and the we, public channels? Uh, with the public channels, the public education and government channels, there are also franchise fees. So there's a litany of things that uh, we negotiate, and we're close to having a new agreement with Comcast. Okay. And that would be for another term of 15 years? We hope that it will be a long-term agreement. We are still going back and forth, uh, but I think on tomorrow we will have a response from Comcast to really gauge what that will be. So how... Um what is your impact on, on rates during that process? Many people are uh, familiar with the regulation of our public utilities, uh, like electricity and gas, and we have a public commission um, where the companies have to present uh, their, um, their rate changes, and there are certain agreements that, that we have that allow them to earn certain returns, for example. Is it a similar uh, situation with the cable companies? There is a lot of parity there, but unfortunately because cable is not a utility, uh, we don't have the same uh, regulatory authority when it comes to the rates. We are able to regulate the basic service and some of the equipment pieces. We are given notice when there is a change in rate, and that is a 30-day notice. Uh, but there are other things that we can do, particularly with the competition. It is our goal to make sure that every district resident has a choice, whether that is of two providers or three. As we continue to build out uh, a plan with Verizon for deployment, work with RCN on a larger deployment, you will definitely see hopefully a change because of the simple fact that now one provider has a monopoly on the market, Comcast being the largest provider they tend to have, you know, a path to success. If a resident is able to have a choice, it's more competitive. So, of course, the cable providers will have to compete for your business in a very active manner. That will hopefully, uh, and it's been proven, to definitely show a change in rates throughout the country. So do you expect to see some changes in the district, given now that many people, at least in two wards, have three choices? We are seeing some changes. You um, are? Uh, well, part of it is also, as a cable consumer, it is very important to be an active consumer. Uh, for instance, we get a number of calls where people have issues with their cable bill. What we like to do is kind of an internal audit where our cable service uh, officer will kind of do a customer service approach to kind of see are you using the service? How do you utilize it? Many people pay, I think the rate is $14.95 a month for a digital box. $14.95 a month and you have five boxes can be quite expensive. So people find that it's not so much the service piece, but it's the equipment piece and all the other things that uh, come along to make the bill go up. Not to mention that several of the providers, you know, cable companies are not cable companies anymore. They supply internet. They supply secure home security. So the bundled packages tend to be a piece that uh, is expensive because you're getting multiple services. They well, why can't these agreements influence the, the rates? 
the competition can influence it more than anything. Uh, all jurisdictions have the same regulatory authority where they can regulate the basic no, but service. that wasn't my question. My question was why can't this agreement influence the rates? Why can't we say if you want to offer cable in the District of Columbia, we want a package at this price or no more than this price. If you want to do it, you'll come. If you don't, you'll go someplace else. That's a discussion that we're having with Comcast now, and their agreement is something that we continue to do with the cable providers. Unfortunately, a number of the elements are out of our jurisdiction because of the fact that the FCC has um, authority over many of those elements. So, it's so the FCC tells us we can't regulate prices or we can't have some, um, I don't want to say regulate prices, but have some price controls or price bans or uh, maximum prices or minimum packages? The FCC basically has the authority. I mean, we are in contact with the FCC and we understand the issue. It's something that we work with every day. Uh, but every jurisdiction in the country has the same issue. Uh, the solution has been to bring competition into the areas. So do you have a mechanism for evaluating the effect of competition? So you, you said you see the prices going down. How do you know? Uh, we have a comparison for the basic service for each particular provider. We look at that. Um, it's very rare that there is a drastic decrease in the basic service rate, but we have, I guess, in the last year seen that the basic service uh, decreased on one occasion. But uh, as we build a better relationship with the cable providers, I think, and then move forward with working with Verizon and RCN and Comcast on certain issues uh, when it comes to deployment, we'll have that. And there are other options to explore uh, as the technology is changing. One of the issues, and then I spoke about it briefly in the testimony, is that, you know, there's a trend where people are moving to other technologies to get television service. The unfortunate thing is many people tend to do kind of drastic things. They cut the cable and decide that they're going to use Internet only. Because the cable company is now your Internet company, you see an increase in your Internet bill. The technology is just not there. If you're watching television a few hours a week, that's great. It works very well. But if you have the same viewing habits that you normally do with your cable, you're just shifting your bill. You're using more Internet uh, service, and that tends to make your price go up because you've kind of gone beyond your limit. So that's uh, something that we want to address, uh, and we've had some conversations with your office about some alternatives, and you'll see some of that in the new agreement with franchise uh, with uh, Comcast franchise. Some agreement. pricing alternatives. Not so much pricing alternatives, but I think um, you'll see some parity not only with the providers, but what happens in the region. Okay, so um, you you mentioned the person who has five boxes. Okay, but that's probably not as unusual as you think. But maybe that person's not complaining about their bill. And I say that as a person who has three boxes. Why does it cost fifteen dollars? So you you say to the consumer you shouldn't have five boxes. That's just too many boxes. That's why your bill's so high. And I say to you, why does the cable company charge fifteen dollars for a box? Because they can. Part of that is. Yes, because they can. And what we tend to say to people is just monitor your bill closely. Yes. Uh, really look at your viewing habits. Uh, the technology piece, again, it's changed. And Comcast, Verizon, and RCN continue to kind of have that. Uh, and I guess Nikhil can speak to it as far as rate for equipment. It's about the same, I guess, anywhere between 14.95 to $16 a month for a digital box. Is your microphone on, ma'am? It's on now. Yes. Um, the Federal Communications Commission, they set forth what any local franchise authority can regulate. So when a cable company wants to set its pricing at a level, at any level, it has to first submit justification to the FCC. Those documents are submitted to our office, and we can either do a full-blown investigation or we can just look at trends to see if their prices have increased or decreased comparable to the region or what they did the previous year. 
Um, so that's how we determine if the equipment rates are reasonable. Um, to speak to uh, Mr. Richardson's point about the number of boxes, one of the main things that we can do is to educate consumers about how to negotiate with the cable providers themselves regarding their bill. Um, because, uh, just to be quite honest, um, from a regulatory perspective, we're limited in what we can do, and that's on the federal level. Um, we do work with other regional groups and um, trade organizations to try to lobby on the Hill on behalf of the District of Columbia and other regional local franchise authorities to get these matters changed and to bring the issues that your constituents raised to a federal level. So you have reviewed, or, or I'm assuming you don't do it every 15 years, but you do it more frequently. The, they, they file them annually. They file annually the cost of their equipment. And so yes. you would compare them to what? Um, the previous filings. They're, they're very extensive and they um, give all of their market rates. Um, but do they, you compare them to other providers? Uh, well, the way that works is, um, no, we don't compare them to other providers. Only the majority um, monopoly provider, which is Comcast, provides those filings. Um, once there is what's called effective competition, the Office of Cable Television won't have the authority to even regulate those prices because the FCC says competition um, will set those rates. So, I mean, while we're able to, um, we are, are looking at it, but since we have three providers, the time frame for us to be able to do that before um, effective competition is, is set in the district is, is limited. So you do have the authority to regulate the equipment prices with the monopoly, monopoly provider? We do, um, but it's not as simple as a negotiation. It's really a formula, and we would have to do an extensive study to counter what they sent to the FCC to show that their rates were unreasonable. Have you ever done that? We did, the last time we did was um, 2005, we did a full-blown study, and it didn't result in the rates being unreasonable, but it did result in customers getting a refund um, for some other, other things that were overcharged, but it was a $2.50 per customer refund. And we did that regionally. So have you decided you don't need to study um, Comcast rates and equipment rates? We are close to reaching the effective competition threshold, we're so close, that would give us, yes. But you're not there. We're, we're almost there. I think in the next, well, and it, gets, it, it depends on who's speaking. We don't feel that we're there. Comcast feels that we're there. Well, of course. Yes. I don't feel that, that you're there either. Otherwise, I would see the reduction in the rates that you mentioned. Well, as we did the study back in 2005, it was more feasible to move forward with another cable provider coming on board and supplying service in the district. And I would probably say in the way the deployment has been going with Fios, I would say maybe in the next six months, maybe less than six months, we should be at the effective competition threshold. And so we'll this be may be um, your last opportunity to exercise your right to evaluate Comcast rates and equipment. Not necessarily. Okay. So how, how would you be able to do it then after effective competition is reached? Uh, there are a number of things depending on the outcome on the current franchise agreement. There are some things that we would definitely be able to uh, pursue. Okay. I say all of this, and I spend a lot of time on this, and I'm sure this is not news to you, that people are, you know, think that we overpay for cable. I, I'm among them uh, who think that we overpay for cable. And um, cable is not a public utility. It's not water or electricity, and we all can live without it, right? Uh, we don't but, want you to. <laughs> but we, you know, I guess we could. We could mm. live without the TV. We could live without the Internet, probably. We could go to the library to, to get on board. But I think we all realize that um, it's become a part of an everyday household uh, for most most people in the district. We heard from the witness that there's still many people in the district who manage uh, without cable. Uh, we try to find ways to connect those households to the internet because, frankly, um, we need that that type of connection to help assist people with education and job searches. And, and soon um, it'll be a way to connect to your medical records um, in all sorts of ways that we want to connect um, our families with the 
World Wide Web um, and everything that, that we, we can gather. Uh, and no, it's not a public utility, but it is one of those um, every day, every month bills that families have, and they're all going up. Electricity, don't get me started on the water. Um, gas has been uh, fairly stable, and, um, and we have the, the cable coming into to the house, too. So we do look to you. We rely on you uh, to be our watchdog with the, with the cable companies. Uh, so we don't have the leverage that we have um, over the public utilities companies. They don't have to report to our appointed public service commission. Um, but every chance you get, I hope you're taking it um, to drive a bargain for consumers in the District of Columbia. Absolutely. We stand ready. And just a kind of success story on what we do when it comes to the consumers being educated and active in this process. We talked to an individual who had a problem with the expensive cable bill. We had them review their service, how they look at the television, what they utilize. And they came back and said, wow, I was going through some things and realized that I had a cable box in the closet. So they were paying $15 a month for probably about two to three years, I think, for something that they weren't utilizing. So it's a constant dialogue with the cable provider, with the consumer, and we can uh, continue to do that. Now, um, Comcast provides, don't they provide a low-cost service? Um, I'm forgetting what it's called. There's no. a senior rate uh, and then the Internet uh, Essentials program. Right, Internet is, Essentials. Okay, so there is a senior rate? Yes, there is. Uh, with, the, uh, with Comcast uh, and RCN, but unfortunately not with, the, uh, with Fios at this so point. So is that a discount on the basic service? Basic service, correct, yeah. Do you know what it is offhand? If I'm not mistaken, the I think it's 13 because at this point the basic service rate is about $15 a month with tax for Comcast. It comes to about 21 uh, a month. And the basic service is about uh, a good 40 to 42 channels. Okay, and so for the senior, that's the price, $21. It would be f uh, 13 with the tax as well. 13, and okay, and so the internet essentials. Remind me what that is. That is a low-cost internet uh, package for uh, low-income uh, low income residents. Uh, they have really been successful with uh, going after kind of segmented audiences. One in particular is uh, students who receive reduced or free lunch. They are getting, uh, depending on how they sign up and when they sign up, they get a Pretty, it's a low band service, but it's a $10 a month internet package. And then at one point they were running a promotional piece with that where they were able to get a computer as well. So okay. it's been very successful. As a matter of fact, there will be an update on March 5th where David Cohen, the executive vice president of Comcast, will be in the district to talk about the program. It's been very successful in the city uh, and uh, one of the better markets for Comcast. Okay, so um, a family whose child, um, as I understand it, is just the school. So if your child attends a school where the majority of the um, student body gets free or reduced lunch, then your family will qualify for this Internet Essentials. That's correct. Okay. That's, um, and that's an excellent way to get us, con you know, to connect families who may not be. And they, they don't have to have cable. Or no. do they? They don't have no. to have the, the entertainment side of, the, no. uh, of, um, of what's going on there. Okay, so how do you have a customer service division? We have a customer service officer that falls in the operations area, and we get quite a few calls. We have one person now, but we're still kind of exploring different options as we have three cable providers now, and we've seen a stable uh, climate for cable service. Okay, is that Mabel? Mabel is our cable inspector. She handles kind of the installation piece and surveys for the technical piece. Marcella Hicks is our Marcella customer Hicks. service. Yes. Okay. Um, our office interacts with both of them pretty regularly, and I have to say that they're excellent. Yes, um, they, they are. They, are. Uh, they provide tremendous service to the residents of the District of Columbia, especially in um, my ward, um, and we want to thank them for that. Um, they they talk to Judy a lot. Yes, <laughs> Judy Gold. We talk to her quite often. Yeah. 
Yes. So, um, so the, but Miss Hicks is the the sole person who handles customer issues. That's correct. So that would be that she uh, she just helps people understand their bill. She's willing to make she makes calls to the companies. Depending on the situation, but I will say that Marcella goes beyond the call of duty uh, each and every time, and that can range from uh, if a cable line has fallen down, she and Mabel will work on that. Um, when it comes to Bill, she solely handles that, but Mabel is a backup on that, and then we've trained other uh, people in the agency, um, particularly our kind of uh, administrative end of things because we get all kind of calls. Again, your cable company is not your cable company. It's your cable company. It's your internet company. It's your phone company. So right. we tend to get calls for internet pieces. Even though we don't regulate that, we still try to work with the, the, the resident to kind of get some resolve to some of the issues. Now, what has been your experience when we have a, a storm and downed power lines and the restoration of services after a storm? I will say that the cable providers have done a fair job in that area. Uh, one thing that we can speak to is that as a result of recent storms, the deployment for Fios has been delayed a tad bit. Uh, the interesting piece about it is, of course, the cable provider has an advantage because if the electricity is out, you don't know if your cable is working or not. True. So they have the opportunity to really do a lot of the groundwork and work in conjunction with cable providers uh, in the area and the other utility companies as well. Okay. So speaking of Fios, um, you say it's been delayed. You know, the whole thing was supposed to be built out in nine years, is that right? It's about a nine, ten year Nine, plan, ten yeah. year, and mm -hmm. we're in what, year three or year four? Three. Year three. Year three. Mm -hmm. um, and up to this point, it's been on schedule? That is correct. And um, do they have to get your permission to be off schedule, or do you have to give them some kind of? They supply quarterly updates to us. We meet with them um, once to twice each quarter, and they have given us an alert in our last meeting that they were uh, delayed. But the good thing about it is they were ahead of schedule in many different areas, so I think it really kind of created a balance for them. Okay, yeah. so three wards have been complete, is your, your All of Ward says. 4 uh -huh. is there, and uh, we're working now in the next two to three years, you'll see significant improvement uh, of service and deployment in wards 1 to five, six, and seven. Is all of Ward 8 done? Um, the bulk of Ward 8. The interesting thing is that cable is kind of broken up in wards. Unfortunately, it's a new, well, I guess fortunately, it's a new technology, and it's not so much based on wards. It's based on the wire center. So, for instance, when we kicked off uh, Fios coming to the city, it was done in Ward 7. The wire center is located at kind of the threshold of Ward 7 and 8. As a result of that, they were able to build out more so in Ward 8 because the path for deployment was a lot uh, efficient and effective and so many other things for them. So Ward 7 will see an increase in the next uh, deployment stage. Okay. Um, so you're going to be moving. Um, you correct. explain the details of your move and if all goes well by the end of, did you say October? We should be in the building in September. In September. Um, but your lease would not be over until the following summer? August of 2014. Okay. Um, now, all of your build out is funded? That is correct. Okay. Um, and what will you be able to do differently in this new space? The new space will have uh, two studios, as we do now, but uh, there are a number of things that will improve the operations. We will be able to streamline our operation with all of the, well, the bulk of the staff being in one place. We currently have staff over at McKinley Tech for the District Knowledge Network, which is the education channel. They'll be housed in the same building. We'll also have an HD studio. We are currently in SD, which is standard definition. So that will help move the technology forward and could also create an opportunity for revenue source. We tend to work with other agencies, and that's both on the local and federal level. We do a CISO show, uh, show which is um, uh, very successful, and they take that show that they tape in our studio and air it across the country. So we want to create more partnerships uh, that will do that, but the technology that we have now is a little antiquated, uh, and we want to definitely go forward with the HD, which will be in the new building. Okay, so all the equipment and build-out are funded? 
That is correct. There is a piece that we are exploring now for the technology in all of the hearing rooms. Uh, the equipment here in the Wilson Building is about 12 years old. There's been some enhancements here and there, but we want to make sure that we do a complete overhaul of equipment, not just in the studio, but uh, here at the Wilson Building and some of the other spaces as well. Now, many people who listen to it, they always tell me to push the microphone back. <laughs> so I won't have to push the microphone back anymore. Yes, we will have uh, some new technology. While this is functioning and working well, I think there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, those things that uh, we're exploring now include teleconferencing, um, more monitors, uh, a piece of the online element where people are able to actually do better research. My mm -hmm. ultimate goal, and it's very, very ambitious, is to have kind of a Google search model for all of the hearings. So if there's a subject where you want to know about, you know, previous housing legislation or any type of movement, you type housing in, you kind of see it, and you get a similar effect of what you get on YouTube or in a Google search. So. That's um, a long-term goal, but it's something that we want to do. We want to be as open and accessible as possible. Okay. Now, our witness talked about um, the public channels um, that are not available uh, to people who don't have cable and to people who do have some kind of satellite service is also not available to them. Now, we've had this conversation before because we want to figure out how um, – we can get it to the people who are paying for service um, with a satellite. And let's also address the, the people who don't have cable at all and how they might have access to the public channels. Well, uh, a few things. Mr. Gravino was correct. We were very excited when he came to us and said that, hey, we have an opportunity to deliver your content to a untapped market. Uh, unfortunately, his numbers are just a little flawed. The 42 percent. Not so much. Um, part of that 42 percent are people who have satellite, as he said, as well as people that don't have any uh, cable or satellite service. So that takes you kind of to the 20 percentile. While his plan is outstanding and we thought it was great, unfortunately it's not financially feasible for us to pay $20,000 a month to a low-power television station. Low-power television stations uh, in that spectrum that he spoke about will definitely disappear in the next three to five years. So it's not a very favorable return on investment. We would prefer to do a number of things, and I talked a little bit about that in my, tech, in my uh, testimony here. Low-power is great. We want to have a partnership. It can't be what he presented. We'll continue to work with him. We'll continue to have uh, dialogue, but we are not narrow in our scope. One of the things that we're working on, and I have to kind of use my phone here, uh, is a system where you're able to see a hearing live on your phone. And unfortunately, you see me uh, here kind of digitizing, but that's because it has to kind of pull up. Uh, but there's an app element that we want to go in. That's where the technology is going. Low power television stations, unfortunately, don't have a large audience. Mr. Gravino could not deliver a plan that really mapped out a plan to say, this is how I will get people to watch. As far as our content, we are very free with our content. There are other jurisdictions across the country where people tend to take public hearings and they put them on everything from the news outlets to their YouTube pages. They take them and they manipulate them. We have no issue. We've had, you know, and as you know, people have taken hearings and used them to their advantage to sway something. The content is out there. We share the content. But we have to develop a plan that creates a more, um, not so much entertaining, but a more effective mode. For okay. instance, how can we get it on direct TV? How can we get the public channels on direct TV? That's a conversation that we've started again with the uh, providers, and the, the interesting thing is about $20,000 a month is what it would cost. Uh, and we hope to have an update for you on some of those things soon. But as we again move forward, we don't want to be narrow in that scope. While the satellite piece is outstanding, that also kind of goes back to an educated cable consumer. 
cable satellite, two different things. Many times people get some kind of uh, information in the mail where it's signed up for a satellite service. The price looks great because they have issues with their cable and the costs. But they don't realize that you don't get the public education and government channels. In our agreement with Comcast, Verizon, and RCN, we are exploring those options. And I think we have a stronger case as a collective. It's not just council hearings. It's not just the content that's on DCN. It's not the content that's on the public channels. But it's a kind of collective piece where we're able to showcase that. And we're addressing that with the Comcast agreement now. Okay, that's helpful, but I think it's also helpful to look at this not just as a loss to the consumer. Right. It's a loss to us, too, that's if right. we're not able to educate our populace. Um, and the more information that we can get out um, through these existing means, the, the better. Um, so I, I agree with that. And, and, you know, I agree that you're probably right, that the, the way that we're going to connect um, more people in the years to come is through a mobile device. Mm -hmm probably not through the TV. Um, so some people, there's going to take them a while to get used to that idea, but you're probably right about that. So um, as you develop those ideas, um, please let's think about ways to, to make more and more people aware um, of, of what we're working on. So um, you have, um, we're going to have you in a month or so to talk about your budget, but just tell me in general what your uh, staffing levels are at present. Well, we have nine vacant positions. Some of them were just created for FY13, and as we are in the beginning of FY13, we want to move forward. We have filled two positions. Uh, well, actually, we are filling two positions. One is posted and closed, and one is uh, currently out. Uh, part of our plan is to really look at, again, a 10, 15-year plan for the agency. That's not just with our franchise, but as the technology changes, we feel that we have to kind of take some steps. The rebranding was one of those things. The rebranding gives us the opportunity to kind of present a broadcast-type schedule. As a result of that, we had to move forward with a internal scheduling component for uh, the, the station that included new software. As a result of that new software, people have been trained to do different things, which will result into a new position that is solely responsible for scheduling the channels. Okay, and the same thing is going to happen with Channel 13? That is correct. The, uh, the, well, the uh, catch with Channel uh, 13 is that TV 13 is very unique where we have no idea how long the hearing will go. Some hearings will have you know, X number of people testifying, some will have none. So it just really depends. But we have to kind of come up with something. One of the things that we've explored, and just because of manpower, we haven't done it now, uh, another one of my ideas is to kind of create a show that would be packaged and be a half hour show that's kind of the week in legislative uh, actions for the city that would really showcase everyone. We have a great room downstairs on the second floor where, you know, we want to push that to the next level to allow everyone on the council to interact and uh, maybe come in and, and talk to constituents or really voice their opinion. This is my vote and this is why I plan to vote this way. So really more information and in creating that balance so we know every night at 7 o'clock we have a show and that show airs from 7 to 7.30 and that show will encompass all of the things that's going on with the um, council and I think you've seen some of that improvement and I think we'll be working with your office soon on uh, a profile piece where we talk to council members and show what they've done in their wards and uh, give some background on them so it kind of breaks up more than just uh, the program schedule, but it gives you some insight on the individuals. Okay. Well, let us l look into that. One thing I am real clear about is that there are a lot of people that watch these channels. Yes. And I don't know if you have a way to, to know, but I know that a lot of people um, watch these channels, some all day. Yes. And so uh, I, I think the what when we can get uh, make it more interesting and informative um, the better and so who is there someone tasked with the channel 13 revamp well we are working with the chairman's office and uh, once we get it there I think it'll be a number of things uh, our main goal is continuity uh, and having a hearing come on we just have to really sit back and work with the council secretary uh, the chairman's office uh, and all of the committees to kind of figure out what is a good time to do 
some of these things. Well, happen. we're going to invite you. I'll talk to um, the chairman and invite you to come into one of the administrative uh, meetings to uh, give the, the members a kind of a, a idea of what you're thinking about um, and so that you can get some early input from everybody. So you don't have a half kind of baked idea that nobody likes. That may be um, a way to start. And, and that's where we are now, so okay. I appreciate okay. that. <laughs> and I, I'm happy to, to discuss that with Phil and um, get you on one of those agendas. Very good. Um, so is there anything else about the performance of your agency for fiscal 12 and fiscal 13 you'd like to put on the record? Uh, the only thing we'd like to add is that, of course, in the near future, the support for the technology piece is going to be critical because it's not just, again, uh, technology, but it's a way to create a revenue source. Uh, we definitely want to move forward, and we've had some discussion with the other PEG entities on sponsorship and some other things. We understand that people are moving away from cable. As a result of them moving away from cable, that means a possible decrease in franchise fees, which means a possible uh, change and shift in our budget. So we want everyone to be open and receptive to what we do. We've had great success with DCN rebranding. We look forward to TV 13 being rebranded and hoping, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to kind of have that same acronym effect to uh, the council channel. Okay, very well. Well, those are my questions. I want to thank your entire team uh, for your responsiveness and your presentation today. Um, it's 5.50, and this concludes the hearing, uh, the performance hearing for the Committee of Economic Development.